My name is Deirdre Roach, and I serve as a program director in the treatment, health services, and recovery branch at the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. On behalf of the organizing committee, the Interagency Workgroup on Drinking and Drug Use in Women and Girls, welcome to the 2022 National Conference on Alcohol and Other Substance Use in Women and Girls. Since every great day begins on a note of gratitude, we'd like to start by thanking our sponsor, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, and all of our organizational partners, the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health, the NIH Office of AIDS Research, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, the National Institute on Mental Health, the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorders United for making this exciting two-day conference possible. Most of all, we thank you, members of our audience, for joining us and hope that you'll find much to enrich your day-to-day -day efforts to become better advocates and service providers for women at girls at risk and living with mental health challenges and harmful substance use. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping details to optimize your conference experience. Next slide, please. All sessions are being recorded. By joining these sessions, you automatically consent to such recordings. Recordings will be made available on the NIAAA website after the conference. Please use the Q&A box in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen to submit any questions, comments, or feedback you may have during the presentations. For those needing closed captioning, you may enable this feature by clicking the Show Captions button, lowercase cc, in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. You may access the conference materials, such as the program book and resources, on the conference page under Conference Materials. Next slide, please. At the end of each day and during the plenary, panel, and breakout sessions, we'll share a survey link with you via the Q&A and chat boxes. We would appreciate your feedback on individual sessions you have attended, as well as the overall conference. Next slide, please. And now to open today's program, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Monica Webb Hooper. Dr. Webb Hooper is Deputy Director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, or NIMHD. She works closely with the director, Dr. Perez Stable, and the leadership to oversee all aspects of the Institute and to support the implementation of the science, visioning recommendations to improve minority health, reduce health disparities, and promote health equity. Dr. Webb Hooper is an internationally recognized translational behavioral scientist and clinical health psychologist. She has dedicated her career to the scientific study of minority health and racial and ethnic disparities, focusing on chronic illness prevention and health behavior change. Her program of community-engaged research focuses on understanding multi-level factors and biopsychosocial mechanisms underlying modifiable risk factors, such as tobacco use and stress processes, and the development of community responsive and culturally specific interventions. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Monica Webb Hooper. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, the kind introduction and I'm delighted for this opportunity to welcome you and offer a few comments to start day two of this really amazing uh, conference. And I appreciate all of you being here with us this early in the morning. I also want to just acknowledge um, the sponsors and to say that NIMHD is a proud partner and sponsor on this event. So we appreciate the opportunity to contribute. So I'm here to offer a few introductory remarks about health disparities. You know, when we discuss health disparities, we must recognize that they are not just any differences. These are a specific type of health differences and the distinguishing factor between health disparities and other forms of differences such as population differences is that disadvantage is the causative agent. 
disadvantage at multiple levels, such as social, economic, and environmental, populations who experience health disparities are those who have faced systematically greater obstacles to optimal health and can be characterized in a number of ways, including race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, gender, sexual orientation, and others. Groups that are often discriminated against or excluded. And importantly, and in contrast to general just population differences, health disparities are differences that should not exist and are modifiable, which means, as I always say, that we have the opportunity for change. So as you experience the meeting today, here are just two questions I'd like you to consider. What do we know about health disparities already in the context of alcohol and substance use? And I think a second important question that can move us forward is, what should we be doing differently to reach girls, women, and particularly populations with health disparities? As yesterday's presentations elucidated very nicely, we do know that disparities in alcohol and substance use exist, that mental health problems are key contributors, and that the data are changing over time. And today we will learn even more about the epidemiology and specific groups as well as interventions. So I will share just a few additional points. Specific stressors are significant contributors to overall psychological status and increased risk for developing problematic alcohol use among women. Stressful life events, neighborhood disadvantage, economic stressors, and others. Data also indicate that Black or African-American women compared with white women have a twofold greater odds of persistent, frequent, heavy drinking versus declining heavy drinking. And also this happens as they age beyond their 20s and into their 40s. And an overall point is that alcohol-related disparities among women is a highly understudied area. And we do need more focus on you know, racial, ethnic minority women, sexual minority women, and women of lower socioeconomic status who are more likely to experience alcohol-related problems. Access to high-quality treatment, not just treatment, high-quality treatment is also an issue. Racial and ethnic minority, sexual and gender minority women are less likely to receive evidence-based treatment. And when treatment is available, its cultural relevance is often questionable. Across populations that experience health disparities, there's high stigma associated with substance use. Women report that they are not listened to or heard. And importantly, these groups of women have unique experiences of discrimination that are not often addressed in the treatment context, as well as disproportionately high exposure to adverse events and traumas. There's also this issue of few race matched clinicians, which speaks to the need for more diversity in the workforce and inclusion. Understanding health disparities and addressing health disparities are complicated, complicated topics, but there are opportunities to reduce and our goal is to ultimately eliminate these gaps. So I am pleased that this group is here to approach these challenges and in thoughtful ways. Today, we will hear about what we can and should be doing in the space of assuring health equity for girls and women with an intersectional lens that also considers the experience of women in a population with health disparities. So as we think about what we should be doing to address these issues among girls and women and specifically how we can assure health equity by baking it into our work, integrating it as our operating principle. The NIMHD research framework provides a useful approach to consider the levels of influence, the domains of influence, and how they interact to affect substance use outcomes. It also attends in this model to social determinants that have a disproportionately worse impact on minoritized groups. Now, much of the field has focused on individual level biological mechanisms in the purple box or individual behavior and coping as explanations for poor outcomes among minoritized groups and for disparities. As you can see, a singular focus on biology or individual behavior misses the great complexity of understanding and addressing health disparities and does not span the other domains of influence, such as the physical built environment, sociocultural environment or healthcare system, or the other levels of influence, 
interpersonal, community, societal within these domains. So I think the goal is to understand the multi-level influencers to aid in tobacco and substance use prevention, clinical screening and care, and provide data to improve both population-specific targeting as well as individual tailoring of interventions, including policies. And you know, as a clinical health psychologist who spent years treating patients and research participants with a range of mental and behavioral health challenges, I know that it is possible, it's possible to integrate intervention components that address these many of these multi-level considerations, even when the intervention or treatment is clinical in nature or designed to be delivered in an individual therapy format, for example, or individual treatment or in a group therapy. We have to think bigger, however, in how we do this and more holistically, and we have to study and practice in the same way. And, you know, I'll conclude by saying that this is an important topic in terms of health disparities, and we study it because the significant advances and, and substance use treatment advances that have been made have not benefited all populations equitably. And it is important that we accelerate, we move forward more quickly um, on and make progress to move into the third and fourth generation of health disparity science. And when you move into the third and fourth generation, we're talking about developing and testing interventions that reduce and ultimately eliminate disparities. And the fourth generation involves population level intervention implementation, uptake, and the application of a true health equity lens from the start of our efforts to their sustained completion. And, and from where I sit, that's where we need to go from here. So we do have a, another very exciting program today. I trust you all have the agenda and are ready to get started. During the first half of the day, our featured presenters will discuss HIV and substance use, mental health, and approaches to address stigma. We'll also have panels focused on special populations, populations with health disparities. This is the schedule for the afternoon. And you know, as Dr. Powell, Deputy Director of NIAAA said yesterday, we, we aim to use this conference as a stepping stone towards strengthening our ties with all participating collaborators, communities, partners, and promoting more community-engaged research to protect and improve the, the health of women and girls. And you'll hear more about this at the end of today's program. So for now, I wanna thank you again for allowing me to open the meeting and contribute to what will be a very productive and empowering day. And of course, I have to all invite you to connect with NIMHD during, through our many channels. These are areas that are very important to us. So now I will turn the podium over to Dr. Kendall Bryant, Director of HIV AIDS Research at NIAAA. Thank you all. All right, well, I'm hoping that I'm coming through loud and clear and would like to thank Dr. Cooper. I see Dr. Goodenow is on, and I'd like to thank the organizers of this symposium for the privilege of introducing Dr. Maureen Goodenow. Her biography reads that she was the appointed the uh, Associate Director of AIDS Research at the National Institutes of Health and the director of the Office of AIDS Research in 2016. In her role, Dr. Goodnow leads the NIH and OA coordinating the NIH HIV AIDS Research Plan. And this is focused on ending the HIV pandemic by 2030, hopefully. The agenda is, uh, will also include improving the health of people with HIV. In addition, she has her own laboratory. She's the chief of the Molecular HIV Host Interaction Laboratory at NIH. And I also might mention that previously, she worked on the President's Plan for HIV AIDS Relief, which focused on women internationally uh, through the DREAMS Initiative. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, you take it away, Dr. Goodenow. Well, thank you very much, Kendall. Um, and thank you to the meeting organizers for inviting me to talk about um, the NIH HIV Research Program as it relates to alcohol and other substance use in women and girls. 
HIV AIDS remains a significant public health concern for women and girls globally and here in the United States. Importantly, women from racial and ethnic minority populations are disproportionately affected. Structural factors that make women globally particularly vulnerable to HIV include exclusion from economic opportunities, lack of access to secondary school and gender-based violence. I'll be starting by providing an overview of the NIH HIV Research Program and the NIH Office of AIDS Research. The NIH is one of the 11 operating divisions within the United States Department of Health and Human Services. NIH, uh, the OAR, is one of the offices within the Division of Program Coordination, Planning and Strategic in Initiatives, DPOCIPSI, in the office of the NIH Director. OAR was established in 1988 as the second NIH-wide office after the Office of Research on Women's Health, ORWH. There are now nine unique program offices that coordinate NIH-wide research. In addition to OAR and ORWH, other offices are related to data science, the behavioral and social sciences, disease prevention, tribal health, sexual and gender minorities, dietary supplements, and nutrition. OAR is the one entity at the NIH responsible for coordinating and managing the NIH HIV research program across the NIH institutes, centers, and offices, the ICOs. NIH OAR collaborates with the ICOs, as well as other federal agencies, academia, community, and other key partners to plan and implement the full breadth of HIV research conducted at the NIH. Guiding the HIV agenda, the NIH vision is to advance research to end the HIV pandemic and improve health outcomes for people with HIV. The OAR mission is to ensure that NIH HIV AIDS research is directed at the highest priority research areas and facilitates maximal return on the taxpayer's investment. NIH the, at the OAR coordinates, catalyzes, convenes, and communicates HIV AIDS research, related research through diverse collaborations and partnerships within the NIH, across federal agencies and departments, and with researchers, communities, and the private sector. OAR works closely with the NIH ICOs to ensure that the HIV AIDS research portfolio receives input from many different perspectives. Many of the 27 NIH institutes and centers contribute to the formulation of the HIV research program and receive funding for both intramural and extramural HIV research. OAR also works um, actively with most of the offices within the NIH Office of the Director. Um, for example, um, ORWH at the intersection of HIV research with women's health. This collaborative approach has produced a highly successful and sustained HIV research program for more than 35 years and has provided a strong framework of scientific discovery to improve the lives of persons with or at risk of HIV. The collaborative approach is also reflected in um, this meeting's agenda and highlighted here are the institutes and centers that were mentioned um, in the opening remarks. Um, and they form this cluster of uh, related um, interests in uh, the HIV priorities. OAR engages with the scientific community, people with HIV, and a variety of partners to establish the NIH HIV research priorities. These priorities established for the fiscal year 2016 and renewed and extended for 2021 through 2025 to include reduce HIV incidence, develop next generation therapies for HIV, address HIV associated comorbidities, co-infections and complications. And most of the research at the intersection of HIV in women and girls, alcohol and substance use is associated with this, uh, this particular priority. Conduct uh, research towards an HIV cure and advance cross-cutting areas of research, including basic behavioral and social sciences, epidemiology, implementation science, information dissemination, and research training. 
The NIH HIV research priorities inform development of the NIH strategic plan for HIV and HIV related research, the major framework for the NIH HIV research agenda. The strategic plan for FY 2021 through 2025 outlines four goals, advance rigorous and innovative research, ensure flexibility and responsiveness, promote dissemination and implementation of discoveries, and build human resource and infrastructure capacity. In addition to the NIH strategic plan for HIV and HIV related research, the whole of government approach for ending the HIV pandemic includes the revised national HIV AIDS strategy released December 1st, 2021 by the White House Office of the National HIV AIDS Policy or ONAP, as well as the Ending the HIV Epidemic in the United States initiative launched in 2019 by the US Department of Health and Human Services. These three complementary frameworks at the agency, department, and White House levels guide basic clinical and behavioral social science HIV research. NIH continues to support research at the intersection of HIV, mental health, and substance use. Several studies focus on key populations, including men who have sex with men, Black, African American women persons who use alcohol and other drugs, and other priority populations in geographic hotspots, such as the Southern United States. At the office level, OAR is investing in critical areas through our signature programs, shown here, that represent NIH-wide priorities. HIV research in women and girls has been and will continue to be one of OAR's top priorities. OAR will continue to support research focused on women's health and HIV and ensure women are represented in HIV related research in collaboration with the ORWH. In the United States in 2020, there were more than 250,000 women living with HIV. About 18% of new diagnoses were among women and the more than half of these new diagnoses were Black African American women. Globally, in 2021, there were 20 million women and girls living with HIV. About half of all new infections worldwide are among women, mostly adolescent girls and young women in Eastern and Southern Africa. The most important reported data likely, or the most recently reported data likely underestimates the HIV global pandemic due to the impact of COVID-19. Some common themes across the HIV pandemic globally for women uh, across the lifespan include alcohol as a risk factor for HIV acquisition and substance use, women living with HIV are aging, there is a high risk and prevalence of HIV among transgender women, and underutilization of pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP by all women. In December 2020, UNAIDS released the 95-95-95 targets, which means 95% of those people living with HIV know their status, 95% of all people with diagnosed HIV receive sustained antiretroviral therapy, and 95% of all people receiving therapy have sustained viral suppression by 2025. In the United States, pro progress toward epidemic control is better among women across this cascade, but are considerably suboptimal for retention and care, only 58%, and viral suppression at 64%, which increases the risk, unsuppressed virus increases the risk for onward HIV transmission. Of the many NIH-funded networks and cohorts that focus on women in HIV, the ones featured on this slide have a prominent investment at the intersection of women's health, alcohol, and substance use. The research reflects NIH-wide collaborations across the ICs with significant investment from NIAAA and NIDA, ensuring incorporation of research focused on the importance of alcohol and the substance use for women living with and at risk for acquisition of HIV.
Here are some examples of specific NIH funded research projects on HIV and substance use among women and girls. The first project listed is important because it is because of its possible implications for HIV treatment and cure. Project SHE is a demonstration project among women who inject drugs. The NIH supports a multitude of EHE related projects applicable to the intersection of HIV, alcohol, and substance use for women and girls. The Intriga study focuses on health delivery service using mobile health units to link persons who inject, inject drugs to integrated care and prevention for addiction, HIV, hepatitis C, and primary health care. The Latitude Project explores long-acting therapy to improve treatment success. Some of the key focal areas of the intersection of women's health, HIV, alcohol, and substance use include the role of sex as a biological variable across women's lifespan during pregnancy, lactation, and menopause. The consequences of early childhood exposure to HIV, antiretroviral therapy, alcohol, and other substance use. Implementation science with a particular focus on treatment, prevention, and uh, morbidity, and morbidity and mortality. Transgender people, including gender affirming and trauma informed HIV care personal and romantic relationships, gender-based and intimate partner violence, and syndemics, for example, the inter interaction of HIV with other infectious agents or diseases such as COVID-19. All of these areas will benefit from increased collaboration and investment across the research continuum. The NIH vision for women's health includes integration of sex and gender into biomedical research and strives for every woman to receive evidence-based care. OAR is committed to supporting HIV research that is relevant to diverse groups of women by meaningful incorporation of behavioral and social sciences into biomedical research, including multidimensional considerations of sex, gender, lifespan, mental health, substance use, trauma, and the role of social determinants of health. Research in this area progressively incorporates holistic person-centered and culturally competent approaches to integration of HIV, alcohol, and substance use services, ensuring maximal return on investment for women and girls living with or at risk for acquisition of HIV. In closing, I want to thank you for the chance to share this information with you today. OAR is committed to advancing the health and well being of all women. There are many ways to stay connected, so please visit our websites, join our mailing list, and follow us on social media. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Goodnow. We at NIAAA are so grateful for our partnership with the Office of AIDS Research, and I know the other institutes certainly share that enthusiasm for working with you. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Joshua Gordon. Dr. Gordon has served as the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, known as NIMH, since 2016. In this role, Dr. Gordon oversees a broad research portfolio of basic and clinical research aimed at paving the way for prevention, recovery, and cure of mental illnesses. Dr. Gordon's research employs an integrative systems approach towards understanding the neurobiology, underlying working memory, and its disruption by genes of relevance to schizophrenia. Through studying animal studies of genetic mutations that in humans confer risk for schizophrenia, he has developed and tested causal hypotheses for how genetic variants confer risk for disease and laid the groundwork for potential clinical translation. Dr. Gordon is a member of the National Academy of Medicine. His work has been recognized by several prestigious awards, including the NARSAD Young Investigator Award from the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, the Rising Star Award from the International Mental Health Research Organization, the A.E. Bennett Research Award from the Society of Biological Psychiatry, and the Daniel E. Efren Research Award from the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology. 
Dr. Gordon, welcome. We look forward to your talk. Well, thank you, Trish, very much. Uh, and thank you, um, everyone, for uh, having me uh, here today. I'm pleased to be able to participate in this uh, really important conference. Um, uh, I uh, want to uh, take this time to talk to you about NIMH-sponsored research on mental health in women and girls and, and its importance and relevance, of course, to alcohol and substance use. Um, and uh, I have to say at the outset that I'm not going to talk about our extensive HIV portfolio, but I, uh, because I knew I'd be following on the heels of Dr. Goodenow, and um, I have to say the uh, there's a lot of relevant stuff here in in that part of the uh, NIMH portfolio. So I'm pleased that uh, that Dr. Goodenow actually highlighted some of that. One one area that I wanted in particular call attention to is our extensive work on the role of domestic violence um, in um, in HIV and substance use and mental health uh, disorders and, uh, and our extensive research portfolio in that area, trying to uh, develop methods to, to prevent and treat uh, these disorders in, in, um, in these populations. But uh, today, uh, since Dr. Goodenow did just do that talk on uh, HIV and its relationship to the topic of the day, I, I wanted to take some time really to focus on mental illnesses uh, I'll give what uh, is probably review for, for you all, but a brief sort of motivation for considering mental illness in the context of alcohol and substance use disorders by talking about the, the, the really tremendous rates of co-occurrence uh, and the importance of dealing with uh, both uh, conditions simultaneously from a, from a clinical perspective. Then I'll focus um, on different aspects of our research portfolio on mental health among women and girls and then opportunities moving forward for those of you who are interested um, in following up uh, to, um, to explore opportunities for funding from NIMH. So let's focus on you know, why, we're, why we at NIMH are uh, interested in the topic of the day, um, indeed of the, of the whole uh, two-day conference. Um, as, as you all likely know, among uh, all comers, women and men being treated for substance use disorders, women were more likely to have co-incurring mental illnesses. Uh, these include post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety disorders, uh, depression, postpartum depression, and other mood disorders and eating disorders, uh, amongst uh, other categories of illness. Then according to uh, our, our sister agency at HHS, the Substance Use and Mental Health Services Administration, which is, as you know, provides services as well as um, conducting annual um, epidemiologic surveys, showed in their national comorbidity study over 70% of women diagnosed with alcohol abuse had at least one co-occurring mental illness at some point during their lifetime. Um, just as one example, women with eating disorders are, uh, uh, are at a tremendous increased risk of developing alcohol use disorders, for example. So we need to, to consider uh, these comorbid comorbidities, uh, both from the perspective of individuals trying to understand and develop treatments for substance use disorders and alcohol disorders, uh, but also uh, from the perspective of those trying to treat individuals with mental illness. Uh, here's a, a little bit more data on it. This, this data uh, show, uh, is, is um, looking at um, uh, the co-occurrence of major depression and uh, various uh, uh, substance use um, and, uh, and, and misuse in the context of, um, of, of adolescence. And what you can see from each of these graphs is that for both uh, uh, adolescent boys and girls, um, there are uh, uh, um, higher rates of, uh, of use of illicit drugs, marijuana, alcohol, and the combination in the context of, um, uh, 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 of, of being female. Um, as opposed to, to being male if uh, in, in, in the context of major depressive disorder. So uh, women are more likely um, to have uh, um, major depressive disorder when they, uh, sorry, to use these substances when they have major depressive disorder than, than I shouldn't say women, I said adolescent gr girls compared to adolescent boys. So, uh, you know, that doesn't quite fit the stereotype, right? Of, um, of what we should expect of our girls, um, and uh, and in, in particular, points to the tremendous need uh, to um, understand and treat 
uh, um, understand, evaluate, and treat uh, substance use when we are considering uh, um, uh, when we're dealing with mental illness in the in 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 girls and in in women. Um, in that context, we really need to understand, uh, as was um, suggested by Dr. Webb Hooper earlier on, uh, the the particular context of mental illness <clears throat> in women and girls. And if we consider um, the definition of a health disparity, we have to recognize that the higher rates of mental illness in women and girls don't really, um, but in and of themselves, constitute a health disparity. Uh, but the fact that we have challenges in terms of reaching uh, many uh, communities uh, and, and uh, of women and girls, um, and, uh, and and importantly, we have uh, deficits in our ability to treat and effectively treat uh, these illnesses. Um, we can consider that this group needs uh, particular attention. So what are we think about in terms of designing our strategic plan for research in the area of women's and girls' mental health? Uh, the first thing that we have to recognize is that mental illnesses in girls and women occur throughout the lifespan. Of course, when we think of women's mental health, one of the first, first things we think about is women's health, which is uh, affected by reproductive events um, and hormonal events throughout the lifetime, which are particular to women. This, of course, includes um, mental illnesses that can occur during pregnancy and in the peripartum period, as well as menopause-associated illnesses. And these are indeed important uh, challenges for us to address. Um, I'll show you in a moment um, that, that uh, there is uh, considerable physiological as well as clinical evidence that peripartum depression, for example, is not the same as, uh, as other forms of depression. Uh, but in girls and women, there are additional events uh, and uh, and challenges in mental and mental health that we also need to address through specific research programs. These include, of course, developmental events and developmental disorders. There is evidence, for example, that autism in girls manifests in ways that are different from autism in boys. This can result in misdiagnosis uh, and uh, challenges in meeting the treatment needs of these girls. Uh, and also, uh, as they as they um, as they mature into women, the uh, the the uh, another important context for mental health research is the mother infant bond, and in particular, the uh, importance of recognizing that mental health challenges in the mother can affect the infant, and vice versa, that challenges uh, in children can affect the mother. And although this is also true of the father, there are differences in the way that uh, maternal infant interactions um, uh, manifest. And so we need to study those relationships uh, in, in, in particular. Um, of course, there are other hormonal influences beyond pregnancy, postpartum, and, and menopause, as well as sex-specific influences. We're learning more and more as we, as, we, um, uh, as we turn our study from generic brain function, or actually more likely Male specific brain function, especially in animal models, to un to um, to treating uh, all sexes and genders equally from a research perspective, that there are sex specific uh, differences in uh, brain development and e in brain function that we need to take into account. And so, understanding these influences and their effects on risk and resilience for mental illness is incredibly important. And then finally, there are categories of illness that are significantly overrepresented in females. Um, and this is, of course, includes anxiety disorders and uh, mood disorders. Um, and understanding uh, the risk factors that lead to these overrepresentations uh, is, is critical if we're to understand the, those illnesses in general and their effects in women and girls in particular. So you can see with these issues that we've got our hands full in terms of trying to understand um, the, uh, uh, the, the full spectrum of mental illness uh, in, in females, and uh, we need to um, focus on this if, we to if we're to make headway against mental illnesses in general. Let's talk about postpartum for depression for a little bit. And, I, and one of the reasons why I like to focus on postpartum depression, I think, is it shows the value of focusing in a, um, uh, in a mechanistic way on uh, the mental illness problems that are specific to women. Uh, as, as many of you know, uh, the postpartum depression is uh, very frequent. About one in nine women will experience postpartum depression uh, after giving birth. And unfortunately, there's considerable morbidity <clears throat> and mortality that results from postpartum depression. Of course, we're all familiar 
with the sensationalistic accounts of of uh, the rare events where women um, in, in, who have, particularly who have psychotic postpartum depression, have um, uh, ha have uh, attempted or 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 or, um, uh, or otherwise harmed their children. Um, but more commonly, uh, we see suicide in uh, as a major morbidity and mortality um, in depressed perinatal women. In fact, it's the second leading cause of death uh, amongst women who are depressed in the peripartum period. Suicide accounts for up to 20% of postpartum deaths, which is really uh, astounding. The uh, uh, good news is there are um, prevention method methods and tr uh, treatment methods that um, have been supported uh, based on research supported, I should say, by NIMH. Uh, and this includes a psychotherapy that has been proven to reduce the incidence of postpartum depression amongst high-risk women. And in fact, this uh, resulted in the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommending that that psychotherapy be given to all women uh, who are at elevated risk of postpartum depression. Uh, we're very proud of the role of NIMH research in that. I want to turn our attention for a moment, though, to treatment. Um, and and in, in particular, as I said, uh, towards a recognition that in uh, understanding mechanism, uh, in, whether we're talking about sex-specific disorders like postpartum depression or, or other mental illnesses, uh, we can make headway in terms of truly novel treatments. Uh, this graph uh, uh, may be unfamiliar to those of you who are not neuroscientists or maybe old hat for those of you who are, but um, it, it shows uh, the interesting effects of splashing on a chemical compound um, called uh, uh, brexanolone. Uh, well, actually, that's not the name for it then, allopregnanolone, which is a, a so-called neurosteroid. Um, what you see in these graphs, uh, and I'll, I'll point your attention in particular to uh, the graph B1, uh, is... Um, uh, an inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA being splashed onto a neuron, and you see these little downward deflections in this curve. Uh, these are the, um, what we call the inhibitory potentials, or these are the electrical effects of putting inhibitory neurotransmitter onto a neuron. And you can see as the uh, GABA is splashed on, these little lines, and when the GABA is splashed on, you see this big downward deflection in the curve. Why am I showing you this? Well, if we splash on a different uh, drug, this neuroactive steroid, called allopregnanolone, you can see that these downward deflections get bigger. And that's because this uh, neurosteroid, this endogenous compound that's present in our brains, enhances the activity of GABA on neurons. Uh, why am I telling you about this neurosteroid? Well, like many steroidal compounds, uh, the brain manufactures this neurosteroid from uh, precursor molecules that are the steroid hormones. And in fact, in this case, uh, pregnant, uh, um, uh, allopregnanolone comes um, from progesterone. And so uh, this is a, a natural compound that we uh, use all the time in our brains to regulate activity and to modulate the uh, inhibitory um, uh, signals within our brain. Um, but what happens in pregnant women, of course, progesterone uh, as uh, after birth drops dramatically. Um, and so, so do levels of this neurosteroid called allopregnanolone. And this led to uh, an interesting hypothesis that was developed really at NIMH in the late 80s and early 1990s, um, that maybe this drop in progesterone results in dysregulation of the brain, and that might be contributing to, um, uh, to uh, postpartum depression. And in fact, what was uh, then subsequently shown at, in the labs at NIMH and NINDS is that if you take this neurosteroid allopregnanolone and, and assay uh, its presence in the brain, you can see that after stressful events, allopregnanolone increases in concentration, both in, in, in a number of different parts of the brain. So this is just the concentration of allopregnanolone after a stressful event in an animal model. And you can see that it increases and stays elevated for a couple of hours. And in fact, what was shown subsequently is that this uh, increase in allopregnanolone is com compensatory. So it's trying to protect the brain from the maladaptive effects of stress if you take it away the maladaptive effects of stress are exacerbated. If you give it, you can actually protect animals against the effects of stress. So that led then to the hypothesis that uh, perhaps allopregnanolone uh, serves it as a result uh, to, to reduce the effects of stress. And if you will, to prevent some of those 
adverse effects. And in the peripartum period, what are we talking about? We're talking about uh, the stress of raising a baby, the stress of having given birth, um, and that without this protective effect, maybe you're at increased risk of postpartum depression. And in fact, uh, that, that experiment was done uh, at first in animals where uh, uh, depressive behaviors were measured in a postpartum period with and without allopregnanolone and showed that if you gave extra allopregnanolone to the rats, uh, they had less of these uh, postpartum depression-like behaviors. Um, and that led to the development of a compound that was subsequently test in women, tested in women. So these are all women hospitalized with severe postpartum depression. And you can see that within a matter of uh, a day or two or three of uh, see, receiving the treatment with the analog of allopregnanolone called brixanolone that has been produced uh, for in vitro, in v, uh, sorry, in, uh, for um, IV administration uh, in women um, who with depression, you can see that their depression is dramatically reduced within uh, a couple of days of the infusion and stays reduced for up to 30 days. Uh, so this is really the first mechanistic success in mental health, and it was done by paying attention to sex-specific and hormonal influences on brain function and their potential role in depression. And uh, Bre uh, brexanolone was approved for postpartum depression uh, in 2019, and there are currently oral analogs of this uh, drug, which at present needs to be administered intravenously, that are currently in testing for postpartum depression and other forms of depression as well. Now, it's really important that we think about uh, postpartum depression, not just from the perspective of uh, trying to treat those who are severely affected with these uh, drugs, which are uh, you know, challenging to administer and, and are going to have a, a limited reach, and really think about ways to decrease postpartum depression uh, on, a, um, uh, on a, a, a population scale. I mentioned, of course, that we have effective preventative psychotherapies for uh, postpartum depression, but how can we train and uh, individuals to give these therapies and deliver them uh, to pregnant women in uh, particularly those most at risk of uh, maternal morbidity and mortality? Um, and so we are supporting efforts in what we would consider implementation science that develops plans and abilities to train and deliver train uh, providers and deliver uh, this effective evidence-based preventative psychotherapy. Um, in this case, in 90 outpatient clinics um, uh, really around the country that provide prenatal care to pregnant women on public assistance. This effort's being led by one of our uh, promising, uh, pr uh, excellent principal investigators at Michigan State University, Jennifer Johnson. And it's an example of taking uh, what we already know to work, but using it to address health disparities. Uh, and so I want to point that out, especially in, in the aftermath of, of Dr. Webb Hooper's remarks. Um, I mentioned, of course, that maternal infant interactions are an important component of our strategic plan. Uh, so uh, we, 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 can't, we don't only think about the health of the mother in the peripartum period, but we also think about making sure we're providing environments that will allow infants to thrive. And although this, uh, of course, is, uh, um, it, it is uh, the responsibility of both the mother and the father, a lot of what we know about very early development uh, relies on uh, interactions between the mother and the infant. And of course, there's a lot of concerns in the context of, of SARS-CoV-2, of co the COVID pandemic, uh, about uh, preserving mental health in children. And so we have a number of studies that we funded. This is one of them that aims to characterize the impact of COVID, uh, either the pandemic or in this case, uh, the uh, infection itself on maternal infant interactions in the first 18 months of life to really try to understand um, uh, the, we already know a lot about the role of, of the dyadic relationship between the mother and infant in um, the development of brain structure uh, and function in infants. Uh, and now we want to know the impact of, of, the, of COVID infection in mothers on those interactions. Uh, this work is being carried out by um, uh, an early career investigator, Danny Dimitriou, and uh, more senior investigators, uh, Catherine Monk and Rachel March at Columbia University. Now, uh, I mentioned, of course, that suicide is a leading cause of death in the peripartum period. Um, and uh, we recognize that, um, that the suicide rates in the United States overall are increasing. And, uh, and furthermore, that uh, suicide ideation and uh, self-harm behaviors have been increasing, uh, in particular in childbearing bearing women in the peripartum period. And so uh, this is an issue that we 
uh, def definitely need to uh, to try to address. Um, and uh, and so any of you who are interested in, in, in studying that, we have a, a robust program to support uh, suicide prevention research, and we're very much interested in, in pursuing this uh, further from a, a prevention standpoint. Um, how do we understand why some of these um, uh, uh, um, sex-specific and hormonal-influenced uh, mood disorders are, are occurring? Um, and, uh, and, and can we get at um, uh, the, the ability to really uh, delve into these mechanisms in, in a way uh, that, uh, that will help uh, more women? Of course, I, I showed you how we, a mechanistic dissection from biochemical perspective has helped um, develop novel treatments for postpartum depression. Um, we also, in general, want to understand why women are a higher risk of anxiety disorders and, and, and mood disorders and whether um, by studying those mechanisms of risk, we can develop better treatments. Uh, and much of our attention these days has really turned to try to dissect out the various components of brain function that are disrupted when uh, women have uh, mood disorders or anxiety disorders. Uh, a, a key element of that is really trying to understand how the brain regulates complex behaviors, uh, such as decision making, learning, uh, and, um, and how that how those um, uh, how those functions relate to uh, mental illness and and uh, and dysfunction. Um, one of the uh, ways that we do that is to examine the relationships between computationally derived uh, cognitive behaviors and uh, and symptoms that are described uh, by uh, by patients and 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 this is an example of this kind of work as it affects our understanding of hormonal interaction. So we, uh, uh, over the years, have funded a, a number of studies that have suggested that um, uncertainty about, about the world around us, uh, and in particular, our ability to cognitively assemble models of the world around us by learning from our mistakes, um, is, can be associated with anxiety disorders. And so this, uh, this group uh, uh, tried to study the influences of hormones on the association between uh, cognitive functions that are important for learning, such as what we call error-related brain activity or the, the brain activity patterns that are uh, caused when, when you make a mistake, um, and, uh, and symptoms uh, that are relevant for anxiety, such as worry. And what you see here is that in the context of, uh, of um, uh, being on a, 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 of administration of a contraceptive hormone, you see that the uh, the um, uh, the error related activity here in in the dotted line um, to uh, uh, the relationship between that error related activity, sorry, and uh, questionnaires that um, indicate uh, anxiety uh, is much stronger than when you are off. Uh, when you're not on those uh, hormones. And so there's a, a hormonal influence on uh, this relationship between error-related brain activity and, um, and self-described symptoms of anxiety, uh, which uh, now that gives us the ability to then go into the brain and try to understand where in the brain is that relationship manifest uh, and can we understand the neural mechanisms underlying that relationship so that we can understand the influence of, of, of hormones on, um, on the functions that regulate anxiety and mood. Uh, the uh, relationship is not only present, of course, in mood disorders, but also in eating disorders. There we, uh, again, now eating, eating disorders are an example of a, uh, a disorders which uh, occur in both sexes, but are uh, much more highly prevalent in women. Uh, we don't understand the increased prevalence fully, although there are probably biological and societal factors that contribute to those differences. Regardless of those risk factors, though, the state of eating disorders um, uh, is the neural states that underlie eating disorders are very important for us to investigate if we are to develop treatments for, this, for these disorders. The, the current treatments are um, at best only modestly effective and the morbidity and mortality rates in, uh, in women with eating disorders are tremendous. Uh, this is a, one attempt by uh, a, a group of investigators, really a collaborative group of investigators involving, co involving cognitive scientists, uh, neuroimaging scientists and clinicians 
to try to understand the patterns of brain function that might be disrupted in, uh, in eating disorders. And in particular, to focus on, again, we're going to focus on uh, our ability of our brains to learn about rewards in the environment. And, it, and there are two structures of the brain, the hypothalamus and the ventral striatum, uh, that are particularly important for um, learning, uh, in the case of the ventral striatum, learning about our environments and the hypothalamus regulating our responses to environments. Uh, and what this group showed is that when um, women are um, learning about uh, the structure of, the, of, of rewards in, in, an environment, in a task, in a behavioral task, it's not a natural environment, but it's a laboratory-based environment, the hypothalamus, which is responsible for sort of setting the state of, of the brain and, and preparing responses to the environment, uh, sends information to the ventral striatum, which is important for learning uh, about that environment. Um, and uh, that's true in both sides of the brain. And in women with eating disorders, that normal relationship where information is being sent from the hypothalamus, the ventral striatum, it actually goes in the opposite direction. And so um, it seems like there's some degree of reversal of the normal patterns where you, you get information about the environment and from the hypothalamus and, and, and reg, try to regulate the state of the brain to prepare it to appropriately learn from that environment uh, to one in the opposite way where, where if you will, cognitive control uh, or cognitive understanding the environment influences uh, how that environment is perceived by the hypothalamus. It's really interesting from a theoretical perspective to think about how that might contribute to eating disorders. But how this reversal occurs in the brain, uh, what are the mechanisms about that, that then becomes a target for, um, uh, for further understanding and intervention. So these are some examples of the kind of work that's been going on uh, in NIMH funded research. I tried to give you some, some neuroscience. I tried to give you some really relevant clinical science, some of which derives from mechanistics understanding, others of which is targeted at trying to expand the reach of interventions which can, which can help women with mental illnesses. Of course, I haven't mentioned anything in all this about uh, the original problem, which is trying to understand the interactions between mental illness and substance use disorders in, in these areas. And that's, I would say, is an important area for growth in the NIMH research portfolio. Finally, I want to give you a sense of where we're going and the opportunities for mental health research on women and girls in the future. Uh, one uh, area of, that we really know we need to expand is understanding mood disorders and depressive symptoms in uh, women at the other end of the lifespan. So I told you some about um, adolescent girls and, and women. I told you about eating disorders, which typically strike the young and go into middle age. I told you about uh, uh, peripartum disorders. What we really need to uh, do more, uh, a better job of is understanding mood disorders and depressive symptoms in later life in women. Uh, and so we held a, a webinar series this year on this topic, uh, bringing together a number of experts to discuss uh, the latest findings and to, to share and to demonstrate our interest in, in improving our understanding of uh, issues like the relationship between menopause and depression and uh, the mechanisms that might uh, help, uh, might uh, provide risk and resilience factors uh, for depression in that menopause, uh, menopause transition. The, there are a number of initiatives that the NIMH has either created or joined onto that are relevant for studying mental health in women and girls and the intersection with substance use and alcohol use disorders. Uh, these include uh, these RFAs and announcements and notices that I'm listing on this page. I don't have any intention of reading this, them all, um, but I have them up there so that you can understand that we are interested in a broad range of issues uh, ranging from, again, maternal health, uh, morbidity, mortality to uh, disparity populations, whether they be within the United States or globally, um, as well as uh, down at the bottom, uh, influences of sex and gender on adolescent brain and mental health. Um, and so uh, these are all important issues. Um, uh, in addition to the ones shown here, again, we have a, an extensive portfolio on the intersection with HIV and mental health and substance use disorders. And so I encourage those of you who are researchers in the room uh, who are with interest in this area to get in touch with us and uh, reach out and talk to us about your interests and see how they might fit into the NIMH priorities. With that, uh, I'll come to a close. I want to call your attention to our, vi our vision. Uh, the NIMH envisions a world in which mental illnesses are prevented and cured 
and our mission, which is to transform the understanding and treatment of mental illnesses through basic and clinical research, paving the way for prevention, recovery, and cure. Uh, and thank you for your attention today and wish you luck in the rest of the day as you discuss these issues further. Well, thank you, Dr. Gordon, for that very enlightening uh, presentation. To me, it was a powerful and exciting call to action. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce our second plenary speaker for the day, Dr. Valerie Earnshaw. Dr. Earnshaw is a social psychologist whose research focuses on understanding and addressing associations between stigma and health inequities across the lifespan. Her research has explored how stigma leads to substance use and undermines recovery from substance use disorders. She's also contributed to interventions to reduce stigma towards people with substance use disorders, as well as to help people decide whether and how to disclose their recovery to others. Dr. Earnshaw is currently an associate professor in the Department of Human Development and Family Sciences at the University of Delaware. She was invited to present the NIH Office of Disease Prevention Early Stage Investigator Lecture in 2019 and is the recipient of the Early Career Award for Distinguished Contributions to Psychology in the Public Interest from the American Psychological Association in 2020. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Valerie Earnshaw. Good morning and uh, thank you so much Dr. Roach for the very kind introduction. Um, thank you, Dr. Roach, as well, for the invitation to join you all today. It's an honor to speak with you. I've been learning a great deal and feeling very inspired at this conference, which to me are the signs of an outstanding meeting. Um, before we get started, I do want to warn you that I've been feeling under the weather this week. You might hear it in my voice. Um, so I hope you will bear with me if I need to take a sneezing or coughing break. Hopefully I won't. I've had Dayquil and cough drops this morning. So hopefully everything will go fine, but I just wanna let you know. So I'm going to be talking about stigma today and I am very excited to do so given that many of the previous speakers have talked about the importance of stigma um, as well as some of the efforts that they've taken to address stigma. So it's really a privilege to be able to follow in their footsteps. So I'm gonna start us off today with an overview of stigma. I'll define stigma and talk about how stigma is generally associated with health and well-being related outcomes. And then I'm going to summarize findings on substance use stigma, including associations between um, stigma with substance use as well as treatment related outcomes. And then I'm gonna close us out with some intervention approaches. And I'll use this bar at the top of our slides to orient us as to where we are in today's talk. Okay, so let's start off with that overview of stigma. So our definition of stigma has really evolved quite a bit since when a sociologist named Goffman first introduced it in the 1960s. So let's take a quick look at a recent definition from major and colleagues, which is from the Oxford Handbook of Stigma, Discrimination and Health. So major and colleagues define stigma as a social construct. So social constructs are ideas or concepts that are sort of created by society. So importantly, there's nothing innate about these. They further define stigma as an expression of social power. So social power is the ability to influence or to control other people. Power is really the backbone of stigma. It's what creates and reinforces this phenomenon. They note that stigma involves identifying a socially conferred mark that distinguishes individuals who bear that mark from others. So in the context of this definition, our marks can be identities, they can be social categories or statuses, illnesses. So this includes uh, gender, race, and substance use disorders. These all count as socially conferred marks. And important to this part of the definition is the idea that people are marked and then they are distinguished or sort of separated based on those marks. So social groups are created. And then finally, they emphasize that stigma portrays people with these marks as deviating from normality and meriting devaluation. So essentially people with these marks are seen as different in some sort of way and also of deserving of poor treatment or discrimination. So when I'm using this term stigma today, I'm really referring to this broad social process that depends on power 
and it involves separating people with certain marks or characteristics and results in devaluation and poor treatment of those people. Now, stigma has been characterized as a fundamental cause of health inequities. And so I'd like to take a moment to consider how it is that stigma impacts health and substance use related outcomes. Whoops, skipped ahead a little bit. Okay, so the process stink, uh, linking stigma with health outcomes um, is similar across a wide range of stigmatized statuses. So this means that this process is gonna be similar if we're considering stigma based on gender, race, or even substance use disorders. So I'm sharing really a broad cross-cutting model with you. And it starts with uh, this social construct of stigma that we've been talking about. And then stigma is manifested, which really just means that it's expressed or it's experienced within our structures and among individuals. Now, these stigma manifestations are a really great place for us to focus our attention in research because they are both measurable and they are changeable. So broad social processes like stigma are difficult to quantify, but we really can quantify stigma that's manifested within our structures and within people or individuals. So we can use our surveys and our scales to do that. And we wanna measure stigma so that we can understand how bad or how strong it is, how exactly it's impacting the health outcomes that we care about, and whether our interventions to change stigma are actually working. And then stigma manifestations are also changeable. So we have evidence-based intervention tools that we know can either reduce uh, stigma manifestations or protect people from them. So essentially these stigma manifestations are also excellent um, intervention targets. Now we have tools to measure stigma and interventions to change stigma for these manifestations at multiple social ecological levels. So we're focused on women and girls who may be at risk of living with or maybe in recovery from substance use disorders today. But these women and girls are surrounded by members of their community. So this may include uh, family, neighbors, coworkers, healthcare providers who interact with them. Now, sometimes we think about how the ways in which these folks enact or direct stigma towards these women and girls. And then we have stigma at the structural level. So I'm going to just take a moment to define what are these stigma manifestations at each level, because they're going to keep popping up through the talk. So structural stigma is defined as societal level conditions, cultural norms, and institutional policies that constrain the opportunities, resources, and well-being of the stigmatized. So we're going to come back to examples of this, but I'd like to just have you think about any type of pick your uh, flavor of war on drug policies as an example of um, structural stigma. Among community members, so again, family, employers, healthcare workers, they may endorse prejudice, which involves negative emotions and attitudes like disgust or pity. Sometimes I say that prejudice lives in the heart. We have stereotypes, which are group-based beliefs that are often applied to individuals. Sometimes I say stereotypes live in the, in the brain or they're how we think. Um, and then we have discrimination, which is poor treatment of individuals. So discrimination is actions, it's actually behaviors. And then if we turn toward women and girls who are at risk of living with or in recovery from substance use disorders, they may experience internalized or self-stigma by endorsing the negative beliefs and feelings associated with stigma and really applying those to the self. They may also experience enacted or experienced stigma, which includes experiences of discrimination in the past or present, like maybe receiving poor care in medical settings due to one's substance use disorder. And also they may experience anticipated stigma, which refers to expectations of discrimination in the future, like expecting to receive poor uh, care in medical settings, potentially due to one substance use disorder. Now, if we return to our figure, these experiences of stigma are in turn related to a suite of mediating mechanisms, which are just the processes that link our experiences of stigma with our health outcomes. So we know that these experiences of stigma, these stigma manifestations undermine our access to resources. So for example, they may prevent people from accessing uh, medical treatment or employment. They compound social isolation. We heard a lot about social isolation yesterday and they lead to psychological responses like depression, stress, avoidant coping. 
And together, these mediating mechanisms can lead to substance use and undermine treatment and recovery outcomes among women and girls with um, substance use disorders or who are in recovery. Before we move on, I'd like to acknowledge that women and girls at risk for or living with substance use disorders are a diverse group. An intersectionality theory, which is rooted in Black feminist thought, highlights that all people live with intersecting social statuses. So these may represent both dimensions of marginalization and privilege. And the framework draws our attention to our social structural environment. It emphasizes the importance of interlocking systems of oppression. So much like a bird cage that's built to keep people in or down. So in this metaphor, you know, substance use disorder stigma may be one bar, sexism and racism may be other bars um, that create the bird cage. So for this talk, I really wanna encourage us to consider that these unique intersections are both shaping individuals' experiences of stigma and the ways that stigma may trickle down and impact their health outcomes. So a young black woman's experience of stigma related to her substance use may look quite different from an older white man's experience, for example. Okay, so let's now turn and dig into the literature and we review some of our research findings on substance use and stigma. And I'm going to summarize some of our findings on stigma and substance use related outcomes at each of these social ecological levels that we've introduced. And I will warn that uh, much of this literature is focused broadly on substance use and stigma, but I pulled um, examples from research specific to women and girls when I could. So if we start with the structural level, Again, the war on drugs is one of our most commonly cited examples of structural stigma. These policies are critiqued as treating people with substance use disorders as criminals rather than as people with chronic illnesses and can lead to increased risks of incarceration, which can impact people's health and recovery. An additional example of structural stigma um, includes barriers that exist to prescribing or accessing evidence-based treatment. So let's think about this for just a moment in the context, again, of intersectionality. So racial residential segregation is one of our most well-studied forms of structural racism. So it's a legacy of redlining, Jim Crow laws, and slavery. Goodell and colleagues did this really interesting study where they found that indicators of racial residential segregation were associated with access to methadone and buprenorphine. So the figure on the left, it's a little hard to see, but it's showing access to methadone, and the figure on the right is showing access to buprenorphine. So they found that facilities providing methadone were more likely to be in segregated African-American and Latinx counties, whereas the facilities providing buprenorphine were more likely to be in segregated white counties. So essentially, they found that where one lives, which is fundamentally shaped by racial residential uh, segregation, a powerful form of structural racism shapes access to the types of medications for opioid use disorders, uh, opioid use disorder that people can access throughout the United States. Now, if we go down to the level of uh, community members, so these are people who don't necessarily have a substance use disorder themselves. Researchers who have studied prejudice, that affective or feelings component of stigma, have found that prejudice towards people with substance use disorders is characterized by contempt and experienced as feelings that express moral outrage, like anger, disgust, hate, and blame. Stereotypes, that cognitive or belief component, are characterized by perceptions that people with substance use disorders are dangerous, unpredictable, responsible for their condition, and not capable of decision-making. And in terms of discrimination, researchers, or research has identified and characterized discrimination towards people with substance use disorders in a wide range of contexts. So healthcare, employment, housing, um, friendships, family. And just to illustrate the prevalence of this stigma, these data were collected in 2018 for, from a nationally uh, representative sample in conjunction with our general social survey. And what you can see here is that a majority of U.S. adults thought that people with opioid and alcohol use disorders are likely to be violent towards others, which would be a stereotype that they're unwilling to spend an evening with, unwilling to have someone marry into their family, and unwilling to work closely with someone with an opioid or alcohol use disorder. So uh, these are all indicators of discrimination, and these rates are all higher than when they're considering interacting with someone with depression. 
Now, stigma within healthcare settings can have tremendous implications for health. So let's just take one moment to highlight some findings that are relevant to providers here. So a systematic review from 2013 reviewed evidence across several studies focused on healthcare providers, and it found evidence that providers endorse stereotypes about people with substance use disorders, that implicit or unconscious prejudice is associated with greater intentions to leave um, one's job in substance use treatment settings, which has implications for job uh, turnover and can undermine the stability of our treatment settings and that providers who endorse more stereotypes of prejudice are providing uh, worse care to folks with substance use disorder. In our qualitative work, we have been particularly worried about stigma in broader healthcare settings. So people in our studies have described st striking experiences of stigma, especially in um, emergency medicine settings or other settings where they may need some type of pain management, like maybe if they're having a surgery. So an adolescent girl in one of our studies was discharged after an overdose with a note from her ER doctor saying, just stop taking drugs because they will kill you or hurt others. This girl's mother, who is also a participant in our study, was furious at this doctor, rightly so. She pointed out that a discharge note for a different kind of health emergency involving a relapsing chronic illness would involve recommendations for further treatment, perhaps a referral, and this mother identified stigma as the reason for getting this pretty outrageous discharge summary. And we agree. Okay, so wrapping up this section with targets of stigma. So this would be um, people at risk of living with or in recovery from substance use disorders. I have mostly been focused on stigma associated with substance use disorder, but there's also research showing that stigma associated with a range of other characteristics or statuses is related to substance use initiation um, So and, and substance use itself. So notably, a review that was published in 2016 on associations between experiences of enacted stigma and drinking found that gender-based stigma was understudied in comparison to other forms of stigma like race or LGBTQ stigma, but that the research that does exist supports associations between experiences of gender stigma and drinking. So essentially, they found that experiences of sexism are associated with alcohol consumption. And I think that makes sense. We've heard a lot um, over these last day and a half about the role of uh, negative emotional states and stress in, um, in substance use. So that's what we're seeing as well when it comes to stigma. We also see associations between specific forms of sexism and substance use. So among an adolescent sample of girls aged 15 to 19, we see, for example, that sexual harassment is associated with greater alcohol and binge drinking in addition to marijuana and other drug use. We see similar associations when we turn to the racism literature where enacted stigma is associated with alcohol, marijuana, and other drug use. And across these literatures, we see some mediators or pathways emerging that may help to explain why it is that stigma is associated with substance use. So things like psychological distress, anger, and reduced self-control pop up to explain that association. And then we have some really nice work taking an intersectional lens. So for example, some research suggests that the association between um, enacted race stigma or experiences of racism and substance use is stronger for Latinas than Latinos. Okay, so now let's shift gears and think about stigma that's experienced by people who have developed a substance use disorder. And I'd first like to highlight some work that has explored how it is that women with substance use disorder experience stigma. Stephanie Myers led a review of the literature on substance use disorder stigma experienced by women. She reviewed qualitative and quantitative studies. And results of the qualitative studies suggested that women with substance use disorders experience unique forms of stigma. And across the qualitative studies, um, these experiences included double stigma or experiencing sexism alongside substance use disorder stigma. Uh, societal expectations of womanhood popped up. So substance use disorders are seen as a violation of moral expectations of women to be moral, clean, and attractive. Stereotypes that women who use drugs are promiscuous or engage in sex work. Uh, unique experiences of stigma in healthcare settings, including when women are receiving obstetric and gynecological care that came up a bit yesterday. 
and then gender-based violence, including within drug use settings and drug treatment envir environments. Results of the quantitative studies comparing just mean levels of stigma between men and women were more mixed than the qualitative results. So some studies suggested that there were no differences in how much stigma men and women experience, but others suggest that women may experience more stigma than men. But I think that our qualitative results really suggest that we may need gender tailored measures to best study um, substance use disorder stigma among women. We really need to get at these, uh, for example, gender based violence or these unique experiences in healthcare that women are experiencing. Okay, so turning to associations between stigma and treatment related outcomes, the qualitative literature is fairly consistent. When we talk to people about their experiences, people tell us that when they internalize more stigma and when they anticipate more stigma, they're less likely to start treatment. So this first quote was from a high schooler who had an opioid use disorder, and she told us that she didn't want to get help because she was scared of what people were going to think in high school. Qualitative results also suggest that stigma is associated with lower treatment adherence, which you can see in our second quote. Um, so this participant disclosed to someone that they were um, receiving medications for opioid use disorder, and that person told them to come down off it, and they went ahead and did that, even though it wasn't a medically prescribed uh, tapering. But our findings do start to get a little bit more complex when we focus on the quantitative data. So we have some findings suggest that, that suggest that people who experience more stigma delay seeking treatment, but we also have findings suggesting that people who are in treatment are experiencing more stigma. We have some findings suggesting that people who internalize more stigma are more likely to drop out of treatment, but then we have findings suggest that people who have internalized more stigma stay in residential treatment center uh, settings longer. And then we have a lot of null findings, meaning that stigma is not associated with treatment. Um, this is really an interesting state of the literature for me um, because as a stigma researcher, um, we can observe that in other areas like HIV and mental health, the findings on stigma and treatment are becoming clearer and clearer that people who internalize more stigma and anticipate more stigma are less likely to initiate care, start medication, stay in treatment. So I've been thinking a lot about what's the difference and thinking broadly, to me, these mixed findings suggest that there are factors specific to substance use disorders that moderate or change our more general cross-cutting conceptual frameworks. And we really need to be thinking more about how these moderators or um, factors um, change these associations when we take what we've learned from other contexts over to substance use disorders. So gender is an important example of a characteristic that we need to do a better job of taking into account when we're studying stigma in this context. Okay, so closing us out with intervention approaches. Unfortunately, we don't yet have uh, one silver bullet to stop stigma associated with substance use disorders or gender or race or any other stigmatized status, but we do have uh, many tools in the intervention toolkit. So in other words, we do have strategies um, that work to decrease stigma. So I'm gonna spotlight a few at each of these uh, social ecological levels that we've been talking about. So one stigma reduction tool is to aim for policy change at the federal and state levels. We can aim to repeal stigmatizing policies, and we've had powerful calls to repeal policies that treat people with substance use disorders as criminals rather than as people with chronic illnesses. And theoretically, repealing these policies should lead to better outcomes for people with substance use disorders. Uh, but a recent review of the literature on evaluation of drug decriminalization and legal regulation found that few of our studies have evaluated changes in individual level health and well-being following our policy changes. So if we're thinking about policy change from a structural stigma point of view, we really want to learn if people's health and well-being improve um, when these policies change. So I think there is a lot of rooms for some really nice science here. One of our most powerful ways to address stigma among community members, including the general population, healthcare providers, and others is through contact. So contact includes in-person or even vicarious interactions like through media, through Zoom webinars. It includes sharing stories like what we heard yesterday from Sarah Platt. 
So Sarah's story made you feel something, you know, so if you were here yesterday, you'll remember all of the heart and clapping emojis that spread up through the screen um, as she was telling her story. So in addition to educating us about substance use dis disorders and recovery, it made us feel something, it improved our feelings. So we have a lot of research on this, and this strategy appears to be effective at reducing stigma. And by that, I mean reducing really prejudice at affective components, but also busting um, stereotypes and um, reducing discrimination across a range of characteristics, including substance use um, and race. There was a really nice review of interventions to address substance use disorder stigma among providers that was recently published, and it found that most interventions with providers used a combination of education and contact. And the authors included that contact with individuals in recovery is a vital component of provider stigma interventions. So we'll come back to that in just a moment. But I would like to also say that we can also address stigma among targets, among women and girls who are at risk of or living with substance use disorders. And here I often think about bolstering resilience resources for folks with stigmatized statuses. So these include modifiable strength-based characteristics that may buffer or protect people from the negative impact of stigma on health outcomes. Examples are social support and adaptive coping interventions. And the idea here is that stigma may take a while to change. So it's important really to think about how to protect people from it while we all work towards changing it. We have other tools and the trick is really to figure out how to use these tools or implement them in ways that make them most effective. We have some evidence on how to do this. We know that multi-component interventions that use more than one stigma reduction tool at a time appear to be more effective. Multi-level interventions that address stigma at the structural and individual levels or among community members and um, people with substance use disorder appear to be more effective. And longitudinal interventions that roll our um, stigma reduction tools out over time appear to be more effective. So I'm gonna highlight three evidence-based interventions for you that have packaged um, these tools and have reduced uh, stigma. I pulled the first from the field of mental health, and I'm highlighting this one because it was featured in a report from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine on stigma reduction for mental health and substance use disorder. So Time to Change was a large scale program to reduce stigma. It was implemented in England from 2008. It lasted it actually until 2021. It featured intervention tools, including education, contact, and activism, and targeted several specific stakeholders like medical students, teachers, and employers. And in evaluations showed promising results, including improvement in intended behaviors, like being willing to work with, live with, or continue to have relationships with folks with mental health problems, so all indicators of discrimination. It also showed reduced internalized stigma among people with mental health problems in England. Other interventions have been designed to reduce stigma among specific groups of community members, so let's revisit that review of uh, stigma interventions for healthcare providers quickly. The authors classified their interventions with higher uh, levels or tiers indicating more intervention tools, essentially. So this MMT care intervention was a top tier intervention that combined in-person education, skills building, and in-person contact with people in recovery. Um, it was described as quite active. It involved interactive activities and role plays. Um, and results suggested that it resulted in increased knowledge, better quality of provider-client interactions, and better treatment-related outcomes among clients. And then my last slide, I've got um, an intervention highlight for people with substance use disorders. So this is from Luoma and colleagues who have test tested acceptance and commitment therapy to address internalized stigma. In an ACT approach, rather than trying to uh, reduce or eliminate shame, the goal is to achieve psychological acceptance. Um, they, again, implemented this longitudinally in several group out several um, group sessions, and they found that their intervention was associated with less shame, which is the emotional core of internalized stigma, less substance use, and greater drug and alcohol treatment utilization. So these three studies highlight that we have success in reducing stigma and improving health-related outcomes when we combine our intervention tools. And I would argue that we need more work testing our interventions in real world settings, as well as specifically with women and girls so that we know that they work uh, well with these populations. 
So uh, thank you so much for your attention. Um, I will turn it back over to Dr. Roach. Well, thank you, Dr. Earnshaw, for that very thought-provoking and inspiring presentation. We you know have that's one of the biggest issues that we've struggled with through the decades. Um, is barrier posing a major, uh, sometimes seemingly insurmountable barrier to treatment for women and girls. But your research teaches that these uh, barriers, these issues are surmountable. They're not insurmountable. I, I'm so inspired by that research. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, and now I'll turn the podium over to Dr. Kiana Brown to begin our first panel of the day. Good morning, everyone, and good morning, Dr. Roach. My name is Dr. Kiana Brown, and I will be moderating the panel Prevention and Treatment for Special Populations. I am pleased to introduce our panelists, Dr. Ayana Jordan, Dr. Thaddeus Iannaccio, Dr. Catherine E. McKinley, Dr. Christina S. Lee, Melalee Morris, and Victoria Lopez. Following their presentations, we will have a 15 minute question and answer with our panelists. Now let's please welcome our first panelist who could not be here with us today, but did record her presentation, Dr. Ayana Jordan. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to uh, talk about my project, um, Protect and Respect Black Women and Girls, Cultural Considerations for Addiction Treatment Research. Before I start any talk, I really like to start off with the land acknowledgement. I am in New York City at this moment, and so I'd like to honor the memory and legacy of New York City's original peoples as defenders and stewards of the land. That's the Lenape people. I do think it's our duty to acknowledge that many of the institutions where we work or conduct research on are indeed um, in native land, so I give thanks. Another thing that's really important for me in terms of um, focusing on this research is to center the Black Lives Matter movement, not because other lives don't matter, but until we really start to treat Black people and Black girls, uh, especially in terms of the value that they um, have, uh, we really need to continue to center this movement. So a lot of the work that I do is really myopically focused on Black people with alcohol and other substance use disorders to affirm their humanity and to stop um, unnecessary death. Finally, I'll just say that I'm so excited to be in a liberated space with you all today. Uh, I know that my colleague Ted Ihanacho is going to be doing live question answering. And so if you have any questions that you'd like to ask them about the presentation or anything that you're uncomfortable saying, this is the time to really speak up. Oftentimes, uh, a liberated space allows us to grow uh, and, and learn from one another. So please do speak up during the, the Q&A. So starting with the why, why do I center Black women and girls in the research that I do? Um, this is a poem that was adapted by Imani Harrington, uh, a Black woman uh, in recovery from alcohol use disorder and uh, living with HIV. She says, we need you, our brothers, our sisters, our people. Help us reaffirm ourselves and loving ourselves. Hold us when we can't stand, because soles of shoes have traveled on our backs for so long. We need you, our brothers, our sisters, our people. So what are we going to be talking about for the next few minutes? I'm going to briefly go over addiction, talk about substances in the Black community, understand gender differences um, and substance use differences of black, amongst Black women and girls, and then briefly go over two studies that really bring to light some of the cultural considerations um, in terms of taking care of this population. So when we think about addiction, we're just thinking about a condition that interferes with one's ability to function. There's many different types of addictions, right? Some examples are gambling and then also substances. And we're gonna focus on substances today. So what is a substance use disorder? And I'm using the definition uh, by the DSM-5, right? And I like to break it down in terms of the three Cs, the buckets. So the first C is craving, right? craving for the substance, developing a tolerance for the substance, and then in the absence of that substance, you have withdrawal. 
The second C is control or loss of control, meaning that you have to have a larger quantity and longer periods of the substance over time, increased time spent trying to get the substance, uh, and unsuccessful attempts to cut back or control uh, substance use. And then the last C is consequences. As a result of the substance use, failure to fulfill major obligations, uh, problems with uh, interpersonally, use in hazardous situations, giving up activities, and continuing to use despite physical and physiological substances. So when we're thinking about a substance use disorder, you have to have at least two of these criteria in the prior 12 months. And we categorize that by saying two to three uh, criteria equals mild, four to five is moderate, and six or more is severe. And I just wanted to uh, bring to light some of the uh, at-risk uh, drinking guidelines, and we want to make sure that we're staying within these guidelines because uh, if you go above this, this really does uh, lead to negative consequences. So for women, um, no more than three drinks a day or, or seven days and seven drinks in a week. And so there are those um, gender differences when we're thinking about um, what is a standard drink. And so wanted to just bring that up to you all. So again, why am I focusing on, on, on Black women and girls? Because we know that despite equivocal use or at sometimes, especially amongst Black adolescents, there is less alcohol use compared to the uh, general population, but there is increased impairment um, and lower engagement in uh, substance use treatment. Also wanting to know, wanting you all to know that right now, Black people with um, substance use disorders have seen an increase by 140% in death, largely due to fentanyl. And now Black people are outpacing white people in opioid-involved overdose deaths. And the most recent data that we have um, from the CDC showed that Black people compared with any other racial group uh, in 2020 had, had the highest rate of drug overdose deaths. And this was largely exacerbated by COVID. Um, here you're just seeing on the x-axis COVID-19, COVID-19 with all substance use disorder, and COVID-19 with the recent substance use disorder in the last year. Orange is white, blue is uh, black, and you can just see that black people um, uh, have a higher death rate uh, when they have substance use disorders, and this was uh, worse in COVID. So again, focusing on gender and sex differences in substance use treatment, uh, we know that Black women have increased susceptibility to, to substance use because of psychosocial stressors, that there's rapid progression in, in terms of uh, the disease process in women more generally, and um, uh, there are more treatment barriers that are uh, encountered amongst Black women with alcohol uh, and substance use disorders. So when we're contextualizing substance use treatment amongst Black, amongst Black women and girls, it's important to understand what are these risk factors, right? Uh, parent, parental substance use is one. Overall stress and stressful life events, right? Thinking about that vicarious trauma, seeing people that look like you who are uh, killed as a result of police brutality having that complex of like the strong black woman needing to handle everything. These are some of the risk factors that lead to um, uh, more severe substance use. And then we have to think about barriers to treatment, right? So uh, having black women being more likely to be the uh, parental caretakers or having concerns about child care, um, black women being more likely to have their children refer to a DSS as Department of Children's Families. We published about that. So there are many things that we have to realize uh, and when, when, when thinking about treatment for Black women. And then in terms of treatment engagement, even if you get past the risk factors and the barriers to treatment, um, there are still lower rates of treatment retention and completion that are important to understand uh, in terms of the treatment that's available. So I'm going to move towards the, the last part of my talk and really thinking about what are some ways, right, and the that we can overcome some of these issues by focusing on um, 
uh, research. And one of the ways that we're doing that in the Jordan Wellness Collaborative is by uh, having and forging partnerships with uh, the church. And so why the church, right? We know from our pilot data and um, from the research that Black adults are less likely to access substance use disorder treatment in traditional settings. So we really thought that, um, and this is a paper that we published looking at what did uh, Black people say? And they said that they would be more likely to engage in substance use treatment in non-traditional settings like the Black church. They go there anyway to seek care. And so quickly, and this is published, but I wanted to go over the um, pilot study that has led to the randomized controlled trial that we're conducting today. It is a trial where we're actually providing substance use treatment in the Black church itself. It takes on a community-based participatory approach, meaning that uh, it equitably, equitably involves community members, key stakeholders, in this case, Black people with substance use disorders and research in all aspects of the uh, research process. Just showing you all that um, there were a lot of uh, vulnerabilities in the social determinants of health for the people that were involved in this pilot. Most were unemployed, over half the sample were women, uh, black women and um, over half the sample met se severe um, met criteria for severe substance use disorder, and we had a very high completion rate. Um, in order to get such a robust engagement in the study, I just wanted to um, highlight that cultural specific advertising is really key. So when we're thinking about myopically focusing on Black women and girls, they have to be represented in the treatment flyers, right? And this is an example of one of the, the flyers that we use. And I just want to say that um, the ATBC study that I briefly went over, the addiction treatment in the Black community study, is quite innovative. And I think it's innovative because we have a strong focus on community-based participatory research, we're not like usual research that just pops up in the community and leaves, right? We develop relationships over time, over the years. All of the services that are delivered are, are delivered by people with lived experience and collaboration with traditional researchers. And we have flexibility of the randomized clinical trial design, meaning that we it's an iterative process and we can uh, get feedback from our peer support specialists and our church-based health advisors that are working in the church. And so also in terms of just hearing from our audience, uh, Black women and men actually said that it's important to integrate their spirituality into the treatment that they receive in the church. And I just wanted to highlight um, uh, Sober Black Girls Club because this is an example of a uh, a community need that was really addressed by forming these um, social circles specifically for, for Black women and girls. I'm going to switch to another study. This was the dissertation work of one of the um, members in my lab, Janon Wyatt, and she uh, did the SEAT study. So substance use experience experiences amongst African-American women in treatment. So this is women who, Black women who have alcohol and other substance use disorders. Um, they were using highly addictive substances, had higher rates of traumatic events related to their substance use, and had higher rates of treatment attrition, which we saw in the literature, right? So the research questions that she asked is, how do Black women describe their experience in substance use treatment? What is the nature of the relationship Black women have with their provider? And what are the conceptions of culturally competent? Um, what is the what are the conceptions of a culturally competent provider uh, that we can extend to making sure that that uh, is congruent with the values of African American women receiving treatment? I am showing you the participant demographics and um, just wanting to go over briefly some of the results before I close. So some of the major themes is that um, there were some positive provider relationships and what constituted positive provider relationships amongst black women is that the providers were supportive, that they um, uh, had long lasting relationships and that their identity, their racial and gender identity actually matched those of the providers. Um, so that was important. 
And then a negative provider relationship uh, was constituted if there was early treatment termination, right? So if they were kicked out of treatment early, that constitutes a negative relationship. So this is from one participant, D Denise. The lady that I had as a clinician, me and her didn't click at all. She was always worried about a urine and she really didn't ask about me. All she was worried about was me having clean urine and being on time. She wasn't for me. She didn't talk to me and we didn't click. So I left there. So thinking about uh, Black women as a whole, it's not just about the urines, right? Or uh, uh, bio, uh, biological data, it's understanding relationships. That was really important. Another thing that uh, came up in the study amongst these Black women is that culture uh, was perceived as unfamiliar, yet this was a really important value for them. So this needed to be to, to be um, matched. Culture really seen as integral to the treatment, just like the addiction itself. And also um, wanting to make sure that, again, thinking about how can we maximize uh, racial and gender provider matches so that it reflects the general population. Another thing that um, we learned is that uh, um, when providers were matched with identities, it was really helpful. So uh, one person said, "Being uh, it helps, they have a better understanding, a better understanding of being a Black woman in America or a Black woman in an inner city. So really thinking about how um, the culture, right? Understanding uh, Blackness, understanding uh, being what it is to be a woman, and understanding that these are just as important as the addiction itself. So in conclusion, um, I just wanted to offer some remarks. Uh, one is that individuals struggling with substance use face complex experiences and a myriad of vulnerabilities, but particularly Black women and girls in this country due to racism, right? Um, and so we have to increase the effectiveness of available interventions by understanding the point of view of Black women and girls and then myopically focusing on those values so that we can integrate them into treatment. I'd like to uh, acknowledge all of the people that I work with. This is not a, a one woman show, um, especially those with lived experiences and in memory of all the Black women and girls that we've lost unnecessarily to this drug overdose crisis. Thank you so much. Um, and I uh, just wanted to center Kathy Carroll, my research mentor, who uh, died in 2020. Thank you. That was such a wonderful presentation by Dr. Jordan. As I mentioned earlier, Dr. Jordan cannot be here with us today, but if you have questions for her, please put them in the chat. We will forward them to her and Dr. Jordan's responses will be posted later to the NIAAA's website. Now let's welcome our next presenter, Dr. Katherine McKinley. Good morning. It's such an honor to be um, co-presenting with these amazing panelists and also to be asked to do this um, wonderful uh, presentation to share this work with you. So today I'm going to be talking to you about implementation research with Indigenous communities, sustaining culturally grounded dialogue to, excuse me, to promote wellness and resilience while preventing substance misuse and violence. Okay, and to start off with, I want to acknowledge the um, and, and thank the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism for funding the clinical trial that is supporting the Weekend Healthy Families um, program that we're going to be sharing with you, as well as the Birch program and the CATS program who funded the development in the pilot. I also want to acknowledge the Indigenous Peoples' unceded ancestral lands, where I'm honored to live and to work. And I, I live in Bobancha, the Choctaw name for, for New Orleans, as well as I want to honor the Mississippi and the Choctaw Indians United Home Nation and all of the tribes here in the Southeast, as well as the Northwest that I've been honored to um, do this work with. I also want to uh, acknowledge that this is the collective experience. So I'm here presenting to you, but this has been a 12 year process of developing this Weaving Healthy Families program. And, um, and this program is a substance abuse violence prevention program that promotes wellness and health from a relational um, background, which really um, leads well from the last presentation. And all of these people have contributed to this um, work through a community-based participatory research approach. 
And what that means is that the community is involved in all parts of the research, including from the question to um, the structure, implementation, and dissemination. And so you can see in the center there, we have highlighted one of our uh, community advisory board members. And I wanna acknowledge the person on the very right, Harold or Dot Combi. He is, um, uh, he's passed away in the last few years, but he was the first person I ever spoke with when um, I started working with the tribes. And he has, uh, we, we really owe this program so much to him and it, it is dedicated to him. And we try to embody many of the cultural um, knowledge and the strengths that he really modeled his entire life. He was also a social worker and I come from a social work background. And so I've had wonderful leaders to show me how to do this work in a good way with all our relations. And this program is facilitated by community health representatives, over 60 that we've trained um, from the tribal communities. Um, we have uh, program managers, I think, I believe Tamala Solomon and Maple Dynan, or Maple Goldberg actually now, um, are, are on this call. And so there are so many people, it's a collective experience and I wanna bring that forward. Today, I'm gonna to talk about kind of a case example of how we um, use implementation science to make sure that interventions are not only effective, but they're also uh, culturally grounded and that they are um, used by the community in ways that make sense for them. So the questions are, you know, will this Weaving Healthy Families um, program approach with the framework of historical oppression, resilience, and transcendence prevent substance abuse and violence while promoting wellness and resilience? And then the second question, uh, because we use something called a hybrid um, implementation effectiveness design, we're, we're simultaneously looking at, does it work? And also how well does it work and what can we do to improve it? So we're looking at how to sustain and feasibly implement this program locally and also across nationally. What are those barriers and facilitators? Because this program, we're in our third year of our five-year grant, you know, has happened within the, the context of COVID, We've also extended this, uh, we know that violence and substance abuse um, have been exacerbated in COVID. And so we look at how this program ameliorates those secondary effects of <clears throat> COVID. And then we've integrated mHealth. So we use text messages for reminders, for retention and for recruitment, as well as to um, provide educational text messages to affirm the content that people learn in the program. So before I get too much into that, um, I want to actually start with our approach and our frame. And so, uh, the, 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 we through research, we've developed this framework of historical oppression, resilience, and transcendence. And what that means is that we cannot look at substance abuse and violence and other um, challenges um, in isolation. You know, we, we know that alcohol was introduced um, with settler colonial um, uh, historical oppression, and it was used as a tool for indigenous peoples um, to kind of manipulate and um, to have people sign treaties and to, to really undermine the, the power of indigenous peoples um, when settlers came. And so when I say settler colonial historical oppression, I mean, settler colonization is a structure that continues and historical oppression includes the broader background of historical traumas, like you know, uh, genocide of 80 to 90% of the population, uh, boarding schools, all of these things that structurally and chronically and intergenerationally have, intergenerationally have undermined indigenous peoples not only here, but globally. And so we need to understand that these are really directly related to many of our alcohol and other drug use and violence um, challenges through this logic of elimination and assimilation where settlers come to make this place their home um, and either kind of eradicate indigenous peoples um, or assimilate them. And it's inclusive of other groups in that it's a tripartite model. There's, you know, settlers, uh, indigenous peoples, and then usually labor. So we, we know that people have used um, slave labor and these kind of things. And so it's very much inclusive of all of our own background and positionalities. And what this did with indigenous communities, it really reversed many of the pro-social um, values, like women were um, very much centered, um, were involved in trade. Uh, it was very egalitarian and fluid. And we know that's a protective factor against violence. And so over time, when settlers only were um, you know, working with uh, the men and um, were really targeting women and you know, sex slaves, these different things, their, their roles and status really changed. And this has given rise to now um, indigenous women experience the highest rate of violence and also having substance abuse pro problems, which tend to hang together. So we de developed this program that structures our behavioral outcomes with these um, structural causes with the goal in this critical approach um, inspired by Paula Furry's work and also Audre Lorde's uh, relational and holistic kind of um, work as well as indigenous feminisms, 
we, we look to have a liberation from oppression, both structurally, but also interpersonally and um, internally, because we all live in a society that's been structured by colonization. This, these have been inadvertently um, or directly um, integrated or infused into in institutions and our minds and the way we see the world. Um, as we know with research and, and practice, it's, it's more structured in this in the US with the, the privilege is a Western European approach. And when we bring this into our practice and our research, it causes harm. And um, so it's important to really check that um, before we even start this work of how are we approaching it and what might we be doing inadvertently um, if we are, um, are we going to be complicit if we're not very much aware and careful about that. It also, there, this, this framework of historical oppression, resilience and transcendence, not only looks at the structure of historical oppression, but also the resilience and the protective factors. And so preliminary research with the tribes that I've worked with, I've really identified many themes that other tribes have also found. For instance, you know, indigenous worldviews are very much clashing usually with European and Western worldviews, but they're, they're integrative and they're protective. <clears throat> and so in this natural lineal and natural local female-centered kind of egalitarian gender role is very much protective we found across the world. Um, having a center on family and extended family and connection to place and land, subsistence and food ways, um, engagement with cultural traditions and spirituality and faith. These are very much integral aspects of protective factors. So we try to build upon those and not only just recover, but transcend and become liberated from some of these structures that we may not realize are, are driving a lot of distress in the substance abuse and violence that we see in communities. This might seem like I'm doing more background than usual, but it's really important. I wanna acknowledge my own positionality is that of a, a Western European settler colonial person, even though my ancestors came from Ireland and Sweden and came like in the potato famine, because I come in the, as a white you know, settler colonial background, I'm treated differently and I have certain levels of privilege and power that if I don't check, I'm, I will cause harm. I also come from a background of social work who has a, a history of not only really great things, but also um, being used in colonization with the boarding school area era and the adoption. And so if I'm not aware of what that means, then I'm going to cause harm. And lastly, as a researcher, uh, research has been called a dirty word. Uh, I do ethnographic research. And so um, research has been a tool to extract data and use it for the tool of kind of oppression and to dehumanize and to really focus on damage-centered research, which is kind of reifies um, inferiority in um, minoritized populations. And so because of that, I use a critical approach that looks at my own background and reflexivity across you know, all of the, all of the um, issues and, and studies that I've done. And on the left, we see all of these different dimensions of our positionality that some of them are more privileged and some of them are more oppressed. However, we can't affect some of those ascribed statuses of how we appear and what privileges we do. So if we're gonna do this work, we need to really center who we are and what we bring and what that might mean to the people that we work with. So I want to move on from that to say, number one, my question was whether and how I should do this work. And that I, I went about doing that by asking a lot of indigenous women who gave me a lot of uh, great grief in a good way. And I always appreciate that because they, they make sure that I'm in, in a good, you know, approaching this in a good way and for good intentions. The reason I do this work is because I, I had heard in my PhD, you can only really do a little bit really in our lifetime. And I wanted to contribute to peoples that I, I really wanted to, um, you know, use my focus with. And so I was really guided to do that. I wanted to call out Emily Matt Salloway, an indigenous elder that is still my elder uh, in this, this work. She said, you need to look at how to do research before you look at the problem. And so that's what I did. And then um, I'm gonna talk some more about that in the next slide. That led me to um, being invited to go do work with the tribe with a, from a Choctaw woman about violence. And I wanted to look at resilience and um, that the community was interested in violence. So I did a study with violence and why is it so high. We used that work to develop this framework. Then we found out substance abuse and violence is really, you know, really very much high. It hangs together and family is really important. Um, and so, and also chronic health and kind of things we didn't expect to be really important, like food ways. These are all connected. Um, we know that you know alcohol was introduced with cellular colonization. So was flour and many of these substances that lead to obesity and violence. And we know that all of these factors, social, behavioral, physical factors are interrelated. And so this is much more expansive um, over time. 
But what are we going to do about it and how? Because I'm accountable to the communities and the work that I do always prioritizes the communities first. So I get, I get to know whether I should do this work by the response I get from the people that I'm in a relationship with. And that's how I've chosen to, to approach this so I'm, that I'm, I'm safeguarding. So what does all this mean for um, implementation science? It's facilitators and barriers to evidence-based health. Well, NIH says that we need to move away from this top-down approach because even if a, even if an intervention is helpful, it's not going to be used or um, uh, utilized or helpful if if the, if the community doesn't want it or if it isn't feasible. And so, when I had done the initial study on whether and how to do research, I interviewed in Indigenous and non-Indigenous researchers, and an inadvertent con um, outcome is that we develop this a toolkit of how to do this in a good way. My own positionality, I didn't grow up with indigenous peoples. And so I might not know if I'm doing something in a good way. And so they really gave me suggestions that have been published about how to, to kind of have a protocol to safeguard for me from doing harm and to ensure that I'm doing things in a good way. Over time, I think these principles have taken hold, but protocols are really important to follow before and while you're doing this work. Some of those suggestions are advocate, give back, invest resources, develop an infrastructure, work with cultural insiders, exhibit humility and a positive rem reputation, commit long-term, go the distance, use a tribal perspective and methodology and re reinforce cultural strengths and honor confidentiality. So sometimes even that means community confidentiality. And so these have structured the, the subsequent work and I really credit the success of the subsequent work to really following these, these protocols, very basic. It's not been my idea. I've just kind of listened and learned and followed directions. It's pretty, it, it, it works out really well. Um, and so many of the, the, those, those tools that I mentioned are exactly the same as what's recommended for implementation work, and that's culturally centered. We use a tribal methodology. All of these things um, are very much integrative. And we know that after funding ends, um, about 40% of programs end as well. So we really have to think about sustainability at the beginning for communities have, who have experienced historical oppression and inequities. I mentioned the, the progression of this research started with violence against women. Um, and then I found, um, we, we looked at, identified culturally specific risk and protective factors across ecological levels from that framework. And then we decided whether and how we should develop a program from the ground up, or um, is there an existing program that we can adapt? We identified the Celebrating Families program, which actually already had been adapted and worked with um, by a non Native American nonprofit named White Bison. And that person I mentioned at the beginning, the elder combi, knew them. And, and so he really appreciated um, their work and they have kind of a cultural approach to thinking about this program. The program is different than other programs in that it, it's a family focused approach um, and it focuses on violence prevention and substance abuse prevention. Um, it's important because many people that focus on like a school-based approach is great, but then they come back to their families in their context. And we know that um, family programs are two to nine times higher than um, culturally um, than than in individual programs, as well as culturally relevant programs tend to be four times higher. And if we don't use a cultural lens, the risk is that we cause harm. We've actually found that non-targeted interventions not only don't work as well, they can actually worsen outcomes. Um, but only 20% of programs are available culturally that are evidence-based, even though some states require them to use that. So then what happens is people have a one-size-fits-all program that may inadvertently assimilate um, Indigenous peoples. So we ended up choosing this program and found out from other communities that it was um, kind of unwieldy to implement. It was 16, 16 sessions, um, multiple age groups. And so what we worked with is how to adapt and integrate the cultural components, which were getting left off. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that, that instead of having the Western European dominant worldview that we, we place um, equal um, and even more, you know, focus on the indigenous um, parts of that program. So we approach this work again with the indigenous approaches of relationality in all of our work, reciprocity and res respect. And this contrasts with the more dominant Eurocentric, positivistic, heterosexist, you know, all of these um, able-bodied types of positionalities. Um, and we integrate into that to the structure you know, we've shortened and streamlined the original intervention to 10 sessions. We've integrated cultural content um, and we approach this with the four, the framework of historical oppression, resilience and transcendence and use talking circles and um, all cultural content that we've worked with the, with the tribal members to integrate. So it's all together in the curriculum and with an operations um, map that, that our program managers have developed so that this program can be used in other communities. And we have a whole template for that as well as text messages that reinforce the, the, the cultural strengths. 
So we're kind of ready to go because a lot of you know communities are resource strapped. And so we need to build that infrastructure when we have those that capacity so that that's not put on to communities and then it doesn't allow them to um, adopt it. And this is an example of how we've integrated cultural community, family, and individual protective factors into the program. And the structure is it's family focused. Anyone in their family, you know, inclusively can come. Um, elders, you know, aunts, anyone in the household, they come together with a family meal and we integrate food waste and tribal nutrition and subsistence within the teachings of this family meal. And the meal promotes rituals and positive communication. After that, people divide into their individual um, age groups. So we have parents, adolescents, children, and young children. We offer um, child care. We have indigenous chefs cook the food and, and do all of this work. Um, and so they learn the same topic, which are um, displayed on the left. Um, we have about you know, 10 sessions focused on wellness, um, substance abuse prevention, healthy relationships, violence prevention, emotional regulation, which we know we need to have so we don't cope through alcohol and other drug abuse and violence. I mean, then, you know, healthy relationships, resilience, problem solving, you know, how to have the, the skills so you don't have to turn to some of these um, poor um, coping mechanisms that hurt yourself. So everyone learns the same kind of focus. It begins with a talking circle, starting from the heart and a relational um, approach. And then they come back together and affirm those teachings with their family in quality time. All of these um, aspects are protective factors we've identified in, in the, in the uh, preliminary research. We have, you know, tribal teachings with a sacred tree book and it, it's all infused in all of those parts. So does it work? Um, first of all, you know, we're in the middle of the clinical trial. We're not looking at any of that, that information, but from the pilot, um, you know, and from the preliminary research, we developed the historical oppression scale and also the family resilience scale, which integrates culture, you know, into, um, into that aspect of it. And so we have found with the pilot of um, eight, eight, eight families and 33 people, um, because we've develop these measures with the community, we can get some robust findings. And so we, we have warranted information to move forward. We found that communal mastery and resilience and also individual and family resilience were improved after the intervention as well as social support. The ability to uh, regulate your emotions with, which underlies psychopathology and drug and alcohol abuse as well as violence was improved. The ability to overcome con conflict without uh, co with communication instead of violence and um, uh, psychological abuse were improved, as well as health-related quality of life and sugar-sweetened beverage consumption. So it's very much a holistic improvement across the board. With the full pilot results, we found a, a three-fold reduction in alcohol use. We found significant reductions in drug use, anxiety, improvements in parenting, and um, renal mastery and discrimination. Interestingly, we use this historical oppression scale, and we found that people who reported higher levels of perceived historical oppression found greater reductions in our outcomes of interest, and including alcohol abuse, drug use, and anxiety, which is interesting because it seems like if people are connecting their problems, destigmatizing that in a way, so that they're understood in a more of a structural context, they feel less, they feel better, right? And they, they don't feel like they need to necessarily use these other coping mechanisms. So it's really important to, to structure um, these uh, historical oppression and determinants with behavioral and mental outcomes. Um, again, we found a threefold um, reduction in alcohol use. It was higher for men, likely because the um, baseline rate was higher, but really great um, results to start with. For sustainability, we have recruited, um, currently recruited over 122 families and 560 people. We've trained 60 CHRs from the community who are also within the institutions of the community in the Boys and Girls Club. So we have a place where this can continue later on. We've trained them. They're actually implemented in it now. So we, we hit the ground running, we, we meet with them monthly. So we know and have two years to make sure that this will continue and find funding sources if, if that's needed as well. We've trained people on four times, people have gone on to get their licensure and PhDs um, and we, we hire um, tribal people, over 50% of the funding goes directly to tribal people. Um, and then we've retained our family. So usually it's about 40% re retaining but because we use our program, our program managers really reach out and retain and have that relationship building. Um, almost 90% of people who start the program end it. Um, we offer the virtual options for COVID, but that, that really shows that this program um, is um, being implemented and is being sustainable. We offer invite, we, we invite families back for talking circles as well as CHR so that community cohesion can continue and build as well as our own healing for community health representatives. And then on a personal note, we, we do decolonizing dialogues with our own group, with ourselves. We have a multi-backgrounded um, 
team. And so we look at um, decolonizing our own mindset um, and our approach to things within the research uh, and our um, practice situation. So to, to end this part, I just wanna say that um, community advisory board members who led this and piloted this program have said what this program means to them. And I'll just read two quotes. They said, it's based on our culture and our history. Nothing can heal us like our own people who have been through the problems we present. We have a shared history and a better understanding of what is needed to help the family heal. Another person said, I love that we took the time to base it on our tribal beliefs and how our families operate. It's changed the way I look at addiction and has helped me to find better ways to help those struggling. It's also helped me with my spiritual understanding and brought me peace. And so the question to return to is who and what is the intervention for? We wanna continue this work, but also how can we um, dismantle some of the colonial mindsets and approaches that we have in our institutions and in ourselves. So though that we don't, we aren't complicit in inadvertently or directly perpetuating the same problems that were brought in with settler colonization. If you're interested in more about this, um, I'm, I'm, I'm offering a free workshop that synthesizes self-care for uh, health practitioners, as well as this kind of um, social justice aspect. And so if you're wanting to find out more about that process and that dialogue, because it's collective, um, about how to dismantle that, you know, feel free to reach out to me and we, um, we have a workshop available in, in um, January. So Yakoki, thank you so much. It's an honor to be with you and share this time with you. Dr. McKinley, thank you so much for that wonderful and powerful presentation. If you have questions for Dr. McKinley, please place them in the question and answer box and we'll answer them in the Q&A session. Now let's welcome our next presenters, Dr. Christina Lee and her colleagues, Melanie, Melanie Morris and Victoria Lopez. Thank you. Let's see. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, I'm really, these have been such great presentations. Um, I'm delighted to present the third panel alcohol use among Latinos, and to have joining me Melanie Morris, who is a PhD student in the BU School of Social Work, <clears throat> and Victoria Lopez, who is a bachelor's a BS from Boston University. Both are members of our, our research lab at BU, and we're working on a NIAAA funded project, which I'm going to briefly describe at the end of our talk. I just wanted to also acknowledge the support of NIAAA because it's an institute that's always had a commitment or a strong commitment to diversity. Um, Melanie is going to begin by presenting data on the prevalence of alcohol use among Latinas and factors that influence substance use. Victoria will then continue the talk by describing health effects of alcohol use and noted barriers around seeking substance use treatment among Latinas. And I'm going to end by presenting some preliminary qualitative data from our ongoing study. So handing off to Melanie now. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Lee. As Dr. Lee mentioned, I'll begin by reviewing the prevalence of alcohol consumption, binge drinking and alcohol use disorder. Here on the slide, we see alcohol consumption, which is defined as any use of alcohol in the past 30 days. On the left-hand side, figure one, we see the percentage of alcohol consumption among female adolescents aged 12 to 17, and that's in the darker shade of blue, and female young adults aged 18 to 25, which is the lighter shade of blue by race. And on the right-hand side, we see the same thing, which is figure two, and it's the same information, but for males. This data is from the 2018 National Survey of Drug Use and Health. And specifically highlighted in the green boxes is the percentage of alcohol consumptions for Latinos. Overall, we see that the rates of alcohol consumption are similar among Latino men and women. And so now we'll talk about binge drinking. Binge drinking is defined as drinking four or more drinks for women and five or more drinks for men on the same occasion on at least one day in the past 30 days. This data again is from the 2018 NASDAQ. And highlighted in the green boxes, we see the percentage of binge drinking for Latinos. We see that Latinos 18 to 25 years old, 
that Latino women's binge drinking does exceed that of Latino men at 33% versus 21.3%. This is a concern because binge drinking is often associated with greater health and social consequences, and we will touch on this later in the presentation. Now we'll talk about alcohol use disorder, which is defined by the DSM-4 in this data set from the 2018 NASDA. Again, highlighted in the green boxes, we see that Latino women and Latino men have similar rates of AUD diagnosis for both age groups. And overall, what these prevalence charts suggest is that there is a narrowing gender gap in alcohol-related outcomes, which has been noted throughout the conference. And so now talking about what are factors that influence alcohol use. Among Latinos, we know that alcohol use occurs within a gendered context that is strongly tied to just traditional gender norms, which are a set belief and ex which are set beliefs and expectations regarding the role of each gender in society. These gender norms are known as marinismo for women, which is summarized on the left-hand side of the slide, and machismo for men, which is summarized on the right-hand side of the slide. There are both positive and negative aspects of each gender norm that research has shown may be protective or risk factors for alcohol use. Traditionally, it's been found that Latino men tend to drink more than Latino women. However, as noted previously, this gender gap is narrowing. And one reason for this that has been cited often is acculturation. Acculturation is the multidimensional and dynamic process whereby individuals experience changes in beliefs and behaviors due to exposure and adaptation to a new social context. Research has shown that acculturation has greater impact on Latinos women Latino women's alcohol use than Latino men, and specifically in binge drinking, which we noted earlier. One reason is that let, as Latinas acculturate to mainstream US society, maintaining values characteristic of Marianismo become more difficult, often due to the presence of a new and relatively more liberal environment, which may result in the participation of risky behaviors. And we see this specifically among college age Latinas, more Latino women are attending college or at least have some college experience compared to Latino men. And so if we think about this developmental period, it's a critical time in which young adults are developing and determining their values, beliefs, and ideas, which is often marked by higher freedom, experimentation, and identity exploration. For Latino women specifically, the self-exploration may conflict with their cultural and ethnic identity at home. And so given this critical period of ongoing identity development, the process of adjustment to the U.S. and U.S. cultures may lead young adults to experience acculturative stress that influence their beliefs, values, and drinking behaviors. And so now talking more about acculturation stress, which is defined as the cultural conflict or pressure to maintain one's heritage culture and or adapt to the dominant culture, as they adjust to a new society. And so here we see two models. On the left-hand side, figure seven shows a conceptual framework by De La Rosa. And on the right-hand side, figure eight, we show an analytical model by Buchanan and Smokowski of how acculturation stress may lead to substance use behaviors among adolescent Latinos. Both this framework and the analytic model show that this relationship between acculturation stress and substance use is multidimensional and there's many different factors and mediators that may impact it. De La Rosa was foundational in pointing to the need to understand the mechanism in which acculturation impacts substance use and Buchanan and Slubowski then tested this mechanism. And so we see here in figure eight, they found that acculturation stress, which can be seen, the factors of acculturation stress are seen in the highlighted yellow box. Um, that it did not exactly directly lead to substance use, but rather it's influenced by family and friend relationship, which in turn affect adolescent mental health problems, finally impacting substance use behaviors. And so in this model, we see that key mediators in this pathway from acculturation stress to substance use were parent-adolescent conflict, internalizing problems and externalizing problems, which I said again are highlighted in figure eight. And what was important to note for both of these researchers is that they highlighted the need to further explore and address the role of acculturation stress in the substance use behavior, specifically for Latino adolescents. And now I'll hand it off to Victoria. Thank you, Molly. 
Uh, I will now be introducing another factor that influences alcohol use, which is the impact of migration and the criminalization of immigration status. Um, in 2018, there were 23.3 million female migrants with the highest population coming from Mexico. It's important to note that we're seeing a rise in female migrants at a time when US migration policies have become increasingly punitive, which has been supported by media portrayals that criminalize them. And these portrayals directly impact migrants, but they also extend to US born Latino. Uh, the consequences of punitive anti-immigration policies and negative media are immigration related stressors, such as the risk of deportation or detainment, or being stopped or questioned regarding immigration status by immigration officials. In a study led by Miguel Pinedo, US born Latinos were surveyed on drinking and drug use, as well as on a series of immigration related stressors. Um, it's important to understand that Pinedo conducted this study with US born Latinos, which means that the respondents that were surveyed all had full legal status and protections of a US citizen. And yet even with this full protection, they still bear the negative mental and physical health impacts of criminalized immigration. For example, um, with regards to alcohol and substance use, we can see the impacts of migration in this table from Pinedo study. Um, and as you can see, the immigration related stressor of being separated from one's parents as a minor because parents were deported increases the odds for heavy drinking, high intensity drinking, illicit drug use, and prescription drug misuse. The more spillover effects can be seen where there are increased odds for heavy drinking and illicit drug use um, are significant for the fearing or worrying about being detained for immigration reasons. Um, understanding the effects of these immigration related stressors on alcohol and substance use then leads us to the health effects of alcohol use, such as intimate partner violence or IPV. Uh, this is a health effect of alcohol that disproportionately affects Latinas and alcohol use is both a cause and consequence of IPV, but if alcohol is involved, compared to other racial or ethnic groups, Latinas are at a greater risk of experiencing IPV. Um, in a study done by Nowatny and Graves, the researchers collected data from the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent to Adult Health, which is referred to as Ad Health. And in 1994, 90,000 adolescents completed questionnaires for ad health related to the health and health related behaviors, um, such as personal traits, families, friendships, and romantic relationships. Um, some respondents that were surveyed in ad health then later participated in four in home interviews, which are referred to as waves one, two, three, and four. And in these interviews, the respondents were asked a series of questions, again, relating to demographics, such um, socioeconomic status, substance use, and the four dimensions of IPV, which are minor violence, major violence, rape or sexual coercion, and injury. Um, the researchers analyzed wave three and four interviews and determined that drug using Latinas are six times more likely to engage, um, to experience major violence, and four times more likely to experience an injury from IPV. Um, understanding the health effects of alcohol leads us to accessing treatment for alcohol use. Um, in a study, again, done by Pinedo in 2019, the data from the researchers' parent study was analyzed. Um, and in that parent study, participants included those who had an AUD or DUD within the past five years. Participants were interviewed about treatment-related barriers, and they specifically looked at data by the women in their sample and concluded that Latinas generally seek specialty treatment services much less than their white counterparts. Um, and this finding has been supported in many other studies. But those disparities exist within the Latinx demographic too. Uh, in a study led by Sarah Z. Moore in 2014, researchers collected data from the 2000, 2005, and 2010 national alcohol surveys and found that Latino women with alcohol use disorders access substance use treatment at a rate of 2.5%, whereas Latino men access substance use treatment at a rate of 6.8%. Um, and we can understand a few key reasons that Latinas are accessing treatment services at such low rates. Um, in Pinedo's study that was referenced on the prior slide, it was found that Latinas generally seek specialty treatment services less due to attitudes and subjective norms. Um, this means that unlike other respondents who were Black and white adults, Latina interviewees were more likely to report cultural factors as barriers. 
for example, that treatment wouldn't be effective because providers were unfamiliar with their culture and never experienced important social context experiences such as immigration and discrimination, and thus felt as though providers would be unable to relate to their personal experiences and not seeking treatment due to shame from family or community members, and that having an SUD or an AUD and getting help for it is culturally stigmatized. And thank you. I will now pass things over to Dr. Lee. All right, thank you, um, Melanie and Victoria. In this last part of the presentation, I'm going to share some qualitative data from our type one hybrid effectiveness implementation study that's being conducted across primary care sites in collaboration with the Complex Care Management Program, or CCM, that is funded um, by the Affordable Care Act. So the CCM specifically targets the top 2% medical utilizers or hard to reach medically and behaviorally complex patients. Most are temporarily housed with serious mental illness or are returning citizens. So I'm sharing this data because the comments from the CCM staff who we interviewed as part of the study echoed the early, some earlier findings about barriers for Latinas and provide um, an important different perspective that can help to address those barriers. So here's um, a slide uh, depicting the type one study design. So it's actually two separate studies that's being conducted in parallel. At the top, you see the design for study number one, which is a random not, randomized clinical effectiveness trial. The trial study aims are to train community health workers to deliver an evidence-based intervention, a culturally adapted motivational interview that's shown to reduce harms related to alcohol use um, and reductions in mental health symptoms among Latinos in a phase two efficacy trial and compare that against standard care, which is CHW delivery of an integrated primary care wraparound intervention. Um, primary outcomes are harms, are reductions in harms related to alcohol and drug use decreases in depressive and anxiety symptoms and increases in community engagement as well as motivation to seek employment. Implementation related aims are to understand the process of optimizing the fit of the intervention, which is the CAMI, into a real life setting. So to investigate this process, we're conducting qualitative surveys and gathering quantitative um, data at three time points, before the CAMI training, after the CAMI launch, and at the end of the study. Today, I'll be sharing some of those results of the qualitative study taken, bef uh, taken before the CAMI training. And we're also conducting a cost analysis of the CAMI intervention, but that will not be shared in this presentation. So our quantitative measures um, included surveys on organizational readiness, perceptions of evidence-based practice, and a workshop evaluation. Our qualitative interviews investigated perceptions of CCM staff on reasons for substance use, barriers to care, and proposed solutions. And because this is an implementation study, we also sought to consider each proposed solution as a potential adaptation to um, the facilitator element, which is training the CAMI. The tension between adaptation and fidelity is really important in implementation research. So we are monitoring that as a study team as well. So here are some example study questions. We asked um, uh, CCM staff to tell us about the challenges that they felt that their patients faced. Um, and this, we, you know, we asked them first about patients in general and then Latino patients, Latino patients specifically. We also asked questions that were more about the organizational level, for example, asking how leaders in the CCM could support patients with unhealthy um, substance use. Here's a description of our study participants. Nearly all were women and about half were community health workers. Um, we had seven Latino CCM staff members, 10 white and 10 black or African-American CCM staff. Interestingly, the CHWs were 16 years older than their managers. So the resulting transcripts were coded using thematic analysis. And to guide interpretation of the data, I chose 
uh, Mark Hatzenbuehler's framework of structural stigma. This framework broadens understanding of stigma from the individual and interpersonal level out to the broader macro social level. Structural stigma is of relevance to Latinos because many do not identify as being racialized, yet are marginalized and excluded from the mainstream by way of discriminatory immigration policies. So Hudson Buehler defines structural stigma to consist of societal level conditions. Um, this was mentioned earlier, cultural norms and or institutional policies that constrain the opportunities, resources and well-being of the stigmatized. Examples of societal level conditions include homeless shelters that we were told can be a trigger for use. Institutional policies can also mean the failure to enact um, uh, required policies such as harm reduction. One of our findings was that CCM staff said that harm reduction was not entirely supported by individual providers, although that was mandated as the standard of care. Um, in the below quote, uh, treatment is described as being only for crazy people. Um, here, the CHW is describing a negative stereotype that enforces cultural norms against seeking help for substance use disorder, and that this was something that they were hearing from their Latino patients. And so this corroborates the earlier Pinedo study, where Latino patients also said things like, you don't talk about your problems, and where treatment is viewed as a personal failure. Um, secondly, uh, at the, uh, in this model, interpersonal stigma really has to do with the interactions between the stigmatized and the non-stigmatized. And so here we have an example of family stigma. Um, this first quote in the above reflects how the family is stigmatizing the user. Um, the CHW is describing how the patient doesn't want to admit to his family that he is using substances because the family would not be in favor of his seeking treatment. The second quote um, on the bottom is reflective of provider stigma. And here, um, the CHWs are telling us that they're perceiving a gap between Latino patients and their providers. And so this corroborates the earlier point made that when Latino patients feel their providers, feel that their providers are unfamiliar with their past experiences, which can include, um, which may be related to immigration or discrimination they feel overall that the provider would be unable to relate to their personal experiences, including their alcohol and drug use. And so that this is linked to the perception that treatment would not be effective. Finally, um, individual level stigma refers to the psychological processes that people engage in when they respond to stigma or in their response to stigma. Examples, as mentioned earlier, include self uh, internalization or self stigma or concealment of their stigmatized identity. So this quote here suggests that Latinas internalize stigma around their substance use um, and that it leads to the reluctance to be seen seeking help. And this is likely because of the cultural prohibitions um, against women using alcohol or drugs. In our work, we found that these barriers are further compounded by the fact that many experience domestic violence, as well as legal issues relating to documentation. Uh, we've also found that some of our patients fear losing child custody if it is known that they are alcohol or drug involved. So this slide was taken from the patient perspective of, of a patient about 10 years ago and says basically the same thing. You can, um, this was in Spanish at, above, but it really speaks to the entrenched nature of these cultural prohibitions. And the quotes translated as, in my culture, people don't drink and I don't want people to look badly at me. So the findings from this qualitative analysis about stigma help to reconfigure our recruiting procedures. For example, um, we removed the audit questions as screeners to uh, minimize um, patients feeling targeted about their use. We also initiated screening, quest screening questions about alcohol that were more conversational and more open-ended, such as how would you describe your drinking to open up the um, screening interview process. So in conclusion, I'd say that in our presentation today, we have observed or presented data to support 
reasons for the narrowing gender gap in alcohol consumption that's also been observed among Latino men and women. And we've also described unique risk factors for alcohol misuse among Latinas, which include restrictive gender norms and expectations um, or being subject to the criminalization of immigrant status. A main finding from our study has been the documentation of stigma at multiple levels. Um, we feel that our findings can help at the individual level, and we're hoping also at the provider and organizational level at well, as well. For example, in the future, we could do trainings um, to help reduce negative stereotypes around substance use that may be more culturally embedded for Latinos and Latinas. And in the future, um, possibly PSA anti-stigma campaigns for substance use disorder that we think might be particularly useful in the Latino community. So I'd just like to conclude by thanking also our hardworking, dedicated study staff, um, the community health workers on our study and the implementation co-investigators. Thank you. Dr. Lee, Ms. Morris, Ms. Lopez, thank you for this great presentation. If you have questions for Dr. Lee and her team, please place them in the chat box. Or if you have questions for any of our panelists, we are going to start the Q&A session now. So ask away. Hearing none at the moment, I, I would love to get started. I have a question for Dr. McKinley in thinking about community-based participatory research, particularly how you apply it. And you mentioned um, in your presentation that you train, your team trains the communities that you work with so they can carry on what, whatever initiative that needs to be carried on post the grant. That's that's always what I'm concerned about is once the money runs out and once the scientists aren't there, does the community thrive? Can you speak to that? Absolutely. It's such a such an important question. Um, and you know I think as it 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 works in complementary because um you know initially I was doing all the reaching out of like you know calling people and you know, as the program grows, we need other. You know, everyone needs to sustain it. So it's, it, it can't grow unless there is that capacity building. And I would say, you know, resources need to be really targeted for that reason. Um, and so uh, we have, we've all gone through training, and then we provide the training for for CHR. So the community advisory board. Um, I do an introduction, and then it's really the community advisory board, and they model it, and it's experiential. So everyone can actually train people to do this program because we do because that's how you learn. So it's very much experiential. Everyone has done the program, and then we brought people within the institution um, and have regular meetings for the last you know uh, for the last year or so, and will continue for the next two years monthly meeting with uh, in, in this case the Boys and Girls Club who has national networks of, of native people where it might be disseminated. You know the program itself I'm not possessive of, and so you know so so it's kind of like. Where, where will it need to land and how will it be disseminated? It's possible that it could be taken up by that kind of national agency, for instance. Um, and so it, it takes, you know, thinking at the beginning. And, you know, the, the reason why that the, the program was open to us is because they've seen the work we've done over the years, right? Um, and they also, you know, see that provide, you know, can we provide some infrastructure, you know, some of these operations maps, you know, a setup thing where we just hire, you know, like have a have a 10 person, you know, 10 hour a week person to like, you know, help with the retention. And so we try to do the heavy lifting on the infrastructure so that it can be disseminated more cross nationally and people to have the training to be the leaders and to continue to be the leaders and to develop, to develop them. And with the peer kind of community health rep representatives, uh, people can come in with experience, not just the higher education, because we know there's a lot of educational discrimination. So we have several people who have gone through the program who have become CHRs. We just want to make this program available and so that we can create like communities of health, right? And so, um, and that I do believe like, it's interesting to think about disasters and climate change. This is a nimble community that can come together, you know, kind of really quickly and respond to community challenges more broadly beyond this program because we try to invest in that community building um, as well. Um, we have actually housed it more outside of institutions because that's what the recommendations were with tribal members at that time. 
Um, but now we can to get to the point where we can institutionalize it in a way that um, is acceptable. Does that make sense? So we had to kind of like, kind of be beyond almost like a bureaucracy initially to do it in the way that works and to make it attractive for people to opt in and continue with that. So I don't know if that answers your question, but you know, it, yeah, you don't, we don't want to do harm and it really is, you know, harmful, right? If we don't find a way to continue the program. So it's on everyone's hearts. We think about it and talk about it every meeting, so. That absolutely answers the question. Thank you. Are there any questions from the panelists or, or from the audience? Let's see. There's one question and it reads, faith-based programs seem to work related to Black women that are straight, but can you talk about why this might not work for Black LGBTQ populations? So I believe this question is for Dr. Jordan, and we will be happy to forward it to her and post the response on NIAAA's website at a later time. So, uh, Dr. Dr. Brown, this is Dr. Hannah. Yes, can you uh, come up with a question? Can you ask that question again? I know you mentioned it was for Dr. Jordan. Let me see if I can, you know, jump in on her behalf. Dr. Hannah, I'm so glad um, you're you're here, and I will read it again. Faith-based programs seem to work related to Black women that are straight. But can you talk about why this might not work for Black LGBTQ people? Oh, uh, well, I, can you hear me? Yes, yes, so we can question. hear you. I mean, the, the, we all know some of the challenges around um, LGBTQ community within the Black church. Um, I have to say there's a mixed bag around, just forget mental health for a second, just in terms of acceptance, being part of the community, some of the rich, rich community-based support that is there for black folks. Uh, there can be challenges when it comes to people who identify as gay or lesbian and all that, right? So that's one, one bucket. But the, the evidence, so there's no evidence to say this cannot work for people uh, uh, in, the, in black churches, uh, people who identify as queer, who identify as gay in black churches. The only thing is that, is it welcoming? Uh, is the intervention uh, sort of structured in a way that allows you to feel connected? So I think that's, the, that's where the science needs to look at. But on the surface of it, I really don't see any reason why the, the black church cannot be a place uh, to provide services for people who identify as other than um, straight. Thank you. And there is also another question. We had another question for Dr. Jordan that you may be able to answer as well. In your current treatment trial in the church, we are gender were, were gender differences observed in treatment engagement and retention? Is gender specific program available? And how was the trial able to address the pervasive fear of CPS involvement? Okay, so th that's a good question. I think at this early stage, the, the, the Black Church intervention, the Imani, Imani U program is in the pilot, you know, so we've we rolled out the pilot, we are seeing people now, we don't have uh, any specific data at this point around this intervention, but I do think that part of the beauty of the Imani U project is it's really organic and community-based. So as we go along, these are data that can come up that will come up as we go along. I mean, we're really in early stages of, of implementation. So some of those questions definitely can be answered when we start getting there. But right now it's really just rollout stage. Wonderful. Thank you. We have a few more minutes. And I have a question for, for all the panelists, if you can chime in. It, it would be great if you can address the need and strategies to develop a culturally competent workforce. I believe cultural competence cut across where it was a theme that cut across all of your talks. Can you speak to that? I would say that really quick, I know we have just a few minutes. Um, the, the one thing I would say is to start with uh, cultural humility and really to understand um, we have varying multifaceted backgrounds, all, you know, that we that we can't control some of them, but we're responsible, you know, for that. And so becoming educated about um, and centering, uh, you know, non-dominant kind of uh, 
ways of being, theories, approaches, um, to really become educated about communities that we're working with in localized ways. Uh, I think that is a huge investment and to, to kind of commit long-term um, to really uh, building those relationships and sustaining them um, and being teachable. So I think like at, at a personal level, um, that humility um, and uh, really learning and working in dialogue and more egalitarian kind of power relationships is really a starting point. Um, I have two I have two different answers. The first is um, we have greatly learned so much from uh, enjoyed and learned so much from our community health workers. Um, they know their experts are telling us, you know, this is how we should do it and we're listening. I think that's kind of a first important and I think cultural humility is key there. Um, but and I think so that is one workforce. Um, people with experience in the community that should be developed. Um, the second approach, um, and so results from one of our studies showed that regardless of the provider Spanish level of fluency, patients responded positively, right? There were good outcomes. And so what I'm, what I'm trying to say is providers are trying, like, of the providers who are trying and want to learn, I think there's a lot of potential for, for doing trainings, for like um, doing kind of um, pointers on how you might frame something differently, giving the space to really let people talk instead of rushing in. These are all kind of, um, instead of rushing in to try to help just let, let, listening to difficult things, I think that there's a lot of opportunity to train the existing workforce who are well-meaning um, and there's potential because the patients are, you know, they're so forgiving, right? They're, you know, they're, they want, they're appreciative, but we want to do better. So, so I think that's the first two different suggestions, train the existing, acknowledge the expertise that's in the community and rise, raise that up, you know? And secondly, with the people who are in the field already to try to do more trainings and awareness. Thank you so much. Those were excellent questions. And we are out of time right now, but I did place two questions in the chat for the panelists that just came through, one involving co-authorship for community partners and another involving patient provider, quality patient provider relationships. If you can answer them, I'm sure the NIAAA's team will um, post, post your responses. Thank you. Um, do you... Do you want me to try or? Well, no, I think later? we should transition. Okay. You can, yes, please try to answer in the chat. And we probably should, let's see where we are in the agenda. Okay. Move to the next panel and, oh, um, well, there's a break. <laughs> so sure, try to answer for people who need to take a break. They can, but um, I'll stick around to hear the answer to the question. Mm -hmm research approaches? If so, can you share how co-publishing with community stakeholders are negotiated? I, I mean, I can speak basically on my past research, but not specifically within the community participatory framework. So um, Catherine, if you want to take it, take a yeah, shot I'll answer, at the question. Maybe, happy maybe to. the next one, uh, you can answer them too, you know, but yeah, so uh, so the, 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 the community advisory board member quotes that I read are from a publication that we have coming out with, um, with community advisory board members. And so uh, how we no negotiated that was we offered whoever wanted to be involved in the publication could. Um, you know, it does, you know, there's, there's uh, multiple pressures, you know, um, with, with timing and, and um, availability. What I try to do is involve people in the way they want to, to be. So what's meaningful for them. We've had uh, people present with us at um, you know, national uh, conferences. They come and travel with us and co-present also at Tulane University. And so I try to involve people in a meaningful way. Um, as I become you know, more mid-career level, I'm able to kind of slow down some of these processes. And so with our COVID qualitative data, we're going to be using kind of a dialogic process to integrate and people have expressed interest in publication. So for those who are interested, we're, we're going to co-publish um, these qualitative results from the COVID um, findings. But yes, yeah, so that, that publication on the, um, the impact of community advisory members is co-published. And so try to offer that to people who um, are interested and that's meaningful for them. I, but I it, it also try to have people 
um, participate in ways that are, you know, like it might be that they just need a need a, a little bit of like a job and, and they want to be the chef or, you know, so I try to integrate people in ways that make sense for them and that they want to do, not in ways that um, like Western European structures say, um, you know, are important solely. Like I, I kind of base it within a kind of a relationship with the people in congruency, like their self-determination as well but offer that, offer those opportunities um, if, if that, that's something that is chosen. Um, it, in my prior work, um, I have, you know, I have uh, people who work in the community who have um, collaborated with me on analyzing some of the data. And it was um, important to extend an invitation that they participate. And I think um, for people who, um, who are not, who don't work in research to have the um, they appreciated the opportunity to be involved and to to view that as another important experience that they could have in their own lives and jobs. So my answer is to the extent possible, include. Wonderful, thank, thank you so much. Do any other panelists want to weigh in? We do have an, another question. All right, so I'll read the last question that we have. I see a theme of how quality patient provider relationships matter in quality treatment for alcohol use disorders and substance use disorders. In everyone's opinion, do you think that this is up to the patient provider or both? If so, what are the responsibilities of the patient and provider in alcohol use disorder and substance use disorder treatment plans? Um, well, um, my, my bias, you know, my, I have training in motivational interviewing. So my bias is, um, that here, this is where negotiation matters, right? The treatment plan will only be as effective to the extent that the patient or, or, um, client is invested. So, so I think that if I look at the question again, um, I don't see the question, I, I can read it again. Uh -huh. I see a theme of how quality patient provider relationships mm -hmm. matter in quality treatment for alcohol use disorders and substance use disorders. In everyone's opinion, do you think that this is up to the patient, provider, or both? If so, what are the responsibilities of the patient and provider in alcohol use disorder and substance use disorder treatment plans? Um. To answer it more precisely, I would say that um, you kind of let the patient, the patient drive um, the goals, and that's something that the community health workers do, um, uh, just as a principle. And um, they drive the goals. And I think, yeah, in terms of writing it out, the um, I guess the provider would take use their expertise to frame what would be appropriate, I don't know. So. Okay. Please. Yeah, I definitely agree that the kind of the self-determination people need to be invested for it to be really sustainable and, and go forward. Um, and so, yeah, I think as a provider, you know, in social work, we, we you know, know that the relationship is central. And so that relationship has to be there for really anything to follow. And that there is distrust, but it's un usually understandable distrust based on real experiences. And so really, more should be spent on spending time for that quality relationship, but this chat, which is challenging given, you know, imagine managed care and, um, you know, what people sometimes call like a neoliberal, like overload, case overload, not a lot of time, you lack having to have outcomes right away. These kind of things really um, interfere with the ability to, 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 to build that relationship. And, you know, practitioners own kind of burnout and role overload and these kind of things really, um, they're, they're in a system that makes it difficult to really provide quality care. So I think that these, these things need to be examined multi-systemically and how that sometimes care workers can end up being managers you know, in the system instead of providing opportunity for healing and what structures can institutions provide so that people can be more, um, can, can work in ways that they've been trained um, in their disciplines um, and in communion and more collaborative types of um, approaches. Thank you, thank you. We have another question. It says, the, the participant says, amazing panel. 
I am curious about your strategies on how you have successfully recruited your study participants and involved your communities for your substance use disorder projects. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, one, one really important thing was is really to keep in mind that um, people understandably do not want to be labeled as somebody who needs treatment. So that has always been very important in our work to frame it as kind of um, a way of delivering health education. Or, uh, and people also thought it was important to participate as a way of supporting the community. Um, we found that at the end of the study, the studies, people had a good experience. So they would refer their friends and acquaintances. Um, so I think that also helps to really have a, a study that feels welcoming and inclusive um, or a project. Um, and lastly, we use things like radio talk shows also in the beginning to, um, and where there was a Q&A about the study that went out to the community. And that was helpful in the early years. But then as we went on, we would do um, ads on buses, you know, free ads on buses. That was, that was for our first study. Um, so I have several other suggestions depending on um, the setting, but I'll stop there. I think the destigmatizing is really the important first step. I really agree with that. Thank you so much. I want to thank all of the panelists for their wonderful presentations. And I also want to remind the participants to print out the templates that you were sent and write out your why regarding breaking stigma or facing harmful alcohol use. Take a picture um, of yourself and uh, take a selfie and email it back to the NIAAA. So thank you again. And thank you for your time staying over what we've asked you to do over the time we've asked you to stay for the panel and I thank the participants as well have a wonderful day bye thank you, everyone thank you bye. so we'll have a short break now until 11.05 Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Heidi Hutton, and I'm your moderator for this second installment of Prevention and Treatment for Special Populations. I'm really pleased to in, uh, welcome our panelists, who are Dr. Elizabeth Epstein, Dr. Catherine glanton Holzauer, Dr. Jillian Shear, Dr. Gatanjali Gita Chander, and, and Dr. Faye Taxman. And as before, following their presentations, at the end, there'll be a 15 minute Q&A. So if you would put your questions in the box, then uh, we can address them at the, at the end. Now, please welcome our first presenter, Dr. Elizabeth Epstein. Uh, hi, um, I would like, to, uh, today I'll be talking, I can't, can you guys, okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so today I'll be giving an overview, a brief overview of treatment and prevention for alcohol and other substance misuse for senior women. Um, and then Dr. Holtzhauer is going to present some data some secondary analysis from um, one of our studies on uh, development of female specific treatment for uh, women with alcohol use disorder. I'd like to acknowledge our um, team across 25 years of our female specific treatment development research program. I'd like to thank NIAAA for funding um, this research and also NIAAA staff who've been amazing and um, have really helped to make this happen. So first off, how do we define senior when we're talking about senior women? In the lifespan phase developmental literature, there's a lack of consensus about 
what actually, um, how it's actually defined. So in the literature, you'll see some papers um, citing women over 50 and some women over 56 and some over 65. So I think that's partly because this is still an unfolding understudied topic. Um, but for our purposes, we chose um, to define senior women as older than uh, 56 or above. Uh, we did this for biological considerations. Most women are postmenopausal by age 56. Uh, also want to sort of acknowledge that this is a very large lifespan phase and there are several sub cohorts in this phase. Uh, one heuristic that was offered in 1974 by Bernice Newgarten was um, young old, uh, sorry, old old and oldest old. And um, I think this is sort of a nice way to break up these sub cohorts um, going forward. So the target population of senior women with uh, substance use disorder is growing. And by the way, we'll be focusing mostly on alcohol use disorder for this talk. All 38 million women baby boomers are now in late adulthood. The youngest baby boomers turned 55 in 2019 and the oldest are now about 74 years old. There's about um, a total of 53 million women age 55 plus in the US at this point. So it's a very large, very heterogeneous population. And at, when we talk about senior women and substance use, there's also the, um, the intersectionality of, of everything else, ethnic, racial backgrounds, diversity, um, a multi, um, multi-morbidity. Uh, so, so it's sort of a complicated topic and lots of moderators that we have to address. In terms of alcohol, there's a growing prevalence of alcohol consumption among postmenopausal compared to premenopausal women. Among women over age 50, the past year prevalence of alcohol use disorder was 2.4% in 2013. Um, that represented an 85% relative increase since 2005. The continuing increase in alcohol misuse among senior women over the past decade is an emerging public health problem. Use of illicit drugs are still relatively rare in older women. Um, marijuana use, however, and prescribed psychoanalytic psychoactive medications with addiction potential, such as opiates and benzodiazepines, are a growing problem at this point. Aging compounds alcohol and drug-related risk for women. Postmenopausal women are more vulnerable to alcohol-related medical and psychiatric problems at lower levels of alcohol consumption than men or premenopausal women. That's mostly because physiological changes during and after menopause increase negative effects of alcohol in the brain and other organs. <clears throat> For instance, hormonal changes such as reduction in estrogen impair enzymes that metabolize alcohol and older women have a reduction in liver and kidney function, lean body mass, total body water content and effectiveness of blood brain barrier. So basically they metabolize alcohol even less well than younger women do. So older women with alcohol use disorder are thus more likely than younger women to have um, negative consequences of alcohol and drug use. So for instance, um, among older women drinking um, compounds, normal age-related cognitive decline, it heightens disease risk for things like cancer, gastrointestinal, liver, cardiovascular problems. It worsens depression and anxiety. And um, there's an increased risk of interaction of alcohol and drugs and or medication use. So there's a heightened fall risk and over sedation. What are the NIAAA drinking limits for older women? Uh, we know that high risk drinking for women up to age 65, so this includes our 56 to 65 group, is more than three standard drinks per day um, or more than seven standard drinks in a week. High risk drinking for women over age 65 is more than one standard drink a day or more than seven drinks a week. So only, only one, more than one drink a day is considered high risk drinking for somebody, a woman over 65. This is in stark contrast to um, binge drinking rates reported in 2013, which were 9% of senior women reported binging in the past month. Um, so that's four or more drinks. So that's obviously much higher than the one standard drink per day. Um, and essentially there's nobody sort of following us around with a megaphone as we age saying, hey, hey there, you just turned 56 or 65 and now you need to reduce your drinking by 67% because your risk has just magnified significantly. Um, so that's something that we need to really pay attention to is risk awareness for this age. 
Uh, in terms of treatment access among senior women, we know that only 15% of women in general with alcohol use disorder seek treatment in their lifetime. Women over 50 are even less likely than younger women to seek alcohol use disorder treatment. Older women tend to seek help for mental health, including substance use care in primary care, just like younger women, but more so. Uh, older women are not likely to offer information to healthcare providers about alcohol or drug use unless they're asked and unless they're asked right uh, in a way that sort of helps reduce stigma. And older women, as I said, are probably not aware of increased risk um, of alcohol and drug use at their age. Uh, however, older women are likely to intersect with healthcare providers, older women with substance use disorders in particular, because alcohol and drug use misuse plus being female plus being of older age is uh, related to elevated risk of medical problems. So we are likely to see senior women with substance use problems frequenting not only primary care, but cardiologists, orthopedists, oncologists, um, unfortunately. So this does offer an opportunity, maybe a window um, where we can reach these women via risk awareness and, and screening more than we're doing now. Um, Treatments for alcohol or drug misuse for senior women that are available now, there's not a ton of information on this topic. Um, as far as we know, there are no senior female specific treatments for older women with alcohol use or drug misuse. Uh, we don't know if we actually need senior female specific treatments. It might be enough to um, adapt or personalize existing treatments that are available for women. So basically older women are currently um, able to avail themselves of, this, as this, of the same treatments that are available for all women. Um, there is some limited research showing that existing treatment um, among existing treatments uh, for senior women that brief interventions for alcohol and drug, drug disease in primary care does seem to work. Um, so our team, um, as part of our female specific research development program, um, in 2012, we tested for potential differences in treatment response of senior women in an age stratified sample of 181 women with alcohol use disorder who are receiving our cognitive behavioral therapy treatment protocol. So we're not presenting those data today. We're presenting um, um, a newer study uh, from a more recent parent study of 138 women with alcohol use disorder. The goal of this current, uh, these current data that we're presenting, we wanted to test um, if we were, could replicate and extend the prior 2012 research on uh, senior women in our samples and um, in terms of testing treatment response for older versus younger women. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Dr. Holtzauer to present those data. Okay, thanks Beth. Um, as Dr. Apsi mentioned, I'll be presenting secondary analysis of data from a parent clinical trial on female specific cognitive behavioral therapy for uh, alcohol use disorder. And so this particular trial was testing group versus individual modality of the female specific cognitive behavior therapy or CBT for alcohol use disorder, AUD. Uh, and I'll be presenting data from the senior or older women that were in the study. I do first wanna note that there were 138 women overall in the study and overall regardless of age. These women significantly reduced their alcohol use during treatment and improved in other female specific outcomes, which I'll discuss in just a moment. And uh, I also wanted to note that the main outcomes of the parent study are published and the citation is down at the bottom of the slide. And so what is female specific cognitive behavior therapy uh, for substance misuse? So the treatment protocol comprises 12 weekly sessions and some of the interventions are listed here. On the left, you can see that the treatment in, uh, incorporates some core cognitive behavior interventions, uh, things like including motivational enhancement, providing coping skills for abstinence, so things like identifying triggers, walking through behavior chains, dealing with cravings. And then it also provides some general coping skills, including problem solving and uh, also includes uh, relapse prevention strategies and training. In addition to all those cognitive behavior skills related to alcohol and drugs specifically, there are also a lot of female specific components that are integrated into the treatment. And so these include uh, specific um, coping skills or coping skill components, including providing psychoeducation, 
about alcohol and drug misuse among women. And so again, providing education about a lot of the information that we've been hearing about during this conference. Also identifying female specific triggers. Uh, there are sections on uh, developing and maintaining healthy relationships and sections on communication and assertiveness skills. Also understanding and managing negative emotions and stress. There are also a couple themes that are kind of peppered throughout the treatment and included in various sessions uh, that are female specific. And this includes increasing self-care and self-compassion, increasing personal autonomy and decreasing emotional reactivity. And uh, the treatment manual and patient workbook for anyone whose interests are currently in press. So again, what we uh, what I'll be presenting on today is uh, age stratified analyses for the overall sample of 138 women. Uh, this group was stratified into three age groups listed here. So we have, I'm sorry, and this allowed us to compare baseline characteristics and also treatment response between these three age groups. And so you can see that the youngest group was under 45. The middle age group was 45 to 55. And our quote unquote senior group or older uh, group of, of women was over 55. Uh, the senior women group was 30% of the sample. Their average age was 60 years old with a range of 56 to 75 years old. And so we did wanna note that the sample does not uh, have any women who fall into the oldest old age group that Beth described earlier. So we first wanted to look at uh, baseline alcohol use. So this is their drinking uh, frequency and intensity before they started treatment. And so on the left, we have their frequency of drinking prior to treatment. This is percent drinking days. On the right, we have the intensity of alcohol use. So this is their mean or average drinks per drinking day. So how many drinks were they having on average when they did drink? The, in both graphs, the senior women 56 and over are in red. And so what we can see on the left is that the senior women were drinking more frequently uh, prior to coming into treatment. So they had more days of alcohol use. When we look at intensity, they were drinking fewer drinks on average when they did drink. Uh, however, that six is the, is the average number of drinks per drinking day for the senior women. So six is still, of course, well above the recommended limits for this age group. We then looked at treatment engagement and compliance across the 12 sessions. And so uh, on the left, we have the percent of sessions attended between the three groups. And on the right, we have the percent of assigned homework during treatment that they uh, completed successfully. Again, our senior women 56 and over are in red. And what this uh, slide on the, the graph on the left is showing is that senior women uh, attended significantly more sessions uh, than the youngest group in particular. And the senior women also completed a greater percentage of homework that was assigned during treatment. And so overall, this is suggesting that the senior women had greater treatment engagement and compliance. So we then looked at their drinking and reductions in treatment uh, as they went, as they went uh, through the 12 sessions. So uh, the first two Time points, we have their drinking before they, the frequency of their drinking, so percent days drinking uh, before they came into treatment, and then how they reduced that over the course of 12 uh, sessions. And the last two uh, show how their drinking uh, was uh, maintained in the year after treatment. So just to focus on the within treatment period, those first two time points, again, the senior women 56 and over are in red. And what this is showing is a statistically significant effect whereby the senior women were reducing the frequency of their drinking during treatment more than the youngest women. And then when we look at the second two time points in the year after treatment, uh, women maintain those improvements that they made during treatment regardless of age group. We additionally looked at uh, some other treatment outcomes. These are the outcomes that are female specific, which were directly targeted in treatment. So things like depression, autonomy, interpersonal functioning, anxiety, and on average, the entire sample improved in these additional outcomes during treatment. Uh, and so there were secondary gains here and there were no differences between the age groups. 
So collectively, uh, these results replicate and extend the results uh, from that study that was published in 2012 that Dr. Epstein mentioned earlier that was with 181 women. Uh, and so it, it replicated the findings particularly that I just described with senior women. Uh, and collectively, this research suggests that female-specific cognitive behavior therapy for alcohol use disorder was efficacious for senior women. They were highly engaged, they significantly reduced their drinking during treatment, and they made significant improvements in secondary outcomes, and then they also maintained their drinking and other progress in the year after treatment. So next, I just want to take a few moments to talk about uh, kind of some conclusions and, and next steps based on our uh, on the literature and our own research. And so uh, first, in relation to prevention, uh, in general, women are not aware that alcohol or drug related health risk increase substantially as they age and in, in relation to menopause. We believe that informational can, campaigns to increase risk awareness would be helpful. For, exam uh, for example, encouraging older women to ask questions like, what is risky drinking for women my age? What is a standard drink? What are the harms associated with risky drinking at my age? And is it safe or therapeutic to use marijuana at my age? Uh, and as Dr. Epstein mentioned earlier, we also recommend stepping up widespread screening for alcohol and drug misuse in settings where older women uh, who, I'm sorry, where older women might be seeking treatment for physical health issues that are secondary to drug or alcohol misuse. And then lastly, we wanted to know on this slide that there are elder sensitive screening tools available for substance use uh, that are available. Those are outlined at the bottom. It is important to note that these measures aren't necessarily gender sensitive or tailored to be gender sensitive yet. In terms of existing treatments, there is evidence that brief interventions work well for senior women who are identified as at risk during screening. That said, uh, we do need more work in terms of implementing brief interventions and also enhancing the follow-up after referrals uh, are placed. Evidence-based female-specific cognitive behavior therapy and women's seg segregated treatment does seem to work very well for senior women. However, we recommend additional research to see if uh, female-specific cognitive behavior therapy is also beneficial for older cohorts of senior women, uh, particularly that oldest old age group uh, uh, of, who are 75 and older. And if not, uh, how the treatment might be adapted to address their specific needs. That said, female senior-specific programming may not be necessary as long as the therapy is designed to be able to flexibly account and incorporate personalized content. We'd also like to note that social support networks may be especially lacking for senior women. Uh, establishing widely available evidence-based peer support groups for this population may help to engage them and also to reduce a stigma that is experienced in this population. Uh, treatment access does continue to be a huge problem for women with substance misuse in general, and especially for older women. That said, baby boomers may be more likely to be comfortable with technology than previous generations of older adults. Therefore, while there might be important demographic differences to attend to, this generation may be better positioned to take advantage of telehealth than previous generations of senior women. And using telehealth can help overcome geographic stigma and mobility challenges for senior women who want treatment. And lastly, just a few words about research. Uh, so as Dr. Epstein uh, discussed in the intro a little bit, the age range of older adulthood is a very large span of time covering 30 to 40 plus years. And there's still much to be learned about the course of alcohol and drug abuse and sub cohorts of older women and about the treatment efficacy and treatment needs among these sub cohorts of women. It's also important to make special effort uh, to include older women in clinical trials, including pharmacotherapy and psychotherapy trials. And then of course, we need to attend to and account for age differences in our data analyses of efficacy. In addition, research to address the increasing rates of cannabis use that Dr. Epstein outlined among older women is needed. And lastly, the baby boomer generation is already in late adulthood, as you have heard throughout the conference. So integrating dissemination and implementation research methods into treatment development can really help us to be able uh, can really help us to get the treatments to the senior women who want it as soon as possible. So, thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Holzauer and Dr. Epstein. That was an excellent presentation. As a reminder to people, please put uh, questions in the Q&A box so that they may respond to them at the end. And now I'd like to welcome Dr. Jillian Shear. Can you all see my slides? Yes. Excellent. You, you uh, well, want to go back, though, and um, display settings on the top there and then swap. Okay. Can there you see you my the actual slides now? Perfect. Excellent. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much, everyone. It's really good to see you all today. Um, and i um, happy to be here uh, talking to you all about substance use interventions for sexual and gender minority women. Um, I would first like to uh, thank my colleagues um, and co-authors, Lauren Bocchicchio, I was a postdoctoral research fellow in the Columbia University School of Nursing, uh, and Dr. Tonda Hughes, uh, who's the, the Hendrick Bendixson Professor of Nursing and Psychiatry and the Director of the Center for Sexual and Gender Minority Health Research and the Associate Dean of Global Health and the Columbia um, University Medical uh, Center of Nursing. Just to give you an overview of what I'll be talking about today, I'll first talk a little bit about alcohol-related disparities among sexual and gender minority women. Um, and, you know, in this sample, I'm, I'm really talking about folks who identify as lesbian, bisexual, and queer, also including people who identify as cisgender women, transgender women, gender non-binary folks, people who are gender queer or identify with other gender diverse labels. Um, I'll also highlight few intervention studies that have been conducted with this population. Um, and I will identify several intervention treatment components of existing literature. I'll also talk a little bit about um, sexual and gender minority women specific adaptations that have been, have been made to existing studies, as well as highlight the limitations of current literature and provide some recommendations for future, for future research. Just of an overview uh, of, this, of this literature base, compared to heterosexual women, sexual and gender minority women are at higher risk of negative alcohol and other drug use outcomes, uh, such as alcohol use disorder, um, alcohol use disparities are often attributed to minority stress and trauma exposure. Um, so sexual minority individuals inclusive of sexual and gender minority women face stigma related stressors or minority stress. Uh, these include distal related experiences like discrimination and rejection that's stemming from uh, sexual and gender minority women's marginalized social status. These distal minority stressors can lead to proximal minority stressors or processes such as anticipating rejection or internalizing that stigma as negative beliefs about oneself. Sexual and gender minority women are also more likely to face trauma across the lifespan, um, including childhood sexual abuse, intimate partner violence, and adulthood sexual assault that leads to increased risk of alcohol and other drug use uh, to cope with stress in this population. Alcohol use also plays a central role in the LGBTQ community. Uh, so, for example, one study using population-based sample found that both the perceived availability of drugs and permissive social norms related to drug use were higher among the sexual minorities compared to heterosexuals. And this was also predictive of uh, substance use, including marijuana, um, illicit drug use, and heavy drinking. Sexual and gender minority women also tend to overestimate alcohol use among peers, and they have more favorable alcohol use expectancies compared to heterosexual women. Um, largely driven by socialization in, in bars and other places that have um, high levels of substance use. And um, all of this may elevate alcohol and other drug use risk in this population. Um, sexual identity disparities and alcohol-related outcomes among women are the largest of any sexual orientation-related health disparity. Um, many find no differences. Many studies find no differences between gay and bisexual and heterosexual men. Uh, whereas for lesbian and bisexual women are substantially at higher risk of nearly every alcohol outcome assessed by researchers to date. Um, for example, one national study in the United States uh, found that sexual minority women and gay or bisexual men were uh, 3.81 times and 1.76 times more likely, respectively, to engage in high intensity drinking or more than 12 drinks in a single drinking episode compared to those who identify as heterosexual. And so research on factors that are driving these sexual identity related disparities is critical to informing the development, delivery, uh, and implementation of, of interventions to reduce those disparities. 
I'll highlight several intervention studies that have been conducted to date to give you a sense of, um, of the literature here. Uh, there have been few alcohol and other drug use intervention studies with this population. Um, one that I'll highlight first is um, uh, by Boyle and uh, Labrie uh, from 2020 to um, this uh, paper. Uh, talked about designing an intervention that was in, embedded a culturally tailored digital competition that aimed to address stigma related coping and perceptions of sexual minority women specific drinking norms. The study was uh, the first to find that correcting sexual and gender minority women specific drinking and coping norms through personalized normative feedback effectively reduced drinking among sexual and gender minority women compared to control topics. And results also indicated um, in a subsequent paper that exposure to an interpersonal stigma moderated intervention effectiveness. Uh, so participants who reported recent violence and harassment related to sexual minority status also reported less drinking and consequences among participants uh, related uh, relative to those who reported no experiences. Paul Stewart et al. in 2009 and colleagues tested the efficacy of a behavioral couples therapy plus individual-based uh, treatment compared to individual-based therapy alone for gay and lesbian couples uh, where at least one member of the couple um, met diagnostic criteria for alcohol use disorder. Um, and substance use intervention components of this study included developing recovery contracts with partners, teaching partners to reduce triggers, reducing exposure to alcohol, uh, increasing shared activities, teaching communication strategies, and results indicated here that among lesbian couples, um, those who received behavioral couples therapy reported lower percentage of heavy drinking days after one year follow-up compared to those receiving individual therapy only. And the authors posit that improved uh, relationship functioning may be the key mechanism here driving um, the um, behavioral couple therapy's effectiveness. And Ingraham et al. in 2016 examined the effects of a mindfulness-based intervention compared to peer support among older lesbian bisexual women, and the authors incorporated mindfulness-based stress reduction to address substance use as well as mindful eating. And while alcohol use is not a central focus of this study, um, uh, authors found that average number of alcoholic drinks per week uh, was significantly associated with uh, reduced, was significantly reduced through peer support condition, um, but not in the mindfulness-based condition among older sexual minority women. So this is defined as folks who are 40 and older um, who are also overweight or obese. Um, and, and the authors posited that this could be owing to the higher baseline uh, drinking levels in the standard intervention um, sites here. Um, moving on, there's, uh, there's three additional interventions I'd like to cover today. Uh, Pachankis et al. Um, in 2020 designed um, an intervention called Empowering uh, Queer Identities in Psychotherapy or EQUIP. And in a waitlist controlled trial, um, this sexual minority women adapted treatment that was based on the unified protocol and cognitive behavioral therapy principles demonstrated preliminary efficacy in reducing sexual minority women's depression, anxiety, emotion dysregulation, and rumination compared to waitlist. Um, Equip was designed to really help clients understand their emotion driven behavior, uh, reduce their emotional avoidance, and it provided clients with behavioral skills training and relapse prevention. Uh, Dr. Bertankis found that effects for alcohol use were also marginally significant, uh, with the immediate intervention group outperforming the wait list and minority stress responses or these theorized kind of sexual minority women specific mechanisms of treatment efficacy were not significantly affected by the intervention. So together, these findings combined with prior research suggest that additional treatment targets, such as elevated rates of trauma and alcohol use among sexual and gender minority women, might be needed to enhance existing uh, cognitive behavioral therapy interventions for this population. Um, this next study, the Jack and et al. in 2020 did not consider treatment um, adaptations for sexual and gender minority women. However, this study did find that uh, lesbian, gay, and bisexual and heterosexual participants receiving contingency, contingency management and intensive outpatient treatment uh, did not demonstrate statistically significant differences on key substance use treatment outcomes. These included treatment retention, longest duration of abstinence, and percent of negative screens. And contingency management here um, included financial re reinforcement for these um, treatment outcomes. And despite a lack of st statistical significance, um, lesbian, gay, and bisexual participants 
had lower treatment retention, longer, longest duration of abstinence in weeks, and percentage of negative screens than heterosexual participants receiving this intensive outpatient treatment. And so this certainly warrants future attention. And finally, Gilmore et al. in 22 recently included preliminary testing of an intervention called positive change. And this is a multi-pronged personalized normative feedback intervention targeting alcohol use and sexual assault, uh, both uh, victimization perpetration as well as bystander intervention among cisgender heterosexual men and women, as well as sexual and gender minority men and women. And positive change in included content from an integrated alcohol and sexual assault risk reduction program for women and a web-based ad um, adapted intervention of a brief motivational inter interviewing personalized feedback protocol. And this intervention is really the first to tailor content based on gender identity and sexual orientation for this community. And all participants uh, reported significant pre-post decreases in descriptive drinking norms but did not report significant pre-post differences in injunctive drinking norms or in stages of change. In summary, all six studies reviewed offered different interventions uh, delivered to study participants, including personalized normative feedback, couples therapy, mindfulness-based stress reduction, cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, and contingency management or financial reinforcement, uh, these interventions were delivered primarily on an individual basis, uh, but one study used a couple-based treatment. And despite the range of modalities used, uh, most interventions showed significant differences between intervention and control groups. However, there is a significant lack of published data on the representation of sexual and gender minority women in clinical trials, uh, intervention research for alcohol and other drug use. And this really limits our understanding or the ability to um, make generalizations about the effectiveness of psychosocial treatments targeting alcohol and other drug use in this federally recognized uh, research priority group. I'll briefly highlight some interventions that, um, that specifically adapted their treatments to target sexual and gender minority women unique concerns. Um, and I just wanna note that mental health providers have an ethical responsibility to deliver accessible, culturally relevant and effective mental health services individuals from historically oppressed backgrounds. And this is really a claim that the American Psychological has put forth. And fidelity to core components is largely preserved in cultural adaptation. However, core component addendums, delivery, and contextualization can be substantially changed in adapted interventions. And of the studies reviewed, several made attempts to adapt interventions to address sexual and gender minority women's specific concerns. Um, uh, through either surface level adaptation. So these include increasing compatibility of interventions to participants through observable, observable characteristics to improve the intervention's appeal and face validity, validity for particular populations. So this might look like customizing audiovisual or print materials by changing pictures of people, places, and language to be more aligned with participants' cultural experiences. For sexual and gender minority women, this might look like having openly gay providers or including sexual and gender minority specific images uh, in treatment content and examples. Uh, there are also deep adaptations that incorporate cultural, social, psychological, environmental, and historical information that can help to increase the relevance of intervention material to a, a study part, um, population. And some deep adaptations um, in the studies I reviewed included um, in integrating cultural themes, such as awareness of stereotypes in the LGBTQ community, a desire for increased identity um, visibility when delivering treatment components, providing psychoeducation about minority stress and other adverse experiences affecting sexual minority women, like issues related to sexism, racism, and trauma, helping participants to identify minority stressors in their own lives, and challenging, the, challenging these cognitions that are really driven by minority stress experiences rather than internalizing them. Um, however, given the dearth of literature examining these sexual and gender minority women specific treatment targets, uh, we recognize that this is an important area for future research to consider. And uh, with that, a co um, colleagues and I uh, recently aim to address some of this gap by incorporating voices from content experts, sexual and gender minority women, and their clinical providers um, by uh, uncovering guidance for enhancing cognitive and behavioral therapy interventions for sexual and gender minority women who are at disproportionate risk of mood, anxiety, and alcohol use disorders, and who have high rates of treatment seeking, however, are dissatisfied with treatment. 
Um, and building on prior literature, uh, the study's findings revealed seven broad considerations for delivering cognitive behavioral therapy-based treatment to sexual and gender minority women who report mental and behavioral health issues, including depression, anxiety, and alcohol use disorders. And these themes include attending to sexual and gender minority women's diverse gender identities and expressions. And, then, and so this could look like implementing cognitive restructuring techniques that could help sexual and gender minority women locate sources of these negative internalized thoughts, particularly related to their gender identity and expression, as well as their sexual identity and orientation uh, within their adverse environments, rather than attributing these thoughts to personal failures. Um, focusing on non-binary stressors, again, that are related to um, this, this community's diverse sexual and gender identities, um, formulating sexual and gender um, minority women's um, stressors within a feminist framework. And so um, participants really noted the need to promote this community's agency and resilience in response to sexism um, and described um, uh, patriar you know, deconstructing kind of more patriarchal systems as important treatment targets. Applying an intersectionality framework when working with this community, particularly those who hold multiple marginalized identities across race, income, um, and other identities. Um, we know that experiences of heterosexism are inextricably tied to experiences of intersectional stressors. And so uh, um, considerations like assertiveness training might help this population to engage in potentially shared decision-making around their treatment goals and to communicate their wants and needs in, in a values-driven manner. It's important to incorporate issues of diversity, multiculturalism, and social justice across individual, interpersonal, and structural levels, um, and addressing the role of trauma in sexual and gender minority women's mental health. Um, this could look like providing exposure therapy to this population uh, to help them better tolerate emotional distress outcomes related to um, either perceived or actual threatening encounters. And finally, addressing the role of alcohol in sexual and gender minority women's lives. Um, you know, providers noted that efforts should also address the function of alcohol use in this community and, and motivational interviewing techniques uh, could enhance sexual minority women and gender minority women's motivation to recognize potentially problematic alcohol use. Um, I also wanted to note uh, several limitations of existing research here including that there are, are still significant knowledge gaps remaining regarding evidence-based practices for addressing sexual and gender minority women's substance use concerns. Um, a, a recent scoping review of 71 inter substance use interventions among women um, particularly noted the lack of, inter of tailored interventions for this population. Um, despite some of this early work that I demonstrated earlier that, um, that using some of these sexual and gender minority adapted um, techniques could, could ultimately improve mental and behavioral health in this population. Um, of the existing uh, interventions, uh, many are limited in terms of their follow-up assessments. And so um, in terms of thinking about the long-term long kind of durational um, effect of some of these interventions remain unknown for this community. Um, sexual and gender minority specific, as well as universal mechanisms of action, like emotion dysregulation, distress tolerance, um, across existing treatments also remains unknown in this population. Um, and finally, there's a limited understanding of how structural factors such as anti-gay structural stigma um, influence substance use treatment efficacy um, among sexual and gender minority women. Several directions for future research that could help address these gaps include testing the efficacy of universal substance use interventions for sexual and gender minority women, um, so future research might compare sexual and gender minority specific substance use treatment to non-adapted treatment and examine efficacy there, as well as test whether surface level or deep level um, adaptations have a greater impact on sexual and gender minority women's um, health. And then second, developing, implementing, and evaluating new interventions that are tailored for sexual and gender minority women. So. Um, studies really need, again, to determine sexual and gender minority women's specific and universal uh, mechanisms of, of action here in treatments, as well as identifying treatment delivery locations and modalities, such as online telehealth versus in-person delivered treatments, um, using text message-based treatments versus other forms of interventions like expressive writing to, facil to facilitate implementation and uptake as well as design interventions that are really targeting sexual and gender minority women's transdiagnostic health issues 
that have multiple treatment components, either simultaneously or sequentially. Um, for example, PTSD, substance use disorders that are commonly co-occurring in this population, as well as testing the efficacy of these treatments based on order of skills that are presented and the time that is spent on each model. Some of these more granular intervention related um, um, factors have not been studied among sexual and gender minority women. Um, Dr. Tonda Hughes and Dr. John Pachankis were recently awarded an R1 from NIAAA to address some of these gaps in the literature by testing one of the first large scale trials of an intervention for sexual minority women's hazardous drinking and co-occurring mental health, particularly depression and anxiety. Um, I'll just briefly describe this, um, this, uh, this intervention. Uh, the first aim, aim is to, in a two-arm um, randomized control trial, oh, we're running out of time here. <laughs> yes, well, I'll leave you with that. Uh, we have links to, uh, to this study as well, um, but broadly, this, this is looking to expand upon the pilot study I reviewed uh, with equip among a larger sample of sexual minority women in New York State, as well as develop uh, implementation aims as well. So thank you. Thank you very much, yeah, Dr. Shear, for that thoughtful presentation. And if sure. you, the audience has uh, questions, please put them in the Q&A box so we she can answer them at, at the end. Um, our next presentation is uh, Dr. Gitanjali Chander. I just want to confirm that you are seeing the slides. Yes. Okay, great. Do you want Thanks. to put them in the you presentation want, mode? Yeah, presentation mode, yeah. Click up oh. on the top there from beginning. There you go. Did it work? Give it a second. Resume slideshow. From beginning. Resume slideshow. Oh. No? No. What are you seeing? You're seeing this? I'm seeing your PowerPoint file, yes. Okay, let's, uh, I have three screens. I bet this is, how about now? Mm, not yet. You may want to stop sharing and then share the one with the file on it. Okay. No problem. I'm sorry. You're fine. Don't be, no, never be sorry. Okay, so I stopped sharing. Okay, then go to share screen again. All right, and, and maybe select I'll... the screen that maybe have your full screen on it. How about this? Let's try this. Click that and share. And then um, go up to display settings and say swap in the top corner there. There you go. Click it and swap. Perfect. Excellent. I'm I'm sorry for the delay. Um Thank you for having me here today to talk about alcohol use among women with and at risk uh, for HIV. I'd first like to start uh, with some context. As we seek to end the HIV epidemic, um, it's really imperative that we focus on both HIV prevention and treatment. Um, HIV prevention includes things such as HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, uh, effective use of condoms, HIV post-exposure prophylaxis, and HIV treatment is prevention, specifically meaning that for people with HIV, taking medications and maintaining a viral load below the limit of detection um, reduces uh, HIV transmission risk. And this is really what's behind the, the undetectable equals untransmissible um, message that if an individual has an undetectable viral load, they won't transmit uh, HIV to their partners. So HIV prevention really includes all of this. Um, what's critical here is that in some ways this, this may be sound simple, um, but really to eliminate uh, new HIV infections, um, it's very important to remember that context matters. And part of that context is alcohol use. So just considering HIV um, among women and, and just giving you the broader context of this, it is prevalent among cisgender women in the United States. And though incident cases are declining, 19% of new HIV diagnoses in 2019 were among women, with heterosexual contact really being the predominant mode of transmission. 
So it's important to think about alcohol use in the context of sexual risk behaviors when we think about um, HIV prevention. What's also important to note, however, this is another slide from the CDC, is that there are challenges that place some women at higher risk for HIV. And we've, we've heard about many of these during this, conf this conference. So such things such as the risk of exposure, uh, partner violence, being unaware of a partner's risk factors, having a partner who uses drugs, um, and then also um, issues related to stigma, to seek treatment, racism, discrimination. Um, all of these intersect with unhealthy alcohol use um, and can result in an increased risk of acquiring HIV and actually having poor HIV treatment outcomes. So I'm going to briefly discuss the role of alcohol use in HIV transmission risk behaviors. There are increasing data that alcohol use is related to HIV acquisition um, among the major risk groups, um, including injection drug use and heterosexual transmission. So these data are from the ALIVE cohort. It's actually an older study. This is a cohort of individuals um, who have a history of injection drug use. In this study, uh, it was a prospective study of 1,500 individuals, 28% of whom were women. There were high levels of alcohol consumption. And what they found actually was that um, as alcohol use increased, there was actually an increased hazard of um, a, uh, HIV acquisition. There have also been um, studies, laboratory studies, where they've looked to really try and identify if there's a causal association between alcohol use and HIV transmission risk. And here are two different meta-analyses that were published. The top um, included 12 studies where they really looked at was was alcohol use associated with an increased intention to engage in condomless sex? And in both actually meta-analyses, they did find that um, alcohol use was an independent risk factor for this intention. Um, and that intentions have actually been shown to be linked to uh, behavior. So this is important. And especially as we sort of think about, you know, alcohol in sexual contexts, and this is actually a quote from a qualitative work done by Carrie and colleagues uh, that where they interviewed uh, women uh, from an STI clinic. And the person said, I've done a lot of different drugs and alcohol by far is the most risky. I think alcohol is the perfect balance of lowering your inhibitions, making you feel confident and negating future consequences. So here are data from the Baltimore City Health Department. This is a study actually done by our moderator, Dr. Hutton. Um, this was among 671 individuals attending an STI clinic who were tested for gonorrhea and underwent an ACASI querying for substance use and sexual risk behavior. 30% of this women reported heavy, heavy episodic drinking compared to 42% of men. But what's very interesting here is that women with heavy episodic drinking engaged in anal sex at twice the rate of women without heavy episodic drinking and three times the rate of women who abstained. Gonorrhea was five times higher among women with heavy episodic drinking, really tying, uh, tying this to um, a biomarker. This, you know, given the high risk then in this sample for HIV acquisition among women attending an STI clinic, we actually um, tested an intervention in the STI clinics with the goal of reducing HIV risk. I'm actually not going to go into the study itself, but rather discuss some of the data, um, baseline data. What we found here uh, among women who were eligible for this study, there were 439 women. Um, they were eligible if they drank at risky levels per NIAAA definitions. And what we were really struck by in this sample of women from whom we recruited from the STI clinic was the high prevalence of comorbid illicit drug use, panic symptoms, trauma symptoms. 37% of women had trauma symptoms. Two thirds used other substances. Um, and perhaps even more strike, most striking was that two thirds of the women actually met 
criteria for an alcohol use disorder by um, DSM-4 criteria. So this was really striking because we were looking at this intersection of alcohol use and HIV risk and sort of realized as we you know, went back and looked at the data that there was an incredible amount of comorbidity. And so that when we think about HIV risk and alcohol's relationship with that, looking at alcohol alone may not be um, the best way to sort of approach this in certain settings. We dove deeper into these data really to get a sense of um, really what was the association with this um, high uh, prevalence of alcohol use disorder. And not surprisingly, cocaine use and heroin use uh, were both more, more present among individuals with alcohol use disorder. And if you look at the graph on the right of the slide, what you see is that the blue bars are women with an alcohol use disorder. And what you see is that, in fact, having, having an alcohol, individuals with an alcohol use disorder were also much more likely to use two or more substances in addition to um, alcohol use. We're also very interested then in starting to look at um, mental health comorbidities. And what we found, again, I think this won't surprise you, um, was that women with an alcohol use disorder were more likely to have PTSD symptoms, depressive symptoms, generalized anxiety symptoms. And actually then when we looked at cumulative mental health disorders, were much more likely to have two or three co-occurring. We then also wanted to look at this and kind of get a sense then of, so we have women in this sample with depressive symptoms, substance use, and many of whom have experienced violence. And is that related to condomless sex under the influence of alcohol use? This was a study done by uh, one of our students. And what we found was that really drug use alone among individuals, all of these women had unhealthy alcohol use by NIAAA um, definitions, um, was associated with twice the odds, uh, twice the prevalence, I'm sorry, of condomless sex under the influence of alcohol use, um, <clears throat> drug use plus a history of IPV, uh, which is 2.6 um, times the prevalence. So we did see, while, while we didn't see an interaction per se, we did see an increase in prevalence um, among these. So to really think about this, I think when we think about alcohol use and HIV risk, I think I really emphasize the importance of thinking about other comorbidities that likely may also be a part of the overall equation Let's switch now to the HIV care continuum, because as I noted at the beginning of the talk, HIV treatment as prevention is really critical to ending the HIV epidemic. And the care continuum really talks about sort of what are the steps an individual needs to take to achieve viral suppression. So this next slide is also data from the CDC. And um, what it actually shows is that um, so for, for women with HIV, 87%, I'm sorry, 90% know their HIV status. So 10% don't. Um, 76 of those received some HIV care out of 100. 58 were retained in care and 64% were virologically suppressed. So this is really important because what it's really kind of demonstrating to us is that we're still, people are still falling off that continuum of care and not optimally achieve, achieving viral suppression. So these are actually data from a VA sample where they had um, 971 women um, receiving care in the VA. And what I wanna point out on this slide really is that um, if you look at women prescribed antiretroviral therapy, it's the third set of bars over. Women with the highest level of alcohol use, audit C of eight to 12, had a very low prescription of antiretroviral therapy. And actually, if you look at the uh, next bar over or two bars over, 13.6% were virologically suppressed. 
So there is a barrier to care here um, that, that um, really needs to be explored. Moving beyond that cohort um, uh, to a study in the Women's Interagency HIV study, they looked at trajectories of alcohol use over time. 38% um, of women had no alcohol use, 7% had heavy alcohol use. What they really found was that out of 1,123 women, suboptimal adherence was associated with 1.25 times the higher odds for heavy drinking, and unsuppressed viral load was associated with nearly 1.8 times higher odds for he heavy drinking. And finally, I'll just show you some unpublished data from the Johns Hopkins HIV uh, clinical cohort, where we looked at uh, 744 uh, computer-assisted interviews of 600 women with HIV, 36% reported current drinking, and of these, 43% met criteria for unhealthy alcohol use on the Audit C. What you can see here is that, um, again, this Audit C score, um, just going over recommended limits, was associated with decreased antiretroviral therapy use and adherence what was, in, what was also very striking to us is that women who drank were twice as likely to report depressive symptoms and trauma symptoms compared to those who did not drink. And finally, sort of rounding out the HIV care continuum, thinking about HIV transmission risk, this is actually a, a study conducted by Dr. Hutton where um, she looked at the association between quantity and frequency of alcohol use and subsequent sexual risk behaviors across a large US-based cohort. And I'm just going to actually uh, jump to the punchline, which was that what they found was that <clears throat> women who had, quote, unsafe sex, which was defined as sex with a person of an unknown or negative HIV sero, sero status who had a de detectable viral load, um, and uh, inconsistent condom use. Among those, hazardous drinking or unhealthy alcohol use um, was, in, it was <clears throat> associated with two times um, the odds of, of, of having greater than or two vaginal sex partners, uh, five times of having sex under the influence of drugs and alcohol, and also twice, two times um, having uh, um, unsafe or vaginal sex. So um, mindful of time and the three minutes I used up trying to get my slides together, I'm going to run through the next uh, slides fairly quickly. But I think you know what we've demonstrated is that among women, unhealthy alcohol use is associated with increased HIV transmission risk behaviors lower use of medical, and among women with HIV, lower use of medical treatments, lower adherence, HIV transmission risk behaviors. And as such, really implementation of evidence-based alcohol treatment strategies is critically needed and treatment strategies that actually also account for the multiple comorbidities that women experience. So when we think about um, evidence-based treatments, one of which is PrEP for women, and there are barriers to PrEP, and I'm just going to read one quote. One of them is actually just lack of information. Um, so one woman wrote, honestly, I'm not sure about women, but it looked like everything that I was seeing was more geared towards men. So I feel like, you know, in, in this commercial, I thought this, you know, this, this is really targeting gay men. And another woman said it was quickly mentioned in one of our substance use treatment groups, and we were talking about HIV, and I was shocked that they had it. And I think we see this, you know, um, frequently that there still remains low penetration of PrEP knowledge. Among women with HIV, um, we've done a study that demonstrated that, um, <clears throat> that a brief intervention could reduce um, drinking days, and I throw this up here just mostly to show that, that there are interventions that um, can be effective. Um, this was in the context of a clinical trial. And just to remind you again that context matters, bringing you to the two bottom quotes, stress. One woman said stress and aggravation, what you go through in your job and with your children, 
can lead to a lot of frustration and stress. This is a woman who was talking about uh, why, why she drinks. Another woman said, talked about trauma. Yes, it really did. It made me drink more. It made me drink more to forget and not think about it, to block it out of my memory. But I, but talking about it now, it's just as fresh as it was yesterday. That's the weird thing about memories. They come back just as clear. And so I think it's not surprising that, um, you know, when we ask women about what solutions, what are good solutions, they talk about the need for mental health treatment and then the use of peers. We've heard about that throughout this conference. Um, one woman said, one woman said, women like me that want to do that, that have little experience, they need to be someone that's dealt with it themselves. And the last quote at the bottom, that's the kind of people you need to get because nobody can walk in your shoes but me right now, because if you don't know what I've been through, you can't help me. You know what I'm saying? So really what we found is that unhealthy alcohol use occurs in the context of comorbidities and other determinants. There's really a need for integrated interventions that address alcohol use in the context of mental health and substance use comorbidity and reproductive health. Failing that goal, it's very important to increase coordination of care between agencies that provide siloed services, and we need to increase public awareness of treatment resources and programs tailored to women that address many things, including increased stigma for HIV and alcohol use are really critical. And I'm just going to end um, bringing this back to what was talked about earlier with just a picture um, of Baltimore City and a program that, that we have started called Sharp Women, which again, uses community-based participatory research to really try and um, partner with our community to find solutions for women with and at risk for HIV. Thank you, and I'll end here. Thank you, Dr. Chander, for that excellent presentation. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Faye Taxman. And again, any questions for Dr. Chander, please put them in the Q&A box for her at the end of the presentation. Um, well, good afternoon um, to everyone. And thank you for the invitation to present today. Um, so I want to start out my presentation um, by making everyone sort of aware of some uh, change in language that is currently being used to really focus our attention on um, people who are involved in the criminal legal system. So the term justice, which has been what most people have talked about for, you know, uh, the last 40 years, people are starting to actually reference the legal system much more in terms of, you know, that this is a legal procedure and not necessarily a justice procedure because of all of the different issues that are related to providing justice um, or the lack of justice in our current system. Um, and I think, you know, Dr. Jordan this morning highlighted that with the concerns about, you know, killing of black people. Um, and there's a number of other documentation about the injustices that incur at the hands of our current legal system. So I wanted to just alert that because we're also trying to destigmatize the population um, and in some way is just acknowledging their status within the criminal legal system. So my talk today is going to be a compilation of a number of different projects that I've been um, pleased to be involved with over the last um, decade. Uh, and I'm going to feature one study that's currently funded by the National Institute of Mental Health that Dr. Kate Elkington and Gail Wasserman, Dr. Gail Wasserman uh, lead. I'm a co-PI on that study called eConnect. Um, and I'll describe that study in a bit more detail, but it's highly relevant to the, the issue at hand, which is, you know, how can we turn our criminal legal system into being a service provider for people who interact? And I'll explain why that's really critically important. Um, so I'm gonna first go through my talk about basically giving you some information 
about the unmet needs of women and girls in the criminal legal system. Then I'm gonna talk about you know, the importance of referral because the criminal legal system where you have a large concentration of people with substance use, alcohol abuse, HIV, other infectious diseases, um, you know, is a catchment for. And so we really want to be able to address some of the health disparities among the populations. And then I'm going to really um, spend time talking about a new intervention called clinical pathways, which is an updated version of the screening brief intervention referral approach with an emphasis really on you know, access to and involvement in treatment. Okay, so in case you don't know, <laughs> you know, we have about 8 million people in the United States, men and women, who are involved in the criminal legal system currently. About 22% of the women who are in the community who are on, prob are on probation, Probation is a legal status where people are in the community. About 8% of the women are in prison or in local jails, slightly a little bit less, and about 25% are also in parole. So when we talk about women in the criminal legal system, we're actually talking about women both incarcerated, but also amongst our you know, people involved in the community. And why that's important is because, you know, in many ways, it's in the community where it, there is no constitutional right to provide care for individuals as there is when people are incarcerated. Um, so one of the things that's happened is that we've had an increase in um, women's incarceration. And there's a slim, similar slide. I'm not going to present it about increase in women who are on probation and parole. But you can see here, there's, you know, essentially since 1980, <clears throat> when we started our mass incarceration emphasis in the United States, you know, we've had a 700% increase in women who are incarcerated. And, you know, more troubling, not only in terms of who's in state prisons, which are longer periods of time, but the number of women who cycle in and out of jails within our communities, because that cycling pattern with uh, in and out of jails is actually very disruptive to people who are involved in any type of health care, including substance use treatment care, HIV care. And so, you know, that's a great concern to us. Um, I also wanted to point out that, you know, of course, the U.S. is known as the capital for incarceration. And this actually, uh, you know, is true for women that we have a higher per, um, per capita incarceration rate than many other Western nations, even the USSR, which isn't a Western nation, of course. Um, and China. Um, and so, you know, it's a great concern that we use incarceration frequently. We also have lifetime consequences that women, um, particularly women of color, are involved in the criminal legal system. Um, so about one in every 56 women in the U.S. are involved in the, uh, you know, have experienced incarceration that equals out to about one in uh, 111 white women, one in 18 black women, and one in 45 uh, Latina women. Uh, so, you know, this health disparities is a great concern. I want to turn my attention to girls um, because girls are also adversely affected by how the criminal legal system operates. So we have about 1.5 million youth each year that are involved in the criminal legal system. The majority of those individuals are actually in the community. We have about 80,000 youth that are in some sort of locked up facility. But in the community, 25% of the youth in the juvenile justice system are girls. And as you can see here, 
you know, it's, it starts very young under you know, around 13 years old. Um, and then we sort of have an equal representation of different age groups, 14 years old, 15, 16, and 17 years old. In most states, 18 years old is when individuals um, are transferred to the adult system. You can also see that, you know, there are 35% of the girls are black um, and 17% are Hispanic. Um, and, you know, what's interesting here is about a third of the girls are, in, you know, involved in the criminal legal system for a person crime. So person crimes are usually issues related to um, some sort of violation of a person's uh, offenses. So, you know, things like hitting people, assaults, um, you know, some of the more serious crimes like sex offenses, about a third are involved in property crimes. Um, and the thing we know most about property crimes is people, both men and women, girls and boys who are involved in property crimes are much more likely to become, to recidivate and recycle through the system. But more troubling is that 26% of the girls are involved in what's called public uh, order crimes. And public order crimes are low level misdemeanor, drinking in public, sleeping in the parks, some of the shoplifting charges, low level shoplifting. Um, so, you know, the, the type of offense that girls are involved in or arrested for um, is a signifier of different needs of the uh, girls, and we'll discuss that in a few seconds. More importantly, the question becomes, you know, and this is of interest here for this particular talk, is what about access to care? Because we know that girls who are involved in the criminal legal system have higher rates of substance use disorders, mental illness, suicide related behaviors, um, alcohol abuse. Um, and the question is, is, you know, can these youth become get access to care? Well, when you look at the different outcomes from the criminal legal system here, you'll see that, you know, of the arrests that actually occur, we end up with about, uh, there's a category called informal sanctions. And what informal sanctions are is really a diversion out of the criminal legal system or juvenile legal system. Um, and uh, unfortunately, in most of those diversion efforts, uh, you don't see people getting access to treatment services, either for substance use um, or mental health services. Uh, usually they're community service or some sort of low level punishment uh, that the youth encounter. So what's troubling here is that because we have an increased rate of using informal sanctions for girls, we actually have an in, uh, a reduced likelihood that girls will be referred to services. So just to remind you, you know, that the people who are involved in the criminal legal system are more likely to have substance use disorders, mental health disorders, and co-occurring disorders than the general public. This is true for women um, as well as men, um, but women are exasperated because they have more mental health issues and greater um, substance use disorders. But we also have a number of infectious disease uh, concerns for people who are involved in the criminal legal system. So, you know, if you're involved in the criminal legal system, there's an increased rate of tuberculosis, STIs, hepatitis C, and HIV, AIDS um, than the general population overall. Um, and then, as you can see on the left hand corner with the bar graph here, um, we find that women in the criminal legal system are more likely to use multiple drugs, have alcohol abuse problems, cocaine problems, um, but you can also see higher rates of mental health issues, including depression and anxiety. 
And you can also see here that, you know, there's a greater need for substance use treatment and mental health treatment among the women um, that are involved in the criminal legal system compared to the general population. Uh, also, just to point out, um, you know, of course, these women also have greater needs for physical health care, um, including dental health care and reproductive health care. And the criminal legal system, as I mentioned in the beginning, if you were incarcerated and, you know, you have a constitutional right to receive a minimum level of care, um, most jails will not exercise that right unless someone is ill upon entrance to a jail. And they usually wait three days um, because there's such a high turnover in most jails before they provide, uh, begin to provide medical care. Um, but when people are in community corrections like probation and parole, uh, women or men, um, you know, there is no guaranteed right to any services. And so the access to services has much more to do with the relationships that the community corrections agencies have with treatment providers um, of various types, whether it be medical care or not. Um, so um, also just to kind of drive home this point, youth involved in the juvenile justice system have higher rates of um, different types of meta, uh, you know, substance use needs. One in eight youth in the juvenile justice system actually has a behavioral health disorder. And, um, you know, uh, and more importantly, you can see here looking at the cascade of care, care that kids that are on probation have lower rates of access to treatment services, less likely to initiate treatment services, and less likely to continue in treatment services. So the challenge we have is to really begin to address some of the risk factors that women present and girls present. Um, typically, the criminal legal system address, tries to address the risk factors that are in this blue box here about criminal history, antisocial attitudes, antisocial friends, some substance use issues, and employment and financial issues. Those are considered the criminogenic needs um, that the system responds to. But what we find among girls and women in the criminal legal system is we actually find that there is a higher prevalence of depression and anxiety, unhealthy relationships, psychosis, and anger um, that are drivers of criminal involvement, as well as you know, his, history factors of child abuse and any type of adult abuse, domestic violence, um, sexual abuse. And then the um, individuals also tend to have more housing um, safety issues, as well as stress issues. And so those have been noted as risk factors. Um, and these are risk factors, to be perfectly honest, that the criminal legal system does not identify with um, and really has, uh, you know, has not really paid as much attention as we would hope um, if we really want to holistically address the factors that bring women and girls into the criminal legal system. So I wanna focus our attention now on the question about the criminal legal system as part of a service delivery system with high rates of unmet needs, um, high rates of behavioral health and physical um, health needs of women and girls. One of the most important aspects has to do with you know, if the criminal legal system can screen people, can we actually get people into different types of services, referral care to care, initiation into services? Um, and so I'm going to turn my attention to that for the rest of the talk in the next five minutes. So we actually know that about 10% of the youth and women are able to access some sort of care for substance use treatment services. It's actually less for 
various types of mental health services. In one large trial that the National Institute on Drug Abuse um, conducted, um, and in a paper that uh, Gail Wasserman led, uh, looking at different ways about trying to actually bring youth into the criminal legal system. We found that when we screened, 70% of the youth were screened for substance use and alcohol use problems, um, but less than half actually needed some sort of uh, you know, treatment. We also found that the type of charge alcohol and drug charge increased referral rates. But we found that only 20% of those 70% of the um, youth were referred to treatment and that there were a lot of barriers in terms of how the criminal legal system interacts with the public health system that influenced whether or not youth got um, and women got access, uh, to, youth got access to care. Um, when there was a referral, though, there were higher rates of treatment initiation, and that's, you know, therefore the emphasis on thinking about the referral process from the criminal legal system to treatment providers is critically important. We also found that, you know, the criminal legal system by default tends to really focus on legal factors and what the judge mandates for a particular youth. Um, instead of really customizing to screening for the needs of the youth and adults. Um, and therefore there's a gap in the type of services that people receive. So, you know, we essentially have three areas that can really affect improving referrals. One area is to use standardized uh, instruments and case management approaches. Another is to focus on increasing the clinical skills of treatment providers um, and also uh, criminal justice, at, criminal legal system actors like probation and parole officers. Um, and the third is to really focus in on clinical pathways, which is really takes information from the standardized instruments in case management and moves it into an actual decision about the level and type of care that a, a youth or adult needs. Um, so there's been a number of evidence-based screening and assessment tools. There's even one gender specific tool called the Women's Risk Need Assessment Tool, Emily Salisbury at the University of Art, um, uh, Utah um, has a center for dissemination of this tool. Um, and the whole focus of these sort of standardized instruments is to really make sure that the youth and women are provided services that match their needs. These are usually administered by criminal justice actors. And so the goal here is to increase the rate and use of these particular tools so that we can actually develop, develop better treatment and case plans for the youth overall. Um, we have found that some innovations in a study that myself and Scott Walters did from the University of North Texas. <clears throat> we found that you can develop web-based services for you, um, clients that will be able to actually, you know, increase access to clinical services. And we have basically found that SBIRT overall, which is the screening and brief intervention, does not usually result in improvement in care. Um, so the concept of a clinical pathways is to really into, uh, you crosswalk different need factors and what is the appropriate level of care. And so Kate Elkington, sorry, I'm just going to run through this quickly because I think it's really important and then I'll close out, you know, developed um, a, a tool in which suicide risk behaviors could be mapped onto who needs immediate care who need, is not eminently at risk for suicide and who's not in a uh, crisis situation. The results from this particular trial are in a paper that's currently under review, um, but essentially we found by using this clinical pathway, we can almost triple the amount of kids that were identified as in need for care, um, suicide prevention care. Um, and we actually made um, dramatic increase in the kids most at risk 
being referred to treatment. Um, what eConnect actually did, which is quite important, is it increased the, the cascade of care in ways in which we would have hoped for, which is increasing um, you know, referrals to treatment um, by you know, um, a odds ratio of 3.18, and in, increasing referral uh, engagement in initiation into treatment by 21.54 odds ratio. Um, it also had a significant impact on the ability for minority girls um, to increase the, you know, the referral to treatment. Um, and that, that has, uh, you know, has basically resulted in more referrals that have occurred as a result of this particular pathway, particularly for, um, for you know, uh, those kids who are most at risk. Um, so uh, there's an, I'm gonna skip through some things because I know I'm over time. I apologize, Dr. Hutton. Um, so essentially there are ways in which we can link the criminal legal system to actually screening and referrals. The clinical pathways approach provides a direct proactive placement mechanism. It's something that also can be automated. There's a paper that Dr. Wasserman and others, including myself, have basically produced that shows how to develop the clinical pathways. And it really helps when you have non-clinical staff like probation officers who basically have you know have the opportunity to really help access care for people with highest need. So with that, I want to thank everyone. I'm sorry I ran over a little bit, um, but thank you. thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Taxman, for that very interesting presentation. In the um, and I want to thank all of our panelists and all of the audience for attending today. There's uh, there's a lot of work to be done and a lot of great work going on. I have. Uh, for people in the audience who'd like to submit questions, please put that in the Q&A. I see that we have uh, one question now, uh, which is in a, a couple others coming in. This is a question from our audience, uh, from Colleen McGuire, who said, can you talk about women and men who have had gastric bypass surgery, develop substance use disorder as a result, and how that might affect the rising numbers of SUD in, in seniors? Um. I, I think that's an interesting question. I've sort of noticed in my own practice with older women with SUD, I sort of noticed a high, seems like what is a higher incidence of bariatric surgery in that population. However, I don't, well, I actually did just do a quick search on the rate of uh, bariatric surgery, and um, um, it turns out to be about two, 200,000 uh, 200, bariatric surgeries for women and 2,000. Uh, 19. And so if we look at that compared to the 53 million older women um, in the U.S. now, it's only about 0.38% of women. So I, I think it probably isn't a big enough crowd to really impact the rates of SUD in older women, but I think it's an interesting clinical um, issue to discuss. And I, I really don't know what the causal relationship is between bariatric surgery and AUD. I don't know if there's a risk of, of pre-existing alcohol use disorder in the sample, um, or I know that probably uh, limits first pass metabolism of alcohol if you have bariatric surgery, I guess. So you might get more intoxicated when you drink the same amounts and thus develop a problem. I don't, I don't know. Thoughts from any of the other panelists? If not, we'll go to the next question. Okay. The next question comes from Stephanie Pyle. What evidence-based substance use uh, misuse prevention strategies have been identified for older women. I guess that's me again. Um, um, that's to you, Dr. Um, <laughs> screening is considered a primary prevention approach. Um, so we know that there is some screening going on in probably primary care and, and gynecology, I would guess. Um, but I think referral these days is probably still limited to go to AA if people are screen positive. And um, I don't think screening is widely implemented. I don't think there's a lot of actual brief intervention for people who screen positive, which would be considered a secondary prevention. 
um, approach, and there's lack, probably lack, there is lack of follow up. Um, so I don't think there is much prevention um, going on. But for me, it links to this notion of successful aging that's in the lifespan development literature, and successful aging has predictors, primarily health and financial um, security. And I think for women, we would probably want to add relationships in there. And the idea is that successful aging has to start way beyond, way before you actually get to the old age, the late adulthood period in terms of healthy habits and um, uh, protecting your health. And, and usually, you know, obviously that means like not smoking and not misusing alcohol or drugs. Primarily, I think those are huge, obviously, because they throw a wrench in successful aging for everybody. So I think, I think they're just needs to be a lot more um, prevention efforts in this area, especially now that the baby boomers are like swarming towards older adulthood. And, um, you know, it's not too late. It's never too late, I think, to start um, preparing or maximizing the probability of successful aging. Uh, but people need to know what risks there they have and what they can do about it. Okay, thank you. Uh we have time, I think, for one more question. I'm going to uh, shoot this one over to Dr. Shear. We've talked a lot about lifespan uh, factors today. And um, what would you say are the uh, particularly vulnerable subgroups of sexual and gender minority women who are concern you the most and are in need of substance use interventions? Yeah, really, really excellent question. Um, you know, certainly aging sexual and gender minority women as well. There's been very limited research in that area, but we know that substance use trends tend to decline slower among that group compared to others. So I think that's another um, important research area. Based on mine and others' work too, with sexual and gender minority folks of color, low income people, gender um, people who have, you know, uh, are within kind of the non-binary spectrum among sexual minority women. Uh, by plus or you know uh, plurisexual sexual gender minority women, um, these folks tend to experience disproportionate and often compounding experiences of societal stress and stigma, um, and report uh, exacerbating um, alcohol and drug use risk as well. Um, and so I think those are some of the the many uh, some groups that are starting to uh, gain more more attention of being particularly at risk. Also, those who are you know, living in rural areas or who have um, limited access to affirmative treatment as well. Okay, thank you. In the interest of staying on, on schedule, I'm going to wind this up and say again, thank you to our panelists. We're gonna take a short break and reconvene at one for the panel co-occurring substance use and mental health disorders. Thank you everyone. It was just really interesting. I, I was happy to be the moderator of this panel. Thank you. Afternoon. Uh, I'm Bob Freeman from the uh, Division of Epi and Prevention, NIAAA. And I'm going to be moderating the panel Co occurring substance use and mental disorders. I'm pleased to introduce our panelists Dr. Tracy Simpson, Dr. Shelley Greenfield, and Dr. Sherry McKee. Uh, following the presentations, we'll have a 15 minute QA with our panelists. Now let's please welcome our first presenter, Dr. Tracy Simpson. Thank you, Robert. And do I have control over the slides? I do not see your name to give you control. Hmm. No. I'm going to have to move them for you. Sorry. Okay. That's fine. Um, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's still morning here in Seattle, but good afternoon to um, probably most of you. Um, uh, the title of my talk today is Women, Substance Use Disorders, Mental Health Comorbid Comorbidities, and Treatment Receipt Patterns and Overview. Uh, next slide, please. 
And I have no conflicts of interest to declare and the opinions that I'm going to share in this presentation are my own and not necessarily those of either the VA or the University of Washington. Next slide. Um, just a second. Okay, so why are we concerned with comorbidities? Um, so basically more equals more. Um, sometimes um, less equals more and more equals less, but here more equals more. And compared with people with only one disorder, those with more than one mental health disorder, including uh, a co-occurring substance use disorder, are likely to have more symptoms, obviously, uh, more distress, more functional impairments, and uh, greater challenges in recovery. Next slide. And I, I think it's important to remind us that comorbidities can go both ways. Um, so, you know, I know as a substance abuse researcher, I tend to focus on uh, people with substance use disorders and the mental health comorbidities that they might have. And, and those are uh, reflected on, in the, on the right hand side of the uh, slide. And it's, I think, also really important to remember that people with various mental health disorders um, can have a substance use disorder. And uh, depending what lens you're using, um, you know, you, you might be seeing somewhat different things. Next slide. And uh, I found uh, that it's actually surprisingly difficult to find um, information about the rates of substance use disorders among those with certain mental health disorders split out by gender. And um, I was able to find this study by McLean et al. from 2011 uh, showing that really a fairly, uh, quite a small proportion of both uh, women and men with anxiety disorders have an alcohol or, uh, or had an alcohol or drug use disorder. Um, and somewhat proportionally more men uh, with anxiety had a substance use disorder. Um, next and next. Thank you. Um, and then there's actually quite a lot of information out there about uh, people with substance use disorders and um, the various kinds of mental health conditions, in, including, uh, it's not a mental health condition, but including the important uh, consideration of suicide attempt. And here, this is a, a new paper by Rian Rosenheck that uh, on the left-hand side shows people, men and women and men with no SUD and their rates of major depression, generalized anxiety disorder, PTSD, and suicide attempt. And um, higher rates for women than for men. Um, but then you move over to the uh, folks with an alcohol use disorder, only women and men, and uh, substantially more women are uh, reporting uh, major depression in particular, um, but more um, comorbidity in general. And then you move over to SUD uh, women and men, and uh, these are folks who have a drug use disorder with or without an alcohol use disorder. And uh, you can see the rates of uh, comorbidities are quite a lot higher than for the other groups. And that proportionally, again, women um, are more likely to have comorbidities. Okay, next slide, please. And then here, uh, Rian Rosenheck, we're using the same data source. This is the NISARC-3, and I'm gonna, um, uh, dig into uh, some work that uh, Joanna McDowell and I are doing, trying to understand um, treatment receipt patterns among people with uh, substance use disorders in this data set. And uh, this first slide is just to do a very basic comparison on some demographics for women and men, um, and a little bit about uh, substance use patterns and then comorbidities. And so you can see that um, as far as demographics uh, and uh, proportion of those with AED only, women or men are, are pretty, you know, they're very similar. Um, and we start seeing a little bit of difference when we look at other drug use disorders. Um, 
uh, and also the cannabis rate. So, but for the other drug use disorders, women are, are quite a bit more likely to have um, another drug use disorder. And again, when we uh, shift over to look at comorbidities, women are uh, much more likely. And then at the very tail end there, we've got percent any treatment and then um, being deliberate about any treatment. And you'll see why in a minute, but twice as many women uh, received past year treatment um, in the context of a past year substance use disorder than did men. All right, next. And what I wanna do is unpack the treatment. Um, and, uh, and then I will, uh, in a, just a minute, kind of uh, marry it up with a comorbidity um, questions. Uh, but here, what I want to show you, this is these are results from a latent class analysis that uh, Dr. McDowell and I did using the NASARC-3. And what we found is that um, for those with pa women with past year substance use disorders, 74% did not get any treatment. Among those who did get treatment, 18% uh, got, or I'm sorry, uh, among all of them, 18% got mental health outpatient treatment, 5% um, all kinds of mental health, uh, including ER and inpatient visits, and then a small 3% got mental health and SUD. Uh, next. And this is blowing out uh, the folks who got some treatment, and it's showing that among those who got treatment, 70% uh, got mental health treatment, 20% um, got mental health of all sorts, and 10, just 10% got mental health and side care. And we're going to go through the same thing for men. Um, and you might wonder why I'm bothering to show you the men. Um, and I, th I think it's instructive actually uh, to, uh, in this situation, to get a sense of where there are some, some key differences. And here, again, the men, you know, as, as we know, did not, for the most part, get treatment, 87%. 9% um, got some mental health outpatient treatment. Um, uh, let's see, 3% got said care without any mental health outpatient treatment, and then just 1% got both. And blowing it out again, um, among those who got treatment, 69% of men, mental health outpatient, 20% some said care, and 11% the combination. Okay, next slide. And uh, this, I'm not going to walk us through these uh, this slide and the next one, but it's just to show you briefly uh, the different kinds of um, care that we were looking at in this latent class analysis. And, um, you know, the, the patterns are pretty darn, um, they're pretty darn prominent. And uh, so this is the, what the latent class analysis looks like for women. Next slide. And this is what it looks like for the men. And um, so there's, there's some interesting similarities between the women and the men, um, particularly with the mental health outpatient care. Um, and there's some important differences. All right, next slide, please. And I'm gonna walk us through um, a, a few things about these, these folks who are falling into the different treatment categories. And um, so, the um, on this slide, we're looking at some demographics. And the most remarkable two things to point out are that um, in terms of marital status and, and whether people were cohabitating, uh, the women uh, who received mental health and side care were the least likely to be married or cohabitating, and the men who received side care. And then, um, just like in lots of other uh, publicly available data sources, what we're seeing is that among those who said that they were from a racial or ethnic uh, minority group or um, uh, who are non-white or Hispanic, relatively few minority folks are in the, for women, the mental health outpatient um, treatment group. And similarly for the men, uh, relatively few are um, seeking just mental health care or had access to, to just outpatient mental health care. Next. 
Um, with regard to SUD patterns and treatment patterns, um, I, I do want to note these percentages are based on estimated um, prevalences uh, using the survey weights. And um, because the some of the uh, treatment groups are pretty small, um, the estimates are, are somewhat unstable. And if you add everything up, you won't get to 100% for the smaller ones. Um, but what we're seeing is that as you stair step up to less severe, um, for both the women and the men, the proportion who reported uh, only alcohol use disorder goes up substantially so that for the more severe folks, um, they're more likely to have a drug use disorder um, or a cannabis on board. Um, but as you go up to the no treatment folks um, and, in, and also the uh, outpatient mental health, much more likely to see people with just an alcohol use disorder. All right, next slide. And now the comorbidity picture is, is a bit more um, interesting and uh, a little harder to, to um, summarize very quickly, but I will try. So uh, the light blue bars are uh, folks that are the proportion of people who report having had a suicide attempt. Um, and the orange-ish, the yellowish-orange are mood disorders, um, the blue or darker blue are anxiety disorders, and the dark red are bipolar disorders. And uh, for the women, what we're seeing is that for those who got both mental health and a substance and substance use treatment, they are they are certainly high on these comorbidities, except for bipolar. Um, but when you move over to the mental health all, um, the rate of suicide attempts is very high um, and the rate of anxiety disorders is quite high. Uh, and also among those with outpatient mental health, both depression, uh, depressive disorders and anxiety disorders are quite high. And everybody for the women is much higher uh, on comorbidities than for no, the no treatment group. Um, for the men, it's a different story uh, for the the SUD only and the no treatment, mental health comorbidities are low, um, but for both the mental health um, plus substance use care and outpatient mental health comorbidities are fairly high, but it's that first group where um, the comorbidities are quite high. And I'm showing you this detail um, because I think that it's really important that we uh, think about who we're talking about when we're talking about comorbidities and how that overlays with treatment because it, um, it has bearing on what we need to be thinking about in terms of the treatment that we're providing. Um, so hopefully we can talk about that more during the Q and A uh, portion. Next slide. So what do we know about behavioral treatment for women with mental health and SUD? And, the short answer is actually not a lot. Next and next. Thank you. Um, so what what I'm showing you here is um, really this is this is pretty uh, crude way of thinking about uh, what we do and don't know about women across behavioral uh, randomized clinical trials. Uh, so. Um, I'm benchmarking against a meta-analysis that Molly McGill published in 2019, where she found that 30% of the people in CB, third, across 30 CBT trials, 30% of the folks uh, were women. And then in a meta-analysis that I did of uh, the studies that involved both men and women and were not veteran studies, uh, we found that about 51% of the samples were women. In a more informal look at CBT uh, trials for people with um, major depression and SUD, 50% were women. And uh, among the trials that I could find on uh, anxiety and SUD, um, CBT for anxiety and SUD folks, about 42, 43% of the samples were women. So the take home here is that um, 
generally, I think without any effort to recruit more women, um, when we are offering um, treatment trials to the community, we're uh, likely to be enrolling more women than um, standard addiction or standard, at least alcohol studies uh, would be. Okay, and next. And I think it's important to note that uh, in the AUD trials, uh, McGill looked at a number of different moderators and the percent of women in a trial did not moderate the outcome. Um, but this, to my knowledge, has not been tested in uh, the other literatures. So we honestly, we don't know um, at this point whether um, the proportion of women or being a woman does or doesn't um, uh, lead to different differential response rates or uh, responding um, to these interventions to, that address comorbidities relative to men. Next. So a couple takeaways and then some questions. Um, so I think it's fair to say, um, based on these NISARC data and uh, other, other data sources, that women and men with substance use disorders who receive any form of behavioral health care are quite a lot more likely to have um, a mental health comorbidity than those who do not receive care. Um, and vastly more women and men with a substance use disorder with and without mental health comorbidities receive mental health care than said care. Next. So I think some key questions for us to consider as a field um, include, are women and men self-sorting into appropriate treatment modalities, including no treatment? Are those with SUD who receive only mental health care getting their SUD needs met? And if not, how can we address this in the field at scale? And do women with various mental health and psych comorbidities benefit as much as men do from interventions tailored to their comorbidities? And next slide. And that's it. So thank you. A whirlwind tour of uh, comorbidities in women. Thank you for that excellent presentation. If you have questions for Dr. Simpson, please add them uh, in the Q&A box and we'll be able to answer them during the Q&A at the end. Now, please welcome Dr. Shelley Greenfield. Good afternoon, everyone. I think at this point you can see my slides. So, um, I am so delighted to be here with you speaking at this conference. Thanks so much for the invitation. Um, I have we, been- We need to have you go into presentation mode. Oh, I'm... There you go, you're good. Yep, can you see it now? All set, Perfect. Okay, great, thank you so much. Um, I am going to be talking to you about developing gender-specific interventions for women with substance use disorders, and I'm gonna be focusing on the women's recovery group. I have no conflicts of interest related to a defined commercial interest. I wanted to let you know that I am the author of Treating Women with Substance Use Disorders, the Women's Recovery Group Manual, and I'll be focusing on that treatment. And I wanna also acknowledge support from NIDA for the clinical trials uh, for this intervention. So um, what we knew um, before the COVID-19 pandemic is that um, the prevalence of substance use disorders, as you've heard many times through this conference, is greater in men than women, but that the gender gap had been narrowing in both the United States and internationally quite precipitously. In 2019, 34 million adult women had a mental illness or substance use disorder, with, which actually was an increase of almost 7% over 2018. 4.6 million of them um, had both a uh, substance use and a mental illness. And one of the things I think people have highlighted over this last couple of days is that if you look at these data from the NISDA from 2013 to 2019, you can see that there's been a narrowing of the gap between 2013 and 2019. But in when you look at that, um, everybody above the age of 18, you can see there's um, more uh, uh, highly prevalent in men than women for past year substance use disorders. But when we look at this um, 
vulnerable age group 12 to 17. By 2013, that prevalence gap had, had completely closed. And by 2019, more girls and boys in this age group had a past year substance use disorder. And you heard from Dr. Hazen yesterday that we knew that in the decade between 2001 and 2012, there'd been a really, a, a very large rise in alcohol use and alcohol problems amongst women with a 16% increase in the proportion of women who drink alcohol, a 58% increase in women's high risk drinking compared to 16% men, and an 84% increase in women's one year prevalence of an alcohol use disorder versus 35% in men. And we've been concerned about all of this because I think you heard from Dr. Sinha yesterday because of a phenomenon we think of or we've termed telescoping where we know that women who drink progress more rapidly to serious alcohol related physical and social consequences than their male counterparts. They have a shorter time between the landmarks of illness progression. We know that it happens at lower doses of alcohol, consume less frequently. And there's some evidence for this telescoping course with other substances such as stimulants, opioids, and nicotine. So just to summarize, you know, what you've heard, I think, throughout this conference is that among the most reproducible research findings we have is that there's an increased prevalence in women in the past three to four decades of alcohol and drug use. There's lower levels of abstaining, and especially um, amongst younger age cohorts where the gap has narrowed to almost zero or, or even increased within uh, girls. There's a heightened vulnerability of women to adverse medical and social consequences. We have this telescoping course where women advance more rapidly. And then we also see that at treatment entry with fewer years of use, women often have more medical, psychiatric, and adverse social consequences than males. So what are the risk factors? Well, we know for men and women, um, there are genetic factors and a biological basis that's um, significant for both men and women and the earlier age of onset of use. We also know that's a risk factor for um, later onset of a substance use disorder, but particularly significant for women are heavy drinking and drug use by a significant other or partner, a history of sexual or physical violence or family violence, and co-occurring psychiatric disorders such as depression, anxiety, PTSD, and eating disorders. So according to SAMHSA, more than two thirds of women who reported a substance use disorder also had another co-occurring other psychiatric disorder. We know that among women um, with an eating disorder, more than 25% experience a substance use disorder. Binge eating, which has been recognized as more highly prevalent in the population than was previously thought, is more closely associated with alcohol consumption. We also know that dieting and purging are associated with sleep disturbance and misuse of sedative hypnotics. And we know that mood disorders, anxiety and PTSD, as well as eating disorders and binge eating behaviors should be addressed in conjunction with substance use treatment. We also know that violence and trauma are prevalent among individuals with substance use disorders. Women are more likely to experience childhood sexual and physical abuse, and that there's a strong relationship between abuse history and substance use disorders. And yet, and yet, accessing gender-specific treatment for women within substance use treatment facilities is basically very difficult. This, this survey shows you in 2019 that fewer than 50% of substance use treatment facilities offer programming for adult women or co-occurring disorders or trauma or sexual abuse or intimate partner violence or pregnancy or postpartum. So about 20 years ago now, we recognized that most women would receive treatment in mixed gender substance use treatment programs. And we recognized that there was a need for treatment that would be gender responsive for women with substance use disorders. And so we, we embarked on a program of research to develop an evidence-based group therapy designed for women with substance use disorders or heterogeneous with respect to many of the things I just showed you. Um, their substance use disorder could be alcohol, could be a drug use disorder, co-occurring other psychiatric disorders, which are the ones we just listed, their trauma histories, they may or may not have a trauma history, their partner and parenting status and their life stage. We just heard about um, alcohol use disorder through the lifespan. So uh, what about through the entire life stage, early adulthood, middle adulthood and late adulthood? And this was the impetus for developing the women's recovery group. This was a, this is a group therapy that is evidence-based, developed and tested, um, supported by NIDA. Um, in stage one and stage two trials, we used mixed methods, meaning quantitative and qualitative data. It's a 90-minute, 12 session relapse prevention skills-based group therapy. It's designed for women heterogeneous with respect to their substance use, co-occurring psychiatric disorders, and trauma history and life stage. It is women-focused content in an all-women's group composition. 
structured sessions I'll describe in a moment, and 14 session topics that can be flexibly chosen for 12 sessions or all 14 can be run depending on the program. This has been um, well researched for the stage one trial. We have seven peer reviewed papers in the stage two trial. We have five peer reviewed papers. I'm gonna to try to represent some of this data in this talk. In 2016, we published the dissemination manual. This is the Women's Recovery Group manual. Um, in, in this manual is a website from which um, any practitioner can download all the materials for both therapist and for the patient. We also have three um, recent adaptations of this, one for women with eating disorders and substance use disorders, one for transitional age women. And more recently, I've worked with um, Tracy Simpson and her colleagues on um, adapting this to women military vets. And then we have begun to do digital adaptations of the Women's Recovery Group, and I'm gonna tell you more about that at the end of this talk. So what is this in a nutshell? This is a professionally led evidence-based manualized treatment it can accommodate women typical in addiction treatment programs in the community who are heterogeneous clinically and demographically. The content is gender responsive based on the evidence of gender differences we've just discussed. It has an all women's group composition to enhance affiliation. I'm gonna tell you a little more about what I mean by affiliation in a moment. It's a skills-based relapse prevention group. It has a structured session with a check-in and a check-out, a topic presentation and open discussions. There's skills practices, which are given to be done in between sessions. It balances content and open discussion. It has four levels of participation, the group theme, which is recovery means taking care of yourself, a central recovery rule and four session topics. So of course we did have a hypothesis about how this would work. And what we said was that the all women's group composition would increase group affiliation, increase an in open discussion of triggers and relapse and increase comfort and support. And the all women's group composition would give us an opportunity to focus group content, such as the education about the antecedents and the consequences of substance use that differentially affects women. Basically all the things we've discussed today um, in this talk, but all really through the, out the entire conference, and that these things would synergize and enhance outcomes for women in the women's recovery group. The 90-minute structured relapse prevention group therapy session has a brief check-in, last a review of last week's skill practice and last week's topic, the presentation of a session topic, discussion by participants, a review of the session's take-home message, and an upcoming week's skill practice, and a checkout. So here are the 14 sessions. These in the blue font are the ones that we consider gender specific. These in the black font are the ones we consider bread and butter um, relapse prevention topics that are infused with gender responsive content. In particular, you can see that number one is the effect of drugs and alcohol on women's health. We, we actually um, tell women about many of the things you've heard in this conference, including the risk of breast cancer um, through drinking and all, all sorts of other health consequences, but relevant for today's topic in this panel, we talk about managing mood, anxiety, and eating problems without using substances, violence and abuse, getting help in terms of PTSD. Um, we also talk about the issue of disclosure to tell or not to tell, and we address stigma, and, um, and, um, and a whole host of other things um, within that group and also the um, within those session topics and also within those that are um, things like managing triggers that are and high-risk situations that are specific to women. So I wanna tell you briefly about what we found in the stage one and stage two trial. In the stage one trial, this was a small pilot trial, which we used a semi-open group format. And we found that the women's recovery group produced reductions in substance use during 12 week treatment phase, equivalent to the effective mixed gender control group, which was called group drug counseling. But we found that there were sustained improvements in substance use in the six months post-treatment phase that were greater in the women's recovery group compared with the GDC. And that gave us some um, pilot uh, indication of efficacy. And we moved on to a stage two trial, which was a larger trial with 156 participants, 100 women at two sites in community practice, one at McLean, one at Start Recovery in Fall River. We had women randomized to the women's recovery group or to the mixed gender counseling. And what was really important about this was it was a mixed efficacy effectiveness implementation trial, we had a continuous open enrollment, such as this practice in community-based practice with a rolling group format over two years, 24 months, and two outpatient programs in the community. And we wanted to know whether the outcomes of the women's recovery group implemented in community practice 
would be at least equivalent to the outcomes of the effective mixed gender treatment group drug counseling. Of note, um, based on the um, focus of this panel, these women, as you would expect, women coming into substance use disorder treatment had high levels of co-occurring psychiatric disorder, 75% had any access one, 17% had an access two. And you can see they're distributed on major depressive disorder, GAD and PTSD, and there were other disorders as well. And what we showed was that the women in the women's recovery group, as well as the women in the GDC, did in fact reduce, had clinically significant reductions in days of use during treatment that's over the first three months, and then we're able to sustain those gains six months post-treatment. So we concluded that this is an effective group therapy for women heterogeneous with all these clinical characteristics, and it can be delivered in community treatment in a rolling group format as a gender responsive component of mixed gender treatment. So to summarize, in the stage one trial, we found that the women's recovery group members demonstrated a pattern of continued reductions in substance use, while the women in the mixed gender group did not, six months post. And that in the stage two trial, we showed that the women's recovery group, recovery group demonstrated comparable effectiveness to mixed gender treatment in community-based practice in the real world settings. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the studies of group process that we did in affiliation. And I'm gonna to talk to you about two studies in particular. The first is that we wanted to find out about um, affiliation amongst, it, amongst the group members. And in order to do this, we operationalized this by looking at affiliative verbal statements made in both groups, all women's and the mixed gender. We double-coded group therapy tapes for eight categories of statements of empathy and support. And we found that the number of affiliative statements made in the women's recovery group was 66% higher than in the mixed gender control condition. But we didn't know whether that had anything to do with outcomes. So we did another study where we looked at um, the exposure of women in both women's recovery group and GDC to um, levels of verbal affiliation. And we found that at the end of the treatment phase, at three months, women who experienced the highest level of affiliation, more than 65 affiliative statements on average in the sessions they attended, were found to reduce substance use by about 1.75 days more than those who experienced the lowest level of affiliation. And the effects of the affiliation persisted six months post-treatment. But they were also modified by group therapy. And what I mean by that is that women enrolled in the single gender bed WRG benefited the most from the higher level of affiliation, especially in the six months post-treatment. So we also did another set of qualitative analyses where we exit interviewed everybody in both the stage one and stage two trial, and then did grounded theory um, analysis of those tapes. And what we found was that the women in the women's recovery group said that they focused on gender relevant topics that supported their recovery. And that compared to the mixed gender GDC, women in the women's recovery group more frequently endorsed feeling safe, embracing all aspects of themselves, having their needs met, feeling intimacy, empathy, and honesty. In our, um, in our stage two trial, we had an opportunity to exit interview both women and men and also code those tapes for um, themes. And what we found, um, we found a number of things, but importantly for, I think, this presentation, we found that both women and men endorsed guilt and shame, but only women discussed societal stigma and judgment, and that it was harsher toward women, especially in their roles as women and mothers. And I think you've heard about this um, throughout this two-day conference. So just in their own words, one woman said a lot of the information that was presented to me, I was very unaware of, in particular women's health, what alcohol does to a woman's body, the education of end of it was huge for me, really huge to the point that I was sharing it with my family and friends. Another said, I think that the fact that it's all female, the fact that it's run by a female are essential because nobody ever talks about the issues being related to being female, being a caretaker or being a single mother or being a career person in a man's world. And so, we have a dissemination manual and people can in fact implement the women's recovery group and routine practice, but we know that not all women will have access to the women's recovery group. And so we've been working on digital adaptations of the content to adult women in substance use disorder treatment. And Dr. Dawn Sugarman is a research psychologist at McLean who's really leading this work to develop sustainable strategies for integrating gender responsive components of care for women with substance use disorders. I wanna tell you a little bit more about that research. 
What she's done is taken the women focus group content um, to target this for technology. This is the topics that I showed you earlier, education about antecedents and consequences of substance use. And initially, what we did was adapt five of the topics of the women's recovery group to a web-based format. These are the five topics, the effects of drugs and alcohol on women's health, managing mood, anxiety, and eating problems, women and their partners, violence and abuse, getting help, and women as care caregivers. And the results of this study were published in the Journal of Women's Health in 2020, but relevant to this panel, these um, individuals had high levels of co-occurring mental health problems, including anxiety, depression, PTSD, ADD, OCD, bipolar disorder, and BPD, as you can see. People enrolled in this um, study were um, found this uh, intervention highly satisfying. Um, and the sat satisfaction scores did not differ by whether they were an inpatient, partial hospital, or outpatient. Interestingly, among the things that they thought were most relevant to their recovery was the link between substance use problems and their other mental health problems, especially depression and anxiety, as well as the effects of substance use on self-care. They said, and you'll see it's very similar to what the women in the women's recovery group said themselves, just learning all this information is crucial for all women. I was unaware of it. I feel like the survey was right on and explained my problem as a woman with addiction to the T. It is really helpful to see the information in this way. In groups, it is great to be able to discuss these things with other people, but it's easy to miss something. So having it all laid out on an iPad like this is really helpful to remember everything and see it visually. So the next step in this ongoing research was the opportunity to modify this for younger women with substance use problems receiving care for co-occurring other mental health conditions. So these were women who were um, hospitalized in inpatient residential treatment for a primary diagnosis of depression, anxiety, trauma and PTSD, eating disorders or borderline personality disorder. And the idea here was to um, provide them with a tailored um, intervention, digital intervention. When in this initial pilot phase with these 15 women, they wanted the intervention to have more interactivity, more emphasis on coping skills. They wanted added information on navigating peer relationships and information on the menstrual cycle and its relationship to substance use and craving. And so the digital intervention was modified and you can see that those who were enrolled, 44 women, you can see that they had depression and anxiety, trauma, PTSD, eating disorders, and borderline personality disorder. Overall, most of these women were very satisfied or mostly satisfied with the intervention. One thing that's really interesting to us is that when we looked at the pre and post intervention outcomes, the participants, some of whom didn't think that they had a substance use disorder or even substance misuse or even a substance problem, significantly increased their ratings of interest in making changes to their substance use and willingness to make changes in their substance use. And so just to wrap up in conclusion, We've discussed today that there is this narrowing gender gap in the prevalence of substance use disorders. We know that women in the, born in the last five decades have lower rates of abstinence and higher rates of substance use. They have a telescoping course of addiction. We know treatment outcomes can be enhanced by programs that provide services and other programming specific to women's needs. There are a number of gender responsive um, uh, components of care, and uh, you heard some of these about some of these in, during this conference, and evidence-based therapies exist. Today, we focused on the Women's Recovery Group, a manual-based single-gender women's recovery group with women-focused content that can enhance treatment outcomes and can be integrated into community-based substance use disorder treatment programs. And we are... Um, uh, we are engaged in digital adaptations now that we think are promising to extend gender-specific treatment to women with substance use disorders in a variety of treatment-related settings. I want to acknowledge a myriad of co-investigators and consultants and group therapists and research study staff over the last 20 years. These are some of the people who have worked on the Women's Recovery Group, and I appreciate all of them and all of the participants and the group therapists and all the many, many, many people who have made this research process possible over the last two decades. And with that, I really wanna thank you very much. Thank you for that uh, excellent presentation. 
if you have questions for Dr. Greenfield, um, we'll please add them to the Q&A box and we'll be able to answer them during the Q&A uh, at the end. Now, please welcome Dr. Sherry McKee. Thank you for the invitation to present today. Uh, the title of my talk is Pharmacological Strategies for Alcohol Use Disorder. And the second part should probably be titled What Might Work for Women? So I have a few disclosures. And I also want to mention that I will be talking about off-label use of medication. So as an outline, I'm going to first touch on what we know about sex differences with regards to FDA approved medications for alcohol use disorder, and then move into treating uh, AUD and mental health comorbidities with medication, and then spend the majority of the time talking about targeting stress for medication development. There are three FDA approved medications for alcohol use disorder. Disulfram was first approved in 1948, which inhibits the breakdown of alcohol and results in a toxic reaction to alcohol, such as nausea or vomiting. Naltrexone is an opioid receptor antagonist, is hypothesized to attenuate alcohol cravings with effects mediated through the mesolimbic dopamine system. Acamprosate has a chemical structure similar to GABA, and is thought to normalize the dysregulation of NMDA associated with chronic drinking. It's important to note that these medications were developed exclusively or primarily with samples of men. Uh, this is an issue we highlighted in a recent review paper. Uh, we reviewed major classes of abuse substances and demonstrated that sex and gender have not been well considered in addiction medication development research. When we look at the FDA approved medications for alcohol use disorder, uh, we can see that uh, uh, SABV or sex as a biological variable was not considered in study design. It was only considered in analysis in a post hoc fashion and these were primarily done through systematic reviews. When those reviews were conducted, uh, it was demonstrated that, uh, that for both naltrexone and camprosat, there was equal efficacy for women and men, uh, but there is an increase in adverse events for women taking naltrexone in that they may experience more nausea. In this review, we also looked at medication targets, which have shown promise for alcohol use disorder, but are not yet FDA approved. And across these various targets, uh, again, sex and gender not considered in study design. And in only a very small handful of studies was uh, sex considered in any level of the analysis. And when it was, you can see the varied outcomes. So in some studies, uh, women had worse efficacy, some studies showed no difference, and others showed women actually had a preferred response. And across the entire body of this work, there was no mention of any sex differences with regards to adverse events. Now, this is an example of one such study that showed a preferential response for women, randomized controlled trial of baclofen. And in the full sample, when you look at the odds ratio of medication to placebo, uh, the odds is 1.2 for medication efficacy. That jumps to 10.5 for women. And uh, while this result was, uh, was uh, reported in the paper, it was not at all discussed in the discussion section of the paper. So as a conclusion to our review, we recommend improved access to publicly available sex stratified data for medication development investigations, both to inform uh, clinical practice and to improve the treatment provided to women with substance use disorders. I then had a look at the literature looking at um, medication studies for uh, alcohol use disorder with mental health comorbidities. These studies primarily focused on uh, depression and anxiety, including PTSD. Um, about 19 um, randomized double-blind studies over the, the last 20 years. And they fall into four categories. So some studies just simply looked at an FDA-approved medication to treat both uh, comorbidities. 
Other studies just looked at uh, either antidepressants or an anxiolytic uh, to treat uh, the comorbidity. Uh, the third class are looking at uh, FDA approved AUD medications in addition to uh, a psychiatric medication. And uh, I have to say, this is the approach we take in my clinic. I direct an outpatient addiction clinic, and I would consider this to be standard of care that, that we provide in the clinic. And then the fourth category are studies looking at novel targets to treat both AUD and mental health comorbidities. So just as a very high level overview of this work, um, I found two systematic reviews, uh, this one on uh, AUD and depression comorbidity, uh, just published last year. They identified 14 uh, high quality studies uh, that met their entrance criteria, but overall the total sample size was quite low and only 31% female inclusion across these studies. The authors concluded that tricyclic antidepressants resulted in a slight reduction in depressive symptoms. SSRIs resulted in a slight reduction in alcohol use, but also increased adverse events. And because of the small sample sizes and the small number of studies, the authors overall had relatively low confidence in their conclusions. There's also been a Cochrane review looking at uh, alcohol with anxiety comorbidities, and these include uh, social anxiety, generalized anxiety disorders, as well as studies of PTSD. Uh, the authors identified five studies that were of high quality that met their entrance criteria. Overall, uh, again, a low average sample size, uh, low inclusion of women. Uh, they did uh, conclude that there was some improvement in anxiety symptoms um, with regards to uh, use of an SSRI. There was no evidence for reductions in alcohol use. Overall, the studies had a very high dropout rate and again, uh, low confidence in their outcomes. We believe that if treatment is gonna be effective for women with alcohol use disorders, then treatments need to target factors that underlie drinking in women. And we have been targeting stress reactivity, and this is potentially a strategy that can cut across various psychiatric comorbidities. In this review paper, we discuss uh, what drives drinking in women and identify two separate pathways for women and men. So for women, uh, the PFC, the prefrontal cortex, and the amygdala, which is involved in processing emotions, are key brain regions. This interacts with childhood adversity, the experience of early life stress, leading to anxiety and depression disorders, then leading to alcohol use. For men, we see the pathway as being very different key brain regions being PFC and the striatum, which is involved in reinforcement, interacting with impulsivity and sensation seeking, then leading to alcohol use disorders. We've seen this play out over the course of the pandemic. We've seen increases in rates of anxiety and depression, increases in rates of COVID-related distress. And for women, Studies have demonstrated a positive relationship between COVID-related distress and increases in drinking. And overall, you see larger increases in alcohol consumption and consequences as a result of the pandemic. So as a general working hypothesis, we believe that women are more likely to drink for negative reinforcement whereas men are more likely to drink for positive reinforcement. So negative reinforcement for women being drinking to alleviate stress and alleviate negative emotional states. From a medication development standpoint, there are a number of potential targets focused on stress pathophysiology. And in this review paper by Barbara Mason, she very nicely lays out uh, various brain stress systems and anti-stress systems that can be medication development targets for alcohol use disorder. There's been a, a few studies that have uh, looked at these targets. Uh, this one, again, coming from Barbara Mason's lab, looking at a glucocoid receptor antagonist, showing positive effects for craving and drinking behavior. But like with most of these investigations, the sample was primarily male and sex and gender differences were not examined. 
This particular study, uh, again, small preliminary study looking at oxytocin, uh, they, they had null findings, but again, the sample is primarily male, sex difference is not examined. And it's possible that these medications may be particularly effective for women, but that's not being studied in, 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 in the field. In my laboratory, uh, we've completed a number of studies that uh, target stress precipitated smoking and drinking behavior. And uh, we've focused on the neurogenergic system, looking at uh, various targets uh, across the, the neurogenergic receptors. I've also looked at a, a kappa antagonist, and this is part of the opioid receptor system. And we're just starting some work now with neurosteroids, um, which Dr. Gordon very nicely uh, touched on in his plenary this morning. For the rest of my talk today, I'll, I'll be talking, I'll be focused on the neurogenergic targets. And these are interesting targets from an addiction standpoint. Uh, we know that they are involved in stress-induced relapse to drugs, that they mediate uh, um, substance-provoked dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens, and are also involved in stress-induced decrements in prefrontal functioning. In particular, I'll be talking about guanfacine, which is an alpha-2A neurogenergic agonist. It acts presynaptically, so it has the effect of improving neurogenergic tone. The immediate release formulation is approved for hypertension, and the extended release formulation is approved for ADHD. So I'll start by, we started this work uh, looking at uh, tobacco dependence, and uh, this is a human laboratory study. We randomized 100 smokers to either uh, guapacine or placebo, 50% uh, women. And what we found was that guampacine increased the ability to resist smoking, reduced the number of cigarettes smoked, and reduced tobacco craving following stress, but only in women, not in men. In men, we see that guampacine is reducing smoking-related reinforcement, and this reduction in reinforcement is related to an improved ability to resist smoking for men only. We've also um, conducted imaging studies of our smokers. Uh, this is an fMRI study, and we demonstrated that guampacine increased activation in areas related to attention and inhibitory control. We've also conducted PET neuroimaging studies uh, in our smokers. And uh, in this study demonstrated that guampacine attenuated dopamine response in extrastriatal regions with the largest reduction in the amygdala. And because we share subjects across paradigms, uh, so we had subjects complete human laboratory study and PET neuroimaging, we were able to combine the data and demonstrated that females with greater dampening of dopamine release in the amygdala had the greatest ability to resist smoking following stress and smoked less cigarettes during a brief treatment phase. We further back translated this finding and did some animal work. Uh, so we knocked out the alpha 2A receptor out of the amygdala and demonstrated that uh, that receptor in the amygdala was absolutely necessary to demonstrate guanosine's effects in terms of stress dampening. We then completed a phase two clinical trial of guampacine in smokers, randomizing uh, to either six milligrams a day ER or a placebo, essentially showing that guampacine doubles quit rates. And when we break out results between men and women, what we demonstrate is that guampacine is effective for both with relatively larger effects for women smokers than men smokers. So to summarize the smoking findings, we see that guampacine targets stress for women, targets smoking-related reinforcement for men, that for women, these effects seem to be centralized in the amygdala, and that we have um, demonstrated efficacy with a randomized control trial with uh, relatively larger effects for women. So then we moved on to start to look at this drug for alcohol use. And uh, within the context of our smoking clinical trial, we identified uh, a subset of 32 uh, subjects that had um, heavier drinking patterns and had a look as to what happened to their drinking 
over the course of the smoking trial. So we see uh, significant reductions in the frequency of consumption. Um, they had 40% reductions in quantity consumed and their episodes of heavy drinking uh, were reduced by 87%. And importantly, uh, these reductions were associated with their plasma medication levels. We then moved on to conduct a phase two study to look at stress precipitated drinking in subjects with alcohol use disorder. And what we see is that guanfacine attenuates stress precipitated drinking as well as craving uh, in women only. In men, again, we see this pattern of guanfacine attenuating reinforcement for men. When we dig into the stress finding a little bit more, we see that guanfacine is attenuating ratings um, right from the start of the laboratory session. So we, we call this tonic ratings of, of uh, sorry, tonic ratings of stress. When we look at stress ratings over the course of the laboratory session, we see that um, this, the, the lines pretty much remain parallel. Uh, so, so it's not having a phasic effect on, on stress, but a tonic effect of stress. And this is consistent with our animal findings that guampicine is reducing the effect of stress on amygdala tone. So given our findings, we believe that different brain systems modulated by noradrenergic activity are activated by substance use in women and men. So the prefrontal cortex amygdala acts as women, the mesolimbic dopamine system in men, and that guampicine can preferentially target these gender sensitive systems to improve treatment outcomes. We're now moved on and continuing this line of work, uh, conducting a hybrid laboratory clinical trial design that is fully powered to, so we can identify mechanisms involved in the medication effect and then associate those with, with treatment outcomes during the clinical trial phase of the study. And this study is part of our larger center focused on targeting the dark side of addiction for medication development. Uh, Dr. Koo presented his heuristic uh, during his plenary yesterday, and we are using this as a framework for our research. Um, there will, of course, we have, of course, a, a large focus on the extended amygdala, as well as other brain structures, neurochemical systems, a large focus on neuroimmune function, HPA access, and sex steroid hormones for medication development. So with that, um, I will summarize uh, my talk for today that medication trials for AUD have not well considered the inclusion of sex and gender. And, and this is even more true for studies of, of comorbidities that targeting stress is a promising strategy that might cut across psychiatric comorbidities that our work to date with norogenergic targets is promising um, as a way to target these gender sensitive systems. And just to say a plug that, uh, that these studies absolutely need to be designed and powered to examine sex differences and we need to be presenting our results by sex. So with that, I just wanna thank the amazing group of researchers that I work with and to thank the funders uh, of our center, NIAAA and ORWH, thank you. Thank you for that excellent presentation. If you have questions for Dr. McKee, please add them in the Q&A box and we'll be able to answer them. We'll now begin our 15 minute Q&A session. Please submit your questions via the Q&A box. Uh, Dr. McKee, I'm surprised. I thought SSRIs are associated with less adverse effect. Um. Yeah, I, uh, I guess it depends on the, the, the collection of, of studies that you're looking at. Um, again, I, I just was summarizing uh, a recent Cochrane review on, on the topic. Okay, here's a question for everyone, if you want to speak up, speak to the issue of when you think it does and does not make sense to include comparisons with men and boys, when exploring women and girls' challenges with alcohol and drugs? Anyone? <laughs> well, I, 
I can start. Um, I, I actually got asked this question yesterday in um, the breakout that I did. And, um, you know, and I, I guess part of it is the context, you know, in, in the substance use realm, um, you know, at, even though women and girls are, are catching up and, and, and perhaps uh, surpassing, uh, at least for girls, uh, surpassing boys, um, uh, you know, I think the predominant models have all been um, developed, or ways of understanding models for treatment. Um, most of the uh, treatment information that we have around um, substance use disorders has been focused on men. And, um, and often, because women still are a minority, and, and I, part of Part of my response is coming from um, my reality as a VA researcher, um, and where men are, you know, the vast majority of the of the patients. Um, so, you know, trying to um, help healthcare systems see that uh, they they can't just apply a one size fits all to women and men, um, and uh, perhaps having uh, gender comparisons can, can help with some of those arguments. Um, and I think also just getting clear about, uh, you know, where, where there are interesting and important differences that maybe would be targeted differently as, as you were, I think, just beautifully describing Dr. McKee. And I, and as I have contemplated this question a lot, um, both since yesterday and in, in general. I also think there are some situations where it makes sense to just focus on women that, you know, um, uh, for example, with uh, women veterans with substance use disorder, we know a whole lot about what their prevalence looks like versus um, non-veteran women versus veteran men. What we really don't know a lot about is them. And in order to find out about them and have enough, you know, resources and time to really dig in and understand what's going on for them, I think you know, some studies that just are focused on on the women and letting go of whether they are are not different on these parameters from men. So, I, so in other words, I think it depends what the questions are. Any of the other? Uh panelists would like to respond. I'd just add to what um, Dr. Simpson just said that, you know, um, I think the conference has really well pointed out that most of the data that we've had, that we're really playing a 30 year catch up game here, um, there where a lot of the data has been done, um, really assuming that sex and gender meant male or men. And a lot of the treatments have been designed that way, that a lot of the studies were underpowered to look at sex differences, that once we start looking at sex differences and gender differences, we see a lot of gender and sex differences, but most of the treatments predicated on a male-based model. And so I think that's why you see a conference like this, which is really a playing a lot of catch up to understand more about this. And, you know, I thought Dr. McKee's research was incredibly <laughs> compelling about guanfacine, for example. So I think we're in a place where we just need so much more information about sex and gender differences in treatment, and that it's pretty clear that um, there are specific needs uh, that women have that are not taken into account in what we designed as treatment based on mostly male populations. And so, you know, we are playing like a 30 year catch up game here, um, you know, so uh, I think that that's part of the answer. That said, one of the things that would be great as we learn more is that then we can begin to tailor treatments to men and boys that will be more effective and take into account their special needs. Once you recognize that we have multiple genders and we need to look specifically about that, plus the intersections that we know with race and ethnicity have also been totally under-researched. So that, that's the way I think about this at this stage of our research uh, development. 
Yeah, I, I would just echo what 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 Shelley and Tracy have already said that you know that the the purpose of this is to improve treatment for everybody. That from a med, from from my medication development standpoint, if we learn that uh, that medicate that a particular medication might work uh, for both men and women, but potentially through different mechanisms, great. But we might also discover that there are certain medications that work really well for women and others that work really well for men for, for various, uh, for various reasons. And, and that is, that is critical to know. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Greenfield, how would I run a woman's recovery group in my substance use program or mental health clinic? Is there any specific training required? Thank you for that question. Um, you know, what we tried to do, um, we had done the research and published papers, but what we really wanted to do, the whole point, purpose of doing it was to help treatment programs be able to implement the Women's Recovery Group as a gender responsive component of care. So the Women's Recovery Group manual, the dissemination manual is really meant to be one where people can actually utilize that manual to implement that treatment program in their um, outpatient community-based practice. And so really and truly, there's not a special training that's needed within that is a lot of the information on how to do it, the way to do it, as well as, as I mentioned in the presentation, there's a website in the, in the manual where people can just download the materials for the therapist and download the materials for the patients. And you can just keep on downloading it forever, I mean, to, for your program. Um, and so it's really meant to be a, a, a one-stop shop, the dissemination manual. And we it, it's not easy to convert a research manual that came with me doing the supervision to a dissemination manual where a therapist in a program can pick it up and implement it without having a specialized training or without having, let's say, me to go along with it. But that was the point of adapting it to a dissemination manual. So, um, so I think it's actually pretty easily implementable. And what most of our programs that we know who have implemented it have found is that it's pretty easy, but that you know it takes some practice and that after running several cycles of it, therapists begin to kind of get how to do it and also can adapt it to their specific populations. So for example, if you are working in a trauma-based program, you might not use the, the specific topic about trauma if you already have a lot of programming there and you might focus on other areas. So it's meant to have some flexibility built in and that's all in the dissemination manual. The point of doing all the research was that it gets used and we just tried to make it as user-friendly as possible. Okay, and for Dr. Simpson, what might a SUD boot camp for mental health providers look like and how could it be evaluated? Mm. Yeah, um, well, I, I think that um, coming up with a uh, fairly distilled um, brief training that uh, I think would, personally, I think um, a refresher probably from most um, mental health folks on motivational interviewing. Um, I think a lot of people, whether they're addiction, um, addiction folks or not, um, uh, probably have some background there, but highlighting that. And then um, I think basic, basic training on uh, intersections between SUD and uh, common mental health concerns and how having an alcohol or drug use, um, um, excess alcohol and drug use on board can exacerbate the mental health concerns. Uh, and, and then um, uh, also helping, helping the providers see the, the importance of not not just kind of quickly assessing at the very beginning where alcohol and drug use might be, but continuing to check in on it um, as treatment is going. And, um, you know, I think obviously to, to really put something solid together, you need a lot of heads at the table thinking that through um, how to, how to have a succinct, um, 
but thorough enough training for providers uh, that they will one do it and you know be willing to sign up for the training, but then two um, sustain it um, over time, actually implement it and sustain it and. Um, you know, and I could see some implementation and dissemination kind of health health services kind of work to evaluate at the uh, clinic level um, whether you know whether therapists are are engaged therapists in a mental health setting are um, doing the you know doing the add add on work with a, with the sad folks um, and whether that is uh, helping with outcomes, both on the mental health side and the and the substance use side, um, and actually, first, I think we need to to do a careful look and see whether these issues are already being addressed um, in mental health settings. Um, there's certainly enough people with alcohol or drug use problem who are going to mental health care only um, that you know basically a, a thoughtful needs assessment around um, these issues, I think would be a good place to start. Okay, in the, in the box, uh, Q&A box uh, for Dr. Greenfield, uh, can the WRG be used in residential SUD programs? Yes, it can be. And we, we have done it um, and shown that we can do that. And uh, what I would say is it depends on how long your residential program is. What some people have done is if you have, let's say, a four-week program, you might so, and you could run it three times a week. You might do all 12 topics in you know, four weeks. If you only have a two-week program, you can select the ones depending on how frequently you can do it, but it is definitely amenable um, to a residential program or even to a partial hospital program, depending on how many weeks people are in and how many times a week you can actually run each module. So yes, indeed, you can use it there. But the study was done, just to be clear, in two outpatient programs, but we have implemented it in uh, residential programming. Okay, and our final question is for Dr. McKee. If naltrexone and acamprosate are equally effective for women, why do we need to develop additional medications? Okay, great question. Um, it is true, again, post hoc analysis are, you know, are demonstrating equal efficacy. But we know that you know, not, uh, you know, not every medication works for every person. That while um, you know, in general, the, the medications for alcohol use disorder, either efficacy is on par with antidepressants, there, there is room for an improvement. And uh, this has been the strategy to, to move forward with, with more personalized medications. And, and, and we need uh, more tools in our toolbox uh, with regards to uh, medications to treat sub alcohol and substance use disorders. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Bob, oh, yeah. would you mind looking in your chat? I think there are a few questions there for the panel. Uh, Would you mind if I read one? Yeah, I can't find it, sorry. Okay, no, no problem. Uh, this question is from Dr. Koob. Uh, well, maybe not Dr. Koob. I'm sorry if I'm misattributing it, but it's the effects of the pandemic will continue for quite a while. And for those who have multiple risks, I think there may be residual effects that differ by gender. Um, that was actually my answer, Deidre. Okay, I'm well. sorry. I know, I think what he was asking was, um, would there be residual effects for those with co-occurring disorders um, that will continue to persist as yes. the pandemic evolves and, and would we expect, expect differences by gender? And I think that, um, you know, I just wrote into the chat that I think that um, people with multiple risks um, probably will bear more and more of the ongoing lasting effects of the pandemic. 
than others, and that probably there will be gender differences. Exactly what those look like is a little bit difficult to predict and actually it would be great to study that um, because I do think there will likely be some gender differences there, but exactly which ones I could make guesses about, but I don't think, I think it would be better to actually study that, frankly. So yeah, it's a good study question. Another is um, whether you could comment on the feasibility of training community health workers to provide assessment and early intervention services for women with co-occurring symptoms. I, I think that's a great question and I would advocate that that's a great idea in terms of how we might expand treatment. And again, I think how we do it is also amenable to really doing an implementation study to demonstrate that you can in fact do that. And, um, and uh, but you know, in terms of just expanding treatment access, I think it's a great idea and I think it's quite feasible actually. But again, really amenable to studying and demonstrating that it can be done. Tracy, you're nodding your head. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm agreeing. Yes, I, yeah. I think that is a great idea, both community health workers, and then also I, I would advocate looking at this among community mental, mental health workers. Um, Thank you. That, is that it, Deidre? Yes, Bob, I think that's all okay. we have. Okay. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Laura Quacko. Dr. Quacko is a clinical psychologist and program officer in the Division of Treatment and Recovery Health Services and Recovery Branch at NIAAA. Her research portfolio uh, focuses on mental on health services, including treatment availability, quality, and use, along with healthcare systems and integration of various healthcare services. Dr. Quacko received her PhD in clinical psychology from the Catholic University and completed postdoc clinical training at Springfield Hospital Center in Maryland, specializing in treatment for addiction and trauma related disorders in an inpatient, primarily forensic setting. She has research experience in long term longitudinal family studies, clinical trials, and educational settings. Dr. Quacko is licensed in Washington, D.C., and credentialed at the NIH Clinical Research Center as a clinical psychologist. Laura. Thank you so much, uh, Bob, for the introduction. Can you all see my slides? You just need to go on presenter view. Will do. Okay. Slideshow, just click yeah, on the slideshow. Yeah, trying to get to that with the- uh, Your mouse. Zoom. There we go. Okay. Now we should be all set. Thank You're you. For all, set. all set. Awesome. Thank you for bearing with me. Thank you, Bob, for that introduction. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, Deidre, for inviting me to be a part of this fantastic conference. I am one of the lucky ones. I uh, uh, have Deidre as a colleague um, in the Division of Treatment and Recovery, so I get to enjoy her wonderful work um, and uh, camaraderie on a regular basis. Uh, so I am really excited today uh, to talk with you about some resources that we have at NIAAA to help find treatment. Um, so these resources, while they're not specific to women and girls, um, may absolutely be used by women and girls, and certainly we encourage uh, them to do so. So I'll be talking about two uh, of the resources that we have. The first that I'll be discussing um, is the newly launched Healthcare Professionals Core Resource on Alcohol. And I will also be discussing our NIAAA Alcohol Treatment Navigator. Uh, before I go much further, I wanna share the URLs for these. Um, and I'll talk slowly here in case you wanna write these down. Um, of course, you can also just do a quick Google search for these terms um, and the websites will uh, pop right up so that you can see them. 
So starting with the Healthcare Professionals Core Resource on Alcohol, uh, this was a newly uh, developed resource um, that was created with the strong support and, um, and, and with the original idea from our director, Dr. George Koob. Uh, and the Healthcare Professionals Core Resource on Alcohol is a website um, including 14 core topics. So really it was designed with the intent of creating a resource on what every healthcare professional should know about alcohol when working with their patients. So this is the overview webpage, and this is the top of the, the page that you would see when you go to that URL. Um, and you'll see that uh, the core resource really provides knowledge on treating alcohol, uh, information about the impacts of alcohol uh, on health and well-being, and then also strategies for preventing and treating uh, alcohol use disorder. And I also want to emphasize too that, let me go back so you can see, that really what we're hoping the core resource will help our healthcare professionals do is to help their patients. That's the ultimate goal of the core resource. So one of the one of the ways that hopefully we are uh, encouraging healthcare professionals to use the core resources you can see here that's circled uh, is we offer free uh, CME or CE credit for using for reading through the core. So this free credit is available currently available for physicians, physician assist assistants, nurses, pharmacists, and psychologists. So we all know how hard it is. I'm a licensed uh, psychologist myself, and those of us who are licensed professionals know how hard it is to find really high quality, free <laughs> continuing education. Um, we offer that through the core. And you can see here that we have foundational knowledge uh, as, as one of the areas that we start out with. We have information on the basics uh, related to alcohol. So defining how much alcohol is too much risk factors related to uh, alcohol-related harms, neuroscience, the brain and addiction and recovery, and then also stigma. Again, I, you know, I, I, I did emphasize earlier and want to do so again that the primary goal of the core is to help healthcare professionals better help their patients. So here we have you know, that, that basic information around alcohol contributing to more than 200 health conditions and about 99,000 deaths in the US each year. Um, and you know, this, just, this, this uh, screen provides some of that overview information that hopefully healthcare professionals will find useful. Um, and we do even have a quote from a primary care practitioner um, that this resource is a good way to increase your confidence when you see patients with alcohol-related concerns, noting, of course, which you're going to see often, right? We do provide on the main page of the core resource additional links for patient care. So, and this page includes information uh, for primary care for adults, information on screening and brief intervention and referral to treatment, medication guides, withdrawal management practice guidelines, patient resources, uh, as you'll see here, there are also resources or linked resources available on the core for uh, various specialties um, and specific interests, including adolescent primary care, care for individuals with cancer, chronic pain, uh, mental health, and importantly, prenatal care. I won't read through all of these, but as you can see, we really made uh, an effort to include not only primary care, but then also information that's relevant for specialty practitioners. We also include information for broader healthcare systems, uh, including the US Preventive Services Task Force recommendation for alcohol screening and implementation and quality improvement guides. And just wanna point out on the left-hand side of the screen, these here uh, are the, the four sort of major groupings of the core content that we have. So we have that foundational knowledge. We have a section on alcohol clinical impacts strategies for prevention and treatment. And then finally, pulling it all together. When we were creating the core, um, and I will say that that was done with the help of many, many people, including an IAAA senior staff, many of our wonderful grantees and practicing healthcare professionals, and critically, my colleagues, uh, Maureen Gardner and Ray Litton. Um, we realized as we were creating the core that we needed a section on implementation. Um, you know, I know there were some questions at the end of the last talk about implementation, and we decided, you know, we need to really um, share some strategies that healthcare professionals can use to implement these um, 
these practices and these, uh, this information in their own clinical work. So again, going back to that foundational knowledge and really you know, what information we're hoping to provide. So you'll see here, we have the basics, we have risk factors, neuroscience, and stigma. And I, I do wanna make an important uh, point about stigma, which is that our team at NIAAA felt that stigma was such a critical uh, piece to the discussion and to uh, a, a critical barrier to care for individuals, and maybe in some ways, especially for women and girls, that we included it in that foundational knowledge. You know, we said this is something that's so important that we wanted to be really front and center. And I'll point out here too that, that again, to encourage uh, dissemination to our healthcare professionals, we link here and show exactly how many credits are available for each of the specific core topics. So each of these is three quarters of a credit hour. So within that basics alcohol, um, and you'll see here, this is the structure of the articles. There's a step one where you read through the topic and then further down the page is step two, which is to complete that CME or CE post-test in order to obtain those credits. Um, but in the basics, really uh, foundational um, information that may be simple, but not easy, right? So what counts as a standard drink? How many drinks are in common containers? When is having any alcohol too much? What are the US dietary guidelines on alcohol consumption? What is heavy drinking? And then finally, what is the clinical utility of the heavy drinking day metric? So in the interest of time, uh, you know, I'm not gonna read through each of these uh, for every topic. Um, that would be an entire probably day's worth of presentations. I won't do that, but hopefully this gives you a sense of the structure of this article and I'll be going through some of the others as well. And this is our uh, core topic on stigma. So you can see here again, those, those sort of subtopics around stigma that we thought were so important to really draw attention to. How might the effects of stigma show in patients? What underlies stigma for patients with alcohol use disorder? How might cl clinicians, of course, inadvertently contribute to a patient's sense of stigma? What misconceptions contribute to stigma in a clinical setting? And what knowledge about AUD and its treatment may lessen stigma? And then finally, and critically, what can clinicians do to reduce this perceived stigma among patients with AUD? So I noted earlier that one of our, uh, our foundational topics was risk factors and that varied vulnerability to alcohol-related harm. So, and this is, as you can see in that second bullet, we do have information that is specific to uh, women and girls. So what are the risks by gender? And, you know, this is information that uh, you're all aware of, certainly uh, at this point in the conference, but just wanna briefly highlight the, that information we provide in the core. Um, that shows that that gender gap in heavy drinking and alcohol problems has narrowed, um, you know, and that among adolescents and young adults, those rates of alcohol consumption, binge drinking, and those various alcohol-related harms, um, they are on the decline, but more so in, in men than among women and girls. Um, and we also see those increases uh, in, in alcohol consumption, binge drinking, and alcohol-related harms are increasing in middle and older adulthood at a faster rate for women than in men. So we wanted to convey that information to our healthcare professionals. And then of course, uh, the heightened harms that women uh, may experience in contrast with men. So, um, you know, women with AUD perform more poorly than men with AUD on a variety of cognitive tasks. They're at greater risk for men uh, than certain alcohol related health problems, including liver inflammation, cardiovascular disease, and certain cancers. Um, you've heard about the increase in risk for breast cancer with women uh, with, with respect to alcohol consumption. We wanted to, again, highlight that for our healthcare professionals, um, but then also discuss those risks uh, from alcohol-related uh, uh, problems around liver disease um, as well. And then finally, uh, uh, the increased risk that women face from being the victim of secondhand harms related to alcohol, including physical aggression by other individuals who have been drinking. And I do uh, critically want to note this point of intersection that we thought was important to highlight in the core. And that's the increased prevalence of alcohol use disorder in women of sexual minority, minority status. Um, again, that's been discussed in this conference, but you know, wanted to, to highlight that uh, we thought this was really important foundational information that again, all healthcare professionals should know when they are working with their patients. 
um, you know, numerous studies have found the likelihood of heavy drinking or AOD is substantially greater among women who identify as sexual minorities than among heterosexual women. Um, and we don't, at this point, at least uh, in some of the studies, see that same uh, interaction effect between gay men versus heterosexual men. So moving on uh, to some of the other topics included in the core, we have the section on alcohol clinical impacts. Uh, we have a, a topic on medical complications, um, alcohol and medication interactions, mental health issues. You've heard a lot about those comorbidities uh, at this conference. And then finally, alcohol use disorder. And that's the topic where we spend a good bit of time talking about increases in risk, also uh, tools for, uh, for diagnosing individuals, and then also recovery. And moving on to some of those important strategies, right? So practically, what can clinicians do? So we have topics on screening and assessment, specific topic on conducting a brief intervention, on how to recommend evidence-based treatment, uh, making referrals. Of course, you know, we know that's easier said than done. Um, but, uh, you know, again, while ESBERT screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment is often considered sort of one uh, coherent uh, topic, you know, we, we recognize the importance of really breaking these down into their individual components and providing that information for healthcare professionals as a whole, but then also separately as well. Um, and then finally, and critically, uh, supporting recovery. You know, we have a lot of information about how to best support recovery. And, you know, you can see there that our main message, it's a marathon, not a sprint, that we understand that these are uh, uh, healthcare relationships that will be maintained over a long period of time as healthcare professionals support their patients in recovery. And you can see here, uh, this article includes definitions of recovery, the new NIAAA definition. Uh, we also talk about the odds for recovery, which are quite good. Uh, talk about the change process for AUD recovery. And then again, critically, how can healthcare professionals support recovery? And last but not least, this is that topic that I mentioned that you know we realized in the in the process of creating the core that hey we need we need to really have a separate topic on how can we promote practice change right change is hard <laughs> so what can we at NIAAA do what information can we provide evidence based information um, on how to promote practice change and, and taking those manageable steps toward better care. So that's the Healthcare Professionals Core resource. Uh, and again, I hope you'll all take the time to go over and peruse. I just sort of gave you the quick overview of it, but there's a lot of uh, really wonderful, solid evidence-based content in there. And again, for those of you who are practicing healthcare professionals, uh, the way to obtain continuing uh, medical education or continuing education credit. So now I'm gonna shift gears and talk about the NIAAA Alcohol Treatment Navigator. Uh, this is our website that we've had for a few years now with really the aim of helping individuals and their families um, and their healthcare professionals as well, finding their way to quality alcohol treatment. So we have information uh, about what to know about alcohol treatment and then also how to find quality alcohol treatment. And you'll see uh, at the top of the screen here, those, those topics sort of laid out again. So what to know, how to find, support through the process, frequently asked questions. We have a toolkit for your search, including some worksheets that individuals and families can use, um, and then ways to spread the word. Uh, we also importantly, uh, as you can see here, you know, on the, on the main page, uh, you know, have specific information about accessing care during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, we've all been hearing about how treatment has shifted via telehealth and other online options. Um, and so one of the first things we did when the pandemic began was to, you know, uh, uh, include that information, that new information in the treatment navigator so that individuals could access it. There we go. Okay. So again, who is the alcohol treatment navigator for? This is a resource to help adults find treatment for themselves or an adult loved one. Um, we do here link to some adolescent treatment resources, but primarily the core or the core, the alcohol treatment navigator uh, focuses on, on adults. Um, 
And then here we have, uh, you know, our sort of so what? So why use the Navigator? So the Navigator has no commercial sponsors. It's uh, produced by the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, and it uh, helps steer people towards evidence-based treatment. So more information here, you can see uh, some of the content that's included. Again, I'm not going to go through uh, the entire content of the website. That would take a second day in addition to the core of, of providing that information. But just to give you an overview of, of what you'll find at the Alcohol Treatment Navigator, information about what is alcohol use disorder, the types of alcohol treatment that are available, um, and really emphasizing, uh, and we do this in the, the core resource as well, what options are available? And there's so many more options that are available today than uh, you know many people initially consider. Um, we also have information about why different people need different options, um, you know, and emphasizing that one size does not fit all. And then we have uh, critically, uh, you know, to think about access, what about costs and insurance? And then you'll see, uh, we also have information about how to find quality alcohol treatment. So we have uh, links to trusted sources to find providers, and that includes different uh, comprehensive treatment programs, therapists, and physicians. We have 10 recommended questions, um, and those are a list of questions that um, people can ask of those healthcare providers, um, you know, when they're looking for quality uh, care for alcohol-related problems. And not only do we have those questions, but we also have, uh, you know, what you should be listening for. What, what do you want to hear in those answers that's giving you uh, a sense that, you know, this is really quality evidence-based care. Um, and then also uh, strategies for comparing the quality of your options and then making the best choice for your situation. Again, I want to highlight uh, this point here uh, that we do have in, in the treatment navigator. Really, why do different people need different options? Um, and, you know, in this conference on women and girls, I think certainly, you know, we've heard and we all appreciate that uh, women and girls will need different options much of the time for various reasons. Um, and so we really want to emphasize that, that not only um, is that true when it comes to finding that initial treatment, but then also when we think about those individual routes to recovery, and there are so many of them um, that, that are available for people. Um, again, you'll see at the top, there's that uh, link to the information on quality alcohol treatment during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and then we do have that frequently asked questions section, which is always helpful to have on a website if people just want to quickly, you know, say they're looking for a loved one, they can quickly say, how can I help someone with an alcohol problem? Or how could I search for treatment providers? So again, I, I know I am the last thing standing between you all and a break, and I do want to leave uh, time for questions in case folks have any, but I will conclude again with the slide providing uh, those URLs, again, to our alcohol treatment navigator and also to our healthcare professionals core resource on alcohol. Um, these are uh, uh, created by our staff at NIAAA. Um, and these are also, I want to emphasize too, these are living documents. So these are not created once and then they're never updated again. We do uh, regularly review evidence, um, make updates as needed, depending on the new evidence. And also, of course, depending on the changing context, as we did uh, in the case of the COVID-19 pandemic. So please uh, take a look at these. If you have any questions or feedback, you can always email me. I am, uh, you know, and if I'm not the best person to to talk to, I can direct you to that person who is, but uh, we welcome uh, feedback and input on these resources. And with that, I will uh, stop and thank you for your time and attention and happy to answer any questions. Uh, and I see a question. Um, this is a really great question, uh, Marianne Powell. Most of our clients who use alcohol also use other substances, absolutely. So do the resources link to treatment for other SUGs as well? That's a great question. So um, they don't 
explicitly, uh, but many of the search strategies that we have and many of the resources that are linked can also be used to look for um, uh, programs for other substances as well. Yeah, that's that's just such an important point. And we do in the core resource on alcohol, uh, the topic on um, uh, common mental health comorbidities does include information on other substance use uh, disorders as well, because as you said, of course, you know, so many individuals use multiple substances. Yep. Okay, uh, we thank Dr. Quacko, and we will now have a break until three o'clock Eastern, uh, not 3.15, three o'clock, and you will not want to miss Dr. Kathleen Brady presenting our closing keynote, New Horizons in Treatment, Practice Implications of Research on Women and Girls. So we'll return at three o'clock. Sorry, Dr. Cheng, we can't hear you. Unmute my space key. Are you able to hear me now? Yes. Thank you so much. Should I start? Yes, please. All right. It's 3 p.m. <laughs> it's the top of the hour. Dr. Broach, first of all, I want to thank you for your vision and your commitment in organizing these two days of inquiry, inspiration, and the identification of great need. And seeing the pictures during the break, we can all see that this has been a longstanding mission and vision of yours. I've been asked to introduce Dr. Kathleen Brady, and this is such an honor for me because Dr. Brady is a revered clinical and translational research, and she has been conducting scientific investigations and clinical work in the field of addictions and psychiatric disorders for 30 years. Her research has been so influential. It's been focused on the pharmacotherapy of substance use disorders, comorbidity, of psychiatric disorders and addictions, gender differences and women's issues and addictions, and the neurobiological connections between stress and the addictions. Dr. Brady has been well-funded, well-published, and has mentored so many influential and important people. It's a true honor for me to introduce Dr. Brady, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cheng. I'm a big fan of yours as well, as you know. So it's a, it's a, it was a privilege to have you introduce me. Um, and I re really want to thank everybody. Uh, first of all, Dr. Roach, for, what a, uh, for, for organizing this and having the vision to put this together. It's been clearly um, just very much needed and has been um, just a great couple of days. Um, but I also just want to thank all the other speakers. Everybody's been wonderful. I mean, it's been really interesting. I, I feel like I've learned so much and I'm going to regurgitate some of that um, back to you today in my presentation. And uh, I also want to congratulate everybody for making it to the home stretch on a Friday afternoon. So you got half hour of me and then we'll have conclusions. And um, so thank you all for hanging in there. Um, so I'm sort of pulling together the treatment implications from what we've been. Can everybody see my screen? Is if I did I do that right with the screen share and everything? 
It's okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'm pulling together um, treatment implications out of uh, what you have been hearing for the last couple of days. Um, so really, how does this, how does all this information come to bear on how we um, can improve treatment for all human beings, but uh, women and girls in particular? Okay, let me just see how I can make this go forward. That doesn't seem to be working. Hmm. Um, let's see. My usual. Hmm. Okay, okay, good. I found it. Found it. Here we go. Okay. Um, so let me just give you a, the, the order I was going to do things and was talk a little bit about biologic considerations and then uh, and, and what that tells us about treatment, uh, psychiatric medical comorbidities, what that tells us about treatment, some of the psychosocial issues that really dictate some treatment differentials between men and women, and then talk about specialty programs and really the role of specialty programs for women in particular. Um, so uh, let me just start by talking about one of the fundamental biological differences between uh, men and women is the fact that the women are the childbearing half of the species and the menstrual cycle means that we do have fluctuations in um, uh, hormones over the course of a month during our during our, our childbearing years, which is uh, a, a lot of the time when the, that is the time during which people often initiate um, and accelerate their substance use. And there are some influences. I think we heard again, Dr. Sinha at the very beginning um, um, and others were talking about just the impact of estradiol, that estradiol in and of itself can actually um, produce negative affect um, in animal models. Um, it, it's actually, you need estradiol in female animal models to get um, nicotine self-administration even initiated, and it increases uh, drug intake for cocaine, alcohol, others, and other animal models. On the other side of that, we have progesterone, which is a neurosteroid. It's actually neuroprotective, has been used in traumatic brain imagery. It has a it's a positive allosteric modular of GABA, which means that it is an anxiolytic compound in and of itself. And again, it's been used exogenous uh, progesterone administration in smoking cessation trials, in cocaine trials, and has been shown to decrease cravings. So um, quite, there's a, the, this leads to a, a couple of issues in terms of the treatment implications. One is, could there be therapeutic effects in particular of progesterone? And there are a number of groups investigating that right now. But secondly, the importance of these hormonal fluctuations in, in the treatment life cycle. And, um, you know, uh, it, particularly in smoking cessation where we pick a quick date, you might, might want to avoid times of great fluctuation in terms of hormonal um, uh, hormones for women that are still um, in their childbearing age years and um, might want to consider, you know, sort of extra stress and coping for some people who have bad premenstrual um, symptoms or, um, uh, again, during fluctuations in, um, in uh, hormones. But probably more important than menstrual cycle variation, and this is something that was really uh, talked about by most many of our speakers, Dr. Koob, Dr. Singha, uh, Dr. Volkow, um, and others talked about really the sex and gender differences in critical neural circuitry, prefrontal cortex. Um, in particular, we're talking about the stress sensitive systems. And I think that's where, while there were some, some um, differences in dopaminergic, um, the, the, the impact, the, the, the influence of estrogen and progesterone on dopaminergic systems were brought up, but I think much more importantly, differences in the stress um, hormones and the stress circuitry in the brain between males and females is a critical and important target in the treatment of uh, substance use disorders, which may be very gender sensitive. Um, so stepping back from biology, if we just look at sort of the self-report of this, we find that women in general 
will report greater craving to negative emotional cues and also greater relapse to inter things that their relapse is often precipitated by interpersonal stress and conflict and that sort of thing. Whereas men in general report themselves being much more responsive to drug related cues. This was elegantly, the neurobiology of this was really, or the fact that there was a neurobiology behind this was really elegantly demonstrated by Mark Potenza and his colleagues at Yale in this neuroimaging study from 2012. This is cocaine dependent uh, males and females versus uh, control groups. And, watch, and they're in the scanner, in the fMRI, and they're being shown cues that are either related to stress, individual stressors, or related to drug cues that they themselves, um, um, scenarios that they themselves uh, brought up about times that they've been using drugs. And you can see, um, if you look at that left-hand panel, um, this is subtracting out the, um, the healthy controls. You can see that women um, with these stress-related cues, these cocaine-dependent women light up in areas, all the areas we know to be associated with substances of abuse and with drug abuse. We're looking at all those, those limbic areas, nucleus accumbens, um, also looking at hippocampal areas, the area, the area where we where drug cues that remind us or stress cues that that can precipitate craving and drug use are, are really handled and lodged. Whereas for the drug cue, we see very little difference between the cocaine dependent women and the their control group. Well, when we look at the right hand side of the panel, we're looking at men. Top, top area is stress cues. You see a little bit more activity in the cocaine dependent men to stress cues, but look at the um, uh, activity in these cocaine dependent men to um, drug related cues. You can see that this is again in all the areas, particularly the hippocampal limbic connections where you would expect drug cues to be sort of reminding people of their drug use. You can see that the men um, that that is really where their brain activity um, uh, lies in terms of um, what are the things that are precipitating um, drug use. So conclusions across a number of studies, a lot of of, uh, of those were brought up in the last two days, but from a animal and human laboratory studies tell us this that alcohol, nicotine, opioid, and cocaine dependent females have more HPA axis dysregulation and or more corticotropin releasing hormone, which is the hormone that is really at the crux of the HPA stress response and really also extra hypothalamic CRH um, causes the fight or flight locus ceruleus part of the stress response. So um, females are more stress, CRH stress sensitive compared to males. Also the elegant data that Sherry McKee showed and some of the data from our lab shows greater noradrenergic sensitivity in females compared to males. Again, these are female substance users across the board, alcohol, nicotine, opioid, cocaine dependent. All of them show greater noradrenergic sensitivity in females compared to males. And in humans, a lot of studies have shown that this dysregulation and this increased sensitivity is actually related to relapse. So it's not just an epiphenomenon that goes along with the drug use, but if you look at those who have greater dysregulation a month later, they're more likely to have relapse. So this is a meaningful biologic variation. And it's meaningful, it's meaningful enough that both medication and behavioral therapies that target these stress systems and the stress response are likely to be particularly efficacious in women. So that's kind of the take home message, I think, from, from a, a lot of uh, what we heard over the last couple of days about differences in men and women with substance use disorders. There's a lovely, uh, again, I'm always happy when I have to summarize an, or, uh, an area if somebody came right before me and wrote a great review article. And that's what happened here. Sherry McKee and Amy McRae wrote this great review article about gender differences in medication responses to treat addictions. No surprise at all is that it's an under-investigated area. Um, the studies 
uh, most of the studies have too few women enrolled to make any comparison. And even when those studies are large enough to allow us to make gender comparisons, when there are enough women involved, um, mostly those gender comparisons are made post hoc and generally it's underpowered. So I just couldn't agree more with what Dr. McKee said about the need to prospectively design studies um, to look at gender differences because when in, in the few areas where we have done that, we have often found important differences. And smoking cessation is probably the only area where we've real the, the set there have been enough studies and they've been large enough for us to really explore uh, gender differences. And we have found significant gender differences. So when we look, sometimes we find it. So it's really important to design studies so that we can look for it. And these are the studies that have been designed in one meta-analysis done by uh, Smith and colleagues looking across smoking cessation trials. They found that in general, women were less likely to attain abstinence. Um, others have found more than one report, but women are less responsive to nicotine replacement therapies. And I'm not, I don't know if you remember back to the very beginning of day one yesterday, um, Dr. Volkoff, um, cited a study that showed upregulation of nicotine receptors following cessation of nicotine is greater in men than it is in women. So this is sort of the biologic um, um, explanation for the fact that men respond better to nicotine replacement than women. They have greater upregulation of their nicotine receptors following um, uh, um, abrupt cessation of smoking. Um, bupropion has been shown in meta-analysis to be equally efficacious in men and women. And varenicline, however, maybe it looks like it's more efficacious in women than men. So we have some clear guidelines here that help us to treat, in terms of pharmacotherapy, smoking cessation should be treated differently in women than men. Women should, we should jump more quickly to varenicline for for women and or bupropion and um, probably not be as concerned about um, fully betting all, going through all of the nicotine replacement therapies. In terms of other uh, medications for other substances of abuse, we really just don't have the data we need. Uh, now, Trexone, as we've heard, may be equally efficacious in men and women, but probably has more side effects in women, in particular nausea, sleep disturbance. Baclofen, one large study was done just a couple of years ago in alcohol dependence, women were 11 times more likely to achieve abstinence. No real discussion about why that might be, uh, no follow-up, but it's just sort of an interesting finding out there. Um, for opioids, there are several studies and meta-analyses that suggest that women respond better to buprenorphine than methadone and they respond better to buprenorphine than men do. So again, a clear treatment um, recommendation could be made here for, um, and then just back to, um, I think what, what Dr. McKee was talking about primarily in the um, treatment of smoking cessation and the use of these um, adrenergic agents, these agents that sort of turn down adrenergic tone, but um, the, these agents have, potential use way beyond smoking cessation. As we all know, they're used in the treatment of opioid withdrawal, both clonidine and then lofexidine was recently approved for uh, the treatment of opioid withdrawal. Um, and in one very nice study done by the NIDA intramural program, um, they started, they had two group, a group of people maintained on buprenorphine um, and one, they added clonidine to the other, they added placebo and the clonidine group actually, clonidine provided some protection against relapse and they used um, ecologic momentary assessment to see what was what were the relapse precipitants and clonidine was actually particularly protective against stress induced relapse and stress induced craving. So they didn't have a, a sample size that was large enough to um, uh, to do a gender analysis. But our group right now is conducting a large trial that is powered specifically to look at gender differences in the addition. Of, the, of, of an adrenergic agent to buprenorphine or methadone um, in opiate-dependent people. Hypothesis being 
these adrenergic agents are going to be more helpful for women than for men. Maybe helpful for both genders, but probably preferentially uh, um, helpful for women. Uh, we already um, heard about the use in smoking cessation and, and the difference between men and women and stress-induced uh, relapse and craving. Um, guanfacine has also been explored in cocaine dependence and shown to decrease craving more in laboratory-based settings, not, not so much in clinical trials, but again, more in women than men. And so I think further exploration of these adrenergic agents kind of across substances may prove fruitful, and these may be particularly useful in um, stress-related relapse, and stress-related relapse appears to be particularly important for women. Um, while we're still talking about sort of differences in biology, you know, pain, pain has become a, a, a major um, issue as we face the opioid epidemic and, and um, the opioid overdose epidemic and how we're going to manage that. And the, the bottom line is there are different pain, pain is different, differently experienced by men and women and women in general have lower pain thresholds than men. Women are also much more likely to be prescribed opiates and more likely to use them for a longer period of time. So when the, the, you know, when the hammer came down on opiate prescribing and physicians you know, ran for the hills in terms of opiate prescribing, it really more women were left out in the cold than men because more women had been prescribed opioids and for longer periods of time because they are more likely to have chronic pain. Um, with that in mind, what, what we can see is that there were some pretty devastating effects. Prescription overdose rates increased like 500% um, for women and less for men. Heroin use increased 100% for women and 50% for men. Um, the 850% uh, increase in synthetic opioid-related deaths for women. What is the treatment implication of this? Well, clearly, alternate, um, alternative strategies for pain management are going to be particularly important for women. And with that in mind, I was very interested in seeing, uh, in hearing Dr. Earnshaw talk about acceptance and commitment therapy as one way to, um, um, to help with stigma and, and help people with their own shame and their own self-internalized stigma, because acceptance and commitment therapy is actually also one of those therapies that in, in terms of the multimodal strategy um, for the treatment of pain, acceptance and commitment therapy, um, uh, you know, plays a big role in a multimodal um, um, pain treatment strategy. So again, uh, something that's um, very interesting and maybe something that's important in terms of the treatment of women. Comorbidity, I'm not going to belabor the obvious. I think a few others have talked about this today in the last few days. Women are definitely two to three times more likely, women with substance use disorders, Women in general are about twice as likely to have depression, but if you have substance use disorder plus being a woman, that does increase the risk of having both depressive disorders and anxiety disorders, and that includes PTSD. Women are also, even if they don't have full-blown PTSD, they're more likely to have had traumatic events in their past, women with substance use disorders, but especially sexual trauma, much more common in um, um, women than men. And sexual trauma is very highly associated with sequelae. I mean, there are certain types of trauma that are less likely to lead to sequelae, but sexual trauma is one of those that uh, leads to PTSD very commonly. And so what's the treatment implication of that? Well, clearly the treatment of psychiatric comorbidity in general, careful assessment, aggressive treatment um, um, is important for women. It's important for men and women, but particularly important for women. And trauma-informed care is critical. And what is trauma-informed care? Well, you can look at the SAMHSA website and it will... Um, tell you what the key principles of um, trauma-informed care are. And they're generalized across multiple types of treatment settings, but it's really providing a safe, trustworthy, and transparent environment 
where there's lots of peer support, where there's collaboration and mutuality instead of the confrontational approach that, that used to be so common in substance abuse treatment programs, where there's empowerment, voice and choice, and where we deal with cultural, historic and gender issues in a sensitive manner promoting linkage to recovery and resilience for individuals and engaging their families and empowering the, 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 um, our, our patients and their families. And uh, again, more specifically, not just trauma-informed care, but, but care, but, but treatments that have been vetted um, for the treatment of people with both PTSD and substance use, which happens more commonly for women than men. There's a list of them on the uh, SAMHSA website. And there is some evidence to support um, each one of these. And these are all specific, these are all manual based treatments that are specific for individuals with both substance use disorders and um, um, PTSD. So what, what else do we know about this? Well, there are socioeconomic, psychosocial socioeconomic differences between men and women. Uh, women are less likely, they're more likely to be underemployed or unemployed, therefore having less access to the resources that they need to support treatment. Child care, parenting, and family issues are just generally likely to be more prominent for women and absolutely need to be addressed in the context of, of treatment. And substance use in significant others is more common. What you see, the more common scenario in treatment with men is they're forced into treatment by their wife or spouse or significant other or, or employer. Um, and their social support at home is can be intact. Often women in treatment have um, substance use in their significant other. So it's very critically important to assess the social support systems and assess um, substance use in significant others for, for women in treatment. Stigma. I thought that was such a lovely talk earlier today by Dr. Earnshaw. Really, really appreciated it. And I, I, I don't want to repeat she, uh, the, all the valuable information she gave, but just suffice it to say that I you know, I think stigma is uh, is an important issue for substance users, male and female, but I think it is even more important for women than men. I think the shaming around substance use is is more for women than men, and particularly uh, perinatal, uh, pregnant uh, pregnant women who are substance using, the stigmatization of that is, is, is you know, is really a significant deterrent to treatment. And as we know, self stigma, there's multiple types of st stigmatization, but self stigmatization, which I think is is extremely worrisome and, and, and a, an important factor for women is the internalization of that public stigma by a person with a condition disorder or minority status. Clearly something that, and, and it, what it really does equal is shame and clearly something that's important to recognize in treating women with substance use disorders. In healthcare systems, again, as Dr. Earnshaw pointed out, um, stigma decreases the willingness of policymakers to allocate resources. It decreases the willingness of providers to screen and address uh, substance use problems, and it decreases the willingness of individuals to seek treatment. So it is, it, it's a triple threat. Um, um, and really is something that we need to address aggressively. And it's important for us, the healthcare providers, to be, um, you know, in this fight with and for our patients. I think it's really important. It's important that we humanize the disease. It's important to tell those stories, those really compelling and so many success stories. I so appreciated Ms. Platt yesterday and, and her um, uh, wonderful um, um, you know, way of just making it all come alive and making it all human. And I think that's one of the, as we've heard, that's one of the, the best ways to really decrease stigma. And it's important for us to role model this for our, uh, our other health care providers. Um, we need to provide and we need to encourage and insist that they provide safe, 
dignified, non-judgmental and compassionate screening and treatment. And uh, what we've been running emergency room programs for the last couple of years with the opioid epidemic. And I can tell you that's one of the areas where um, this really comes into play, where we've really um, um, had to have multiple talks with emergency room providers around um, the treatment of individuals with substance use disorders. Okay. All right, I'm having oh having a heart. Okay, um, so what about specialty programs? And again, I think I think the the, the panel that we've had speaking today has uh, over the last couple of days has already done a pretty good job. I think for the most part, men and women um, um, can be treated together in the same program. I think you want, as Shelley Greenfield described, some program elements that may be specific to one gender or another. But there probably are certain situations in which specialty programs um, um, are pretty important um, because either there are certain issues that 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 are really critical that need to be dealt with that that this whole group will have in common, such as people with perinatal substance use disorders, um, adolescent programs. I think it's important that these are specialty programs that and that 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 they to some extent say say segregated certainly from adults because when adolescents interact with adults, they think, oh, I don't have that kind of problem. But also, I think girls, um, um, adolescent girls, when they're around adolescent boys, actually behave differently. And I think that adolescent programs that, that are female only can be more helpful, can really allow um, these girls to um, express themselves and do more, um, more healing. Um, than they might otherwise. And certainly in the criminal legal system, um, it's very important. I mean, the programs have to be segregated by men and women. And it's very important that we, that we heard from um, Dr. Taxman and Debina uh, about just the, the multiple needs in the cr criminal legal system um, of women with substance use disorders. Clearly, this is an area that that needs to be uh, um, that where we need to up the game in terms of treatment. Um, this is a very nice, but, but once treated, are there really gender differences in outcome? And a very nice review done a few years ago by Shelley Greenfield and a, a group of colleagues from the Clinical Trials Network found that gender in and of itself is not a predictor of substance use treatment outcome. But there are some predictors of treatment outcome that vary by gender. Things like psychiatric comorbidity, untreated, can really predict poor treatment outcome. Um, family stressors, substance use in the home. Um, lots of uh, there are other things that actually predict poor treatment outcome that happen to be more common for women than men. So those need to be addressed. And when those are addressed, women's treatment outcome is just as good as men. We need to really pay attention to those reducing those barriers that are unique to women or somewhat unique. And that is things like childcare and worrying about what's gonna to happen to your kids while you're in treatment and worrying about social services and other people taking your kids away while you're in treatment that needs to, that needs to be aggressively addressed. Lack of resources, substance use and significant others. Um, again, treatment for women really needs to focus on co-occurring disorders, careful assessment for PTSD, depression, anxiety, uh, parenting classes, particularly important for women in treatment, trauma-informed care, important for both men and women, but we know it's more, more likely to be um, something that we're going to see in women. So in summary, we've heard over these last couple of days about all of the important gender differences in prevalence of substance use disorders, in comorbidity, in etiologic relationships, course of illness, and neurobiology. And all of these differences really do have important treatment implications. And these, implicate, these, these treatment um, findings will improve treatment for both men and women. So I'm really glad to be so happy to be part of this um, group exploring this. And I hope there will be more to come. Thank you so much for your attention. Well, 
Thank you so very much, Dr. Brady, for that very informative, inspiring, and thought-provoking presentation. You've beautifully summarized some clinical pearls that we can go home with and uh, be better at whatever our work is to improve the life of women, girls, and communities. So thank you so very much. And good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, in closing, I'd like to again thank each of you for joining us for the 2022 National Conference on Alcohol and Other Substance Use in Women and Girls. We hope that you found pearls here to enrich your day-to-day -day walk to make life better for women, girls, and families affected by mental health challenges and harmful substance use. Again, we sincerely thank our sponsor, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, and our agency partners, the Office of Research on Women's Health, the Office of AIDS Research, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, the National Institute on Mental Health, the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and FASD United, without whose invaluable contributions this conference would not have been possible. Next slide, please. My esteemed NIAAA colleague and conference co-chair, Joan Romain, and I would like to extend a special bouquet of thanks to the members of the conference organizing committee, the Interagency Workgroup on Drinking and Drug Use in Women and Girls, who worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make this conference a reality. Every good thing that will grow out of it rests on their tall shoulders, their collective genius and unwavering commitment to excellence. Many thanks too to our partners at Synergy Enterprises and Ripple Effect for managing the hundreds of technical details involved in producing an event like this with remarkable skill, efficiency, and generosity of spirit. You have been our partners in the truest sense of the word. Next slide, please. Oh, I, <laughs> I don't have a slide showing you all, but so I'll simply say to our panelists, our plenary and keynote speak, uh, speakers, thank you for your phenomenal presentations. We plan to share them widely via the video recordings, and they will be enormously helpful to us here at NIAAA as we think about directions for future research. Next slide, please. Since she has insisted upon staying out of the spotlight for the duration of the conference, despite all of my arm twisting and leg twisting, <laughs> I'd like to give a special shout out to conference co-chair, Joan Romaine, whose brilliance, creativity, and extraordinary attention to detail have been reflected in every detail of this program. She has truly been the wind beneath over and around the wings of our organizing committee, the single person without whose contributions this conference would never have gotten off the ground. Among the many miracles that she has performed in organizing and producing this conference, she virtually doubled our registration numbers in the last week before the registration closed to over 700 souls. So thank you from the bottom of my heart, Joan. Will you come on screen with me? <laughs> <laughs> and please. Thank you, Deirdre, <laughs> and thank you, everyone. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs> We could not have done this with, without Jones. Uh, love, that's what it is, it's love. And most of all, I'm grateful to you, every member of our audience for your presence with us over these past two days and for the healing work that you do every day. We had hoped to be able to thank and honor you with a celebrity tribute, but regrettably no celebrity was enticed by our $200 honorarium. Can you imagine that? <laughs> As I was lamenting that fact a few days ago, I was reminded that celebrity is the icing, but the real sheroes and the heroes are the cake. Without the appeal of celebrity, as I said earlier, more than 700 sheroes and heroes, the people who show up all day, every day to do the work necessary to continue on their personal healing journey, to provide the essential health and health education services, the spiritual support, to do the research, develop the policies, everything necessary to make the world a safer, more wholesome place for women, girls, and families registered for this conference. 
thank you. The people who do the work that you do certainly don't do it for fame or fortune. You do it out of compassion. And compassion is the glue that holds our families, our communities, our society, our very selves together. Living a compassion-led life enables us to be our best selves, living our best life. Next slide, please. So much more than celebrity, we close with a statement of commitment to continuing to being your faithful partner in all that you do to make life better for women and girls. With your permission, we aim to stay in touch with you after the conference through regular webinars and listening sessions sponsored by the Interagency Workgroup. We will also post rele relevant publications on the NIAAA Interagency Workgroup website. Next slide, please. An executive summary of the conference will be posted on the NIAAA website and we'll, we'll solicit your comments about how events like this one could be improved. We commit to working with you to promote more community engaged research informed by the wisdom of the people who are working on the front lines to bring about our shared vision, a world where all women and girls have access to routine screening for mental health symptoms, at risk drinking and other harmful substance use and to comprehensive and effective assessment, prevention, treatment and recovery services for co-occurring mental health substance use and associated medical disorders, frontline change makers like you. This is an ambitious vision to be sure, but it's not more ambitious than we are. And I have not a single doubt that we will achieve it. And let's uh, start this after conference conversation by uh, encouraging you to fill out the surveys, the survey links that um, will be available now that, that as soon as the conference closes to get your feedback about how we can make uh, future conferences on these topics better. So please, for, please don't forget to, to fill those out. It's in the chat. It's in the chat. Thank you. So absent a, a celebrity voice to thank and pay tribute to you, please accept if you'll show the next slide, please this virtual bouquet of thanks from our heart to yours. We hope that it brightens your life the same way your smile brightens ours. Until the next time, we wish you safety, vibrant health, and peace. Dr. Ku, I'm sorry. Um, so Deidre, Deidre, I just want to thank you, Deidre Roach and Joan Romain for a spectacularly successful conference. It couldn't have happened without the two of you. And we're very, very proud of you at NIAAA. So thank you very much. And thank you all for participating. It was really wonderful. And even I learned an enormous amount of new information. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Koob. This could not have happened without your support and the support of other senior leaders at NIAAA. Goodbye, everyone.